A Small Town Girl with a Big City Secret. Book 9, Love and Harmony Valley Series by Melinda Curtis. Prologue. August. Who would have guessed we'd all be single mamas in Harmony Valley, right back where we started? Mina DeWitt wondered aloud to her three friends. Not me. Certainly not me. Not in a million years. The conversation turned to the joys of motherhood, followed by the pitfalls of falling in love with the wrong man. And because Mina didn't believe in love, she let the discussion her childhood friends were having flow around her. Instead, Mina sipped her wine, wondering if she'd made the right choice in moving back home to Harmony Valley, a small town in a remote corner of Sonoma County, California. Living with her grandmother, life here was a far cry from the one she'd led in San Francisco. Not that Harmony Valley was without its charms, a few interesting restaurants, a fantastic bakery that served great coffee, and the small, charming winery where Mina and her friends were currently hanging out, their children playing nearby. Mina's five-year-old son Liam sat in the dirt with a red chicken in his lap, gangly legs folded beneath him, his black curls ruffling in the breeze. Her little dynamo was almost certainly going to ask Mina for a chicken on the way home, if not sooner. And if it wasn't a chicken he'd ask for, it would be a puppy or a little brother. Those were his regular requests. Mina would be happy if all Liam wanted was what she wanted a anonymity and a chance to live a normal, ordinary life. Anonymity had become a priority over the last few months since Liam had sprouted up, slimmed down, lost his full, baby cheeks, and began to look like his famous father. And normal childhoods? Mina hadn't had one and was determined that Liam would. That said, if Mina thought about so-called ordinary upbringings long enough, they usually included a puppy. Maybe even two. Growing up the daughter of a career military couple, the only pet she'd had was a goldfish. And poor Nemo hadn't lived a long life. A puppy. Oh, boy. That required another sip of wine. The eucalyptus leaves rustled in the trees above them as the afternoon breeze teased cooler temperatures to come. A curious red-winged blackbird flitted about a nearby trellis, chirping as if begging for a cracker crumb from the basket on the table. A couple ambled up the path from the river, wine glasses empty. There were no sirens. No horns honking. No one had their noses glued to beeping or vibrating cell phones. Mommy, did you know that Henrietta is the nicest chicken in the world? Liam flashed Mina an angelic smile, caramel-colored eyes wide and innocent-looking. If I had a little brother, he'd love Henrietta, too. Mina resigned herself to a puppy in her future because she wasn't doing chickens. They belonged in a category with goldfish, not likely to be long-lived under her care. Mina returned her attention to her friends. Our kids all start school tomorrow. Liam would be in kindergarten. She raised her wine glass. Let's toast the end of summer. The four women clinked their glasses. They grow so fast, Mina said ruefully, gaze drifting back to Liam. Too fast. Sitting next to her, Jill agreed with a nod. But at least you saw the world before coming home, Mina. I never really left Harmony Valley. The brunette ran a retreat center on the outskirts of town. Her son Teddy was the oldest of the children at ten. I'm just here until my divorce is final and I get a job elsewhere. Annie sat across from Mina. Her short blonde hair always looked attractively sleep tousled. Her daughter Maddie was the same age as Liam and was chattering with him now, speculating as to how many feathers Henrietta had. Meanwhile, Annie stared up at the cloudless blue sky. I sent out resumes as far away as Las Vegas. You'd go back? Jill shuddered. She and Annie were cousins. They'd each spent a year in Las Vegas, living with their paternal grandfather, although at different times. No thanks. Annie's gaze came back down to earth. My ex is a white-collar criminal. I need to find work somewhere where they don't know I was married to him. She tapped the stem of her wine glass with a short fingernail, brow furrowed. She'd been a corporate accountant until her almost ex-husband's embezzlement came to light. I never imagined I'd be scrambling for a job at this phase in my life. I thought my career would be on an upward trajectory. Mina nodded. I always dreamed I'd work on a presidential campaign in my thirties. And thirty was fast approaching. But as Liam's only parent, I couldn't live out of a hotel. He needed stability. 
In more ways than one. Your son is the spitting image of those McClouds. The memory of near discovery by a reporter last spring was unsettling. Mina drew a calming breath. She and Liam were safe here in Harmony Valley. No one made the connection between Liam's looks and those of a beloved political family based in San Francisco. To those who'd known Liam since birth, he just looked like Liam. But to others. The resemblance to the McClouds was beginning to be easily made. The dark hair, the caramel-colored eyes, the dimpled chin. That required another deep, calming breath and another sip of wine. Meanwhile, her friends were still talking about their dreams. I always wanted to run my own business somewhere unique and fabulous. Jill stared off toward the tall, granite face of Parrish Hill. My retreat facility is unique, I suppose. I just hosted 20 nuns for their annual week of silence retreat. It made me miss the Society for the Preservation of Macuz, even though those parrots wouldn't shut up. Jill laughed, leading the rest of them in chuckles. But I always imagined a little more zoos in my life. You get that from our time in Vegas. Annie clinked her wine class with her cousins. You know what that means. You can't hate Vegas that much. Oh, yes, I can, Jill blurted. Something had happened to Jill in Las Vegas. She'd returned with a high school diploma, a marriage certificate in hand but no husband. Pregnant, it turned out. And in the decade since Teddy's birth, no one had heard tell of or seen her husband. I always thought I'd run my grandfather's business. From her seat opposite Mina, Corey refilled their wine glasses. She was estranged from her family, who owned a small winery near Jill's retreat center. But when a family turns you out, you find new family. Mina reached across the table and gave Corey's hand a reassuring squeeze. Laughter from a nearby table drew their attention. A group of elderly patrons sat enjoying the afternoon sun, Mina's grandmother among them. Grandma Beam wore a wide-brimmed straw hat and a broad smile. And the source of Grandmother Beam's amusement? Mina's son. Liam handed Grandma Beam the red chicken. Don't you love her? She's lovely. Grandma Beam drew the hen into her arms as if she'd had chickens all her life. But she's not ours. That boy is going to have a butt chin, Mayor Larry said before Liam could say more about Henrietta. The elderly mayor pointed at Liam and then tapped his own cleftless chin. The ponytailed hippie wore a red and yellow tie-dyed t-shirt and a thoughtful expression. He reminds me of someone with that chin. Someone famous. Not Michael Douglas, but someone younger. Mina's stomach dropped as her grandmother's friends offered suggestions ranging from John Travolta to Henry Cavill. The last thing she wanted was for someone to speculate whose doppelganger her son was. Liam, honey. Why don't you introduce me to that chicken? Maybe a hen was in her future. Mina was saved from more speculation by one of her grandmother's friends. Isn't that spot down by the river romantic? Agnes, a petite woman with a gray pixie cut, sat next to Grandmother Beam. Her question was directed toward the couple returning from the river. And despite the reprieve, Mina said, Uh-oh. Recognizing how the expressions at her grandmother's table turned curiously thoughtful. The elderly residents of Harmony Valley meant well. But they meddled like nobody's business. That poor couple, Jill said quietly. They won't know what hit them. A combination of the third degree and a welcome hug. Annie nodded. Maybe they like talking to strangers. Corey studied the pair. Mina and her friends quieted as the show began. Did he propose? Mildred, a lookalike to Mrs. Claus, asked. Does anyone see a ring on her finger? Mildred couldn't. She was legally blind, despite her thick glasses. No ring. Rose Sked, smoothing her white, ballerina-style bun with one hand. That's surprising. Frankly, when he looks at her, he looks like he's got a ring on his mind. We're just friends, the woman tried to explain, cheeks red. Have been for years. Well, she turned me down years ago, the man mumbled. And then. The couple stared at each other awkwardly. They're just kidding. Annie shot to her feet. Such kidders. She gave the elderly meddlers a look meant to stop all conversation. And then she smiled kindly at the couple. 
Come inside the tasting room. I've got some free wine for you. She worked part-time for the winery while she searched for full-time employment. We weren't kidding, Rose said when they disappeared inside the tasting room. We could see the sparks. They're wasting time with that friend's label. Agnes refilled her water glass from a pitcher on the table. Just look at the besties in town who recently got married, Shelby and Gage. There's proof that friendship makes for the best marital partners. That young woman looks like the money she should be putting in her hope chest is spent on shopping trips, Grandma Beam said with a significant glance at Mina, who loved shopping and pretty clothes, not that she wore them often nowadays since she worked from home. That young man is probably spending all his spare money on fancy cars instead of a wedding ring, Mildred ventured a guess, most likely influenced by her having been a race car driver in her youth. What's he driving? Did anyone see? Grandma Beam and her friends speculated as to which vehicle in the parking lot belonged to the couple, diverted from guessing which chin-dimpled celebrity Liam resembled, which suited Mina just fine. No one knew about Mina's whirlwind fling six years ago, which had been a short, happy time with a bittersweet ending. A dead ending. She wanted to keep her baby daddy's name a secret, because if word got out that Liam was a member of the nationally treasured McLeod family, they'd want to groom Liam to fit their rigid, blue-blood standards. He'd be in the spotlight, on display, required to behave, not be his mischievous self. Mina drew another deep, stabilizing breath, tucking grief and fear back where they belonged while reassuring herself that she and Liam were safe here. No one knows. Not even her family and friends. And even though Mina hated lying to everyone, she planned to keep it that way. Chapter 1 October I need you to do something for me. Hudson McLeod entered his mother's office in the Pyramid Center in San Francisco. What is it? Vivian McLeod turned from the skyscraper's view of San Francisco Bay and the few sailboats that braved the choppy waters. She was impeccably dressed in a pale green dress and conservative heels. Her silver hair brushed her shoulders. She looked elegant, unflappable, and, if the hollow look in her dark eyes was any indication, incredibly heartbroken. This will help. Hud hoped. Hud's mother had once been full of life and energy, but the events of the past ten years had taken their toll on both of them. The weight of carrying on the family legacy was dragging them down. Over a century ago, the McLeod family had created a successful clothing company, one that made blue jeans and factory uniforms. But they were better known for their five generations in politics. And then untimely deaths, dads, his brother Samuels, and an unexpected scandal, involving the family business and Hud's political career, had put a black mark on everything the family was respected for. Hud couldn't turn back the clock and prevent the mistakes and losses they'd suffered from happening, but after two years spent untangling improper business practices, there was finally a chance he could give his mother's life purpose once more and honor his father's last wishes. I'm proud, of you, son, his father had told Hud on his deathbed, struggling for breath. I'm leaving you, in charge of the family legacy. Hud finished for him, trying to make things easier. The frustrated set to his father's chin said that wasn't the right answer. The family's political legacy? A question this time. Hud, let him rest. Mom had moved in, reassuring Dad that Hud knew exactly what his father meant. Duty, he'd thought. Dad was always going on about duty. Hud crossed the oriental carpet in his mother's office to the cabinet that held the TV. He turned it on. Sad news for the city. San Francisco's mayor was about to deliver a speech on the steps of City Hall when he suffered a brain aneurysm. The mayor was rushed to U.S.N.F. Medical Center. And pronounced dead at 10 a.m. Hud had known the mayor and considered him a friend. His death was sad. And shocking. But it was also an opportunity. Hud remained silent as his mother came to stand next to him. As a young senator's wife, she'd been a leader in both politics and fashion. Despite her age and her silver hair, Vivian McLeod was still a striking presence. Her influence as the widow of a popular U.S. senator stretched across both parties, but it was power she rarely used. Hud wondered if she'd flex that influence now. Silence stretched between them as the news changed to the weather and the series of storms rolling in. His mother had to know what Hud wanted and how important it was to him. He'd spent two years getting the family business back on track. 
two long years fulfilling one kind of duty. Now, it was time to fulfill another. Hud smoothed his tie and said quietly, this is just what we've been looking for. His mother gave him a sharp look. Another chance for us to be hurt? We lack purpose, he said in a quiet voice. You know it's true. You have purpose. You excel at running McLeod Incorporated. She placed her palm on his cheek. You saved our company. Any other man would try to be satisfied with the way things turned out. But not a McLeod. McLeods don't give up. His father had drilled that into Hud and Samuel as kids, as well as, duty before all else. And by duty, he meant to country, community, and family. His mother sighed heavily, her hand dropping away. Mom, you and I live for public service. It's what we're built for. Admit it. You miss that life. Hud wanted his mother to be filled with energy and purpose once more, wanted to hear her laugh with unbridled joy rather than polite response. And he. He wasn't made for the boardroom. But his mother remained stoic. Eyes a dull brown. Mayor of San Francisco? The party won't back you again. You had your chance. And you chose to step down. That's right. Hud nodded, willing to accept responsibility for the decision he'd made. But they won't turn me down if you ask them. No one refuses Vivian McLeod. While reading an online news brief about the death of San Francisco's mayor, Mina received a call from Liam's school. She closed her laptop and fumbled with her cell phone, causing her desk chair to slide back into her bed. Since Liam had started kindergarten a few weeks ago, midday calls meant upset stomachs and reshuffled work schedules. As expected, it was Liam's teacher. I just wanted to make sure we get our class play on your calendar for this Friday. Ms. Fan was warm and friendly, both in person and on the phone. I forgot to send a note home on. Friday. And I realized we're just days away from our performance. Five days, to be exact. It was Monday. And no doubt, Ms. Fan had taken note of Mina missing back to school night in September when her boss had asked Mina to accompany him to Washington to attend a national policy conference. Still, it wasn't just travel that conflicted with Liam's school events. Planning campaign strategy, writing speeches, and outlining policy, plus keeping up with the latest issues and laws meant Mina worked long hours. She declined to volunteer for the Halloween party committee because the planning meetings were at the same time as her weekly online staff meeting. Sometimes Mina felt as if she were trying to sail the SS motherhood beneath the Golden Gate Bridge without a working rudder. No matter how hard she tried to be a good single mom, her career seemed to conspire against her. She had to draw the line and it was here. No matter what came up this week, she wouldn't miss Liam's performance. Mina scooted her chair closer to her small desk. Ms. Fan went on to enthusiastically describe the play and how excited Liam was to be in it. Mina glanced out the window to where Grandma Beam was deadheading roses in the garden, moving slowly and with a limp due to a bum hip. Her grandmother was an avid gardener. Her yard and her home were filled with lush vegetation. When they moved in, Liam had ecstatically announced that they were living in the jungle. The house and grounds were ideal for games of hide-and-seek, but it was getting to be too much for Grandma Beam to keep up on her own. Besides the short play, the school choir is singing, and other students will be performing. Ms. Fan was finishing up her pitch. I really hope you can attend. It means so much to Liam. Mina dutifully confirmed the play was on her calendar and assured Ms. Fan she'd be there this time. Before she put her cell phone down, it rang again. This time, it was a call she'd been expecting, from her boss, the man who ran the political consulting agency in San Francisco. Where Mina worked. Walter, how are you? Sad though it was, just hours after the mayor of San Francisco's death, the news media and political world were in a frenzy over who was going to run in a special election to replace him. Since Mina was one of Walter's political consultants, he probably wanted her opinion about those already putting their hats in the ring and whose business they should seek or accept. I'm good Mina. Enjoying city living, unlike you. How is life in the boondocks, the older man teased. Are you bored in that small town yet? Ready to move back and take on bigger. Clients? No and no. That said, Mina couldn't resist asking, what's happening with the mayor's race? 
the search for the right candidate is over. Win this one for me and you can write your own ticket. You're going to run for office? Even as Mina joked, she was intrigued. Who was Walter referring to? Walter chuckled, a gruff, heartwarming sound. He may be a wily tactician, but he was her mentor, and she was fond of him. They were like family. Liam called him Uncle Wally. All right I give. Mina fidgeted in her chair, causing it to drift backward toward her bed once more. Who contacted you about running? If you get this man elected, Walter said instead of answering, you'll have a spot on a presidential campaign. Mina let his words sink in, let her childhood dream come out of the shadows, let herself imagine working in the White House. But then her grandmother moved outside her window and Mina's gaze fell to a photograph of Liam kicking a soccer ball, both images reminding her that her dreams would have to wait, perhaps forever. She had other priorities. I'm happy for you, Walter. Mina carefully deflected his assumption that she'd agree. I'll help whoever runs the campaign. But who is it? Who hired us? Hudson McLeod. Liam's uncle? The room spun. Mina gripped her desk and glanced at the picture of her son again, noting the promise of the cleft chin and strong nose. Both features of the McLeods. Media followed their every step. Anyone who worked for them became well-known with the press, professionally and, sometimes, personally. Six years ago, Samuel had spoken bitterly about the pressure and public scrutiny of growing up as a McLeod. Your son is the spitting image of those McLeods. Mina had to turn Walter down. And yet, the ambitious woman she was yearned for the professional challenge of resurrecting Hudson McLeod's career. Pundits had dismissed him after he'd stepped down from the Senate under a cloud of suspicion about misconduct relating to legislation he authored benefiting the family business. If he entered the mayoral campaign, it would make national news and, if successful, a strategist's career. The world no longer spun dangerously fast. On a personal level, she'd always wondered about the two surviving members of the McLeod family of Vivian and Hudson. She'd never met them. She only knew of them from what Samuel had told her before he died and what was published about them. Mina had considered coming forward after Samuel died and she'd learned she was pregnant, but the McLeods were grieving, she was grieving, and there'd been a media circus involving Samuel's many girlfriends that lasted for months. Time had passed. She'd remembered the painful picture Samuel had painted of his childhood and she grew to fear what the McLeods would demand of her and Liam if they knew the truth. Still, Mina wrestled with guilt. Were they good people? Would they respect her boundaries if they knew about Liam? Or had she been right to keep him a secret from that branch of his family? This might be a way to lay her guilt to rest. Or expose us. Could she take the job and keep her secret? Mina was leaning toward no. But what was the harm in attending a preliminary meeting as part of Walter's management team? Whoever worked on HUD's campaign would need to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Harmony Valley was a three hours drive in good traffic. Meet the McLeods? Mina was torn, excited, curious and fearful, all at the same time. Mina? Are you still there? Walter asked. Yes, but… Why me? There were other strategists working for Walter who were just as good and hadn't taken the mommy track. Why you? Walter chuckled. Because you excel at advancing the underdog. Because you don't lie or sugarcoat things. We need an honest assessment here. Walter laughed again. That, and Vivian McLeod requested you. Vivian McLeod. Liam's grandmother. She requested me? She didn't know Liam existed, did she? Chapter 2 On Thursday night, Hud sat at what had once been his father's desk, in what had once been his father's chair, facing portraits of four generations of McLeod politicians. He perused the news articles and editorials that came up when he typed his name into the Google search bar. The results were grim. Not even his ancestors were smiling. Hud stared out his window. Fog encompassed his high rise, obliterating any clear view of the city lights. As foggy as my future. Hud would find out if the political world considered him salvageable tomorrow. He'd left the string pulling to his mother once she'd agreed to inquire with their political party and a strategic consultant about his chances. But he had no idea who or what he'd face tomorrow. Bad news? A lifeline? 
HUD scrolled through the headlines from the past. Hudson McLeod flexes power on first day in Senate. Senator McLeod pushes through bill to benefit veterans. Hudson McLeod fulfills family's political legacy of helping the working class. Senator McLeod accused of conflict of interest on child labor bill. Questions increase. McLeod influence disappears. Another bill by Senator McLeod crushed. McLeod stepping down from Senate. HUD may have saved the family business from ruin and their employees from the unemployment line, but he'd done so at the sacrifice of his dreams and the family legacy. At the sacrifice of a part of himself. His gaze caught sight of a link to an article about his brother Samuel's death. Don't you dream of something other than politics, HUD? Samuel tugged at his bow tie, looking uncomfortable in his tuxedo. No, HUD said. They were in high school, and it was intermission at the opera on opening night. Mom had let Samuel wear earbuds so he could listen to music on his phone during the performance. A bargain she'd made so the youngest McLeod would attend. Dude. I can't believe you don't imagine a life outside of politics. Samuel took Hud by the shoulders and turned him so that they faced each other. Despite being two years apart in age, they were nearly the same height. Tall by most standards. We could be anything. Do anything. Why would you want to go into politics where any mistake is seen as a flaw? Humans aren't perfect. You and I. We're not perfect. I want to seek office because not everyone who serves does so for the right reasons. HUD believed public service was supposed to be selfless. That's dad talking. Samuel shook his head, laughing a little. Trying to serve because you think others aren't worthy isn't a good reason to seek office. Seriously. Carrying on the family legacy is just living someone else's dream. HUD had disagreed. But now. Now his reasons for running were more complicated. Yes, he believed in duty. Yes, he wanted to serve and make a difference in people's lives. Yes, that was his passion, not balance sheets or new product development or an increase in profits. But there was more. It wasn't just the family name in the history books. It was his own. Something smelled good enough to wake up for. I smell morning, Liam whispered from the other side of Mina's bed. Sometime during the night, he padded into her room complaining of a bad dream that only a puppy, a chicken, or a little brother could protect him from. He'd had to settle for mommy. Eyes still shut, Mina rolled over and gave her son a good morning squeeze, breathing in the aroma of freshly brewed coffee. I love Grandma Beam. She always made a strong pot of coffee in the morning. And Mina operated on caffeine. She had been since she was a teen. How can you not drink coffee? Mina demanded of Samuel. Soda isn't a breakfast beverage. His caramel-colored eyes sparkled with amusement. Carbonated beverages are happy drinks. And I'm a happy person. Soda is cheerful and sweet, like you and me. Mina rolled over in bed, stretching. She was prickly, not sweet. But Samuel had made her feel sweet when they were together, had made her want to be sweet. We were too opposite to be soulmates. It had been the first time she'd been fascinated with a man. Fascinated, not in love. Mina didn't believe in hearts and flowers. The wake-up alarm on her phone went off. Is it Saturday? Liam asked wistfully. They slept in on Saturdays. No. It's Friday. There was one more day until the weekend. Liam would be in school until three, while Mina had a light date with only two speeches to work on. There was Liam's performance tonight and, no. Mina sat up too quickly, making the room spin. It wasn't an easy day. It was the Friday, the day of her audience with Vivian McLeod. She had to battle traffic to get into San Francisco. She had to play everything cool, show interest in Hudson as a candidate while at the same time laying out all the obstacles against him, and there were many. She'd agreed to the meeting to appease her boss and to satisfy her curiosity about Samuel's family. Curiosity killed the cat. But not the political strategist. Mina scrambled out of bed. She was meeting Walter for coffee before their appointment at the Pyramid Center at 11. Wake up, Liam. Grandma is taking you to school today. 
The next hour was a blur of activity, showering, gulps of hazelnut-flavored coffee, ironing, making sure Liam ate all his cereal and didn't crash into any of the plants propagating on the garden wall in the kitchen. His growth spurts made him coltish and clumsy. There was a small, ceremonial moment, a lull in the morning chaos, as Mina unwrapped a pair of new Jimmy Choo pumps. They'd been incredibly expensive, but when she'd seen them a month ago during a trip into the city, she knew she had to have them. She'd used the money her parents sent her for her birthday. This morning they felt like success as she slipped them on her feet. One last perusal in the mirror confirmed her long, dark, springy curls were still half-tamed, pulled back from her face and anchored by a clip just below her crown. Her midnight blue suit, with its long, slightly belled sleeves, projected confidence with a feminine touch. She needed everything to be just right today, inside and out. She walked into the living room, being careful not to bump into any plants along the way. Not the row of trees in the hall, ficus, fig, rubber, not the collection of ferns hanging from the entry to the living room, Boston, palm, asparagus, and not the massive philodendron that grew along a shelf beneath the living room ceiling, trailers dangling down the wall. What a difference a day makes in you, Mina. Grandma Beam sat on the couch. She silenced the television, which was set to her morning news and entertainment program. She wore jeans and an orange sweatshirt with an appliqued fall leaf on it. Her gray hair was spiked up and over, like a rooster's comb. I got used to you working from home and wearing leggings and t-shirts. Me, too. Keys jingling in one hand, her laptop bag, umbrella and raincoat slung over her other arm, Mina was ready to leave. Hugs and kisses, Liam. Mommy's leaving. Mommy, I can't go to school today. I can't find my other shoe. Liam ran into the living room. He lifted his pants legs to show a sneaker on one foot and a sock with a hole in the toe on the other. How is it that my baby always loses his shoes and outgrows his socks? Fire drill, people. Mina slid out of her heels, dropped her briefcase to the floor, tossed her raincoat and umbrella onto a chair and made a mad dash around the house to find a match for a blue and red Spider-Man tennis shoe. And even though Liam searched, and Grandma Beam phoned a friend for advice on lost footwear, the sneaker remained elusive. Not by the door. Not in the kitchen. Not in the bathroom. Not hiding in any of Grandma's planters. Mina was starting to sweat. She needed a backup plan. There were rain boots in the closet but the sole of one boot flopped loose and was a leaky trip hazard. Could she send Liam in sandals? Unfortunately, no. The weatherman had predicted rain, which in California didn't always mean it would rain. But still. Here it is, Grandma Beam sing songed. It was under the couch cushion. What was it doing in there? Mina asked Liam, setting a record for speedy shoe tying. I didn't want the bad guys to find it, Liam said innocently. Mina laughed, tension easing. That's my boy. Always thinking ahead. She slid her feet back into her pretty shoes, grabbed her briefcase and keys, gave everyone hugs and kisses, and then she was out the door. It wasn't until Mina turned onto the narrow two-lane highway out of town that she realized she'd forgotten her coat and umbrella. The wind was swirling leaves across the road and a glance upward revealed heavy, dark clouds. But there was no time to go back. Maybe it won't rain, Mina muttered to herself just as plump raindrops fell on her windshield, a precursor to the heavens opening and releasing a downpour moments later. Maybe it won't be raining in the city, Mina muttered, trying to think of a backup plan to avoid showing up for her meeting looking like a drowned rat. A flash of color on the passenger seat caught her eye. She tugged her laptop bag closer to see what was beneath it. Okay. That was a mixed blessing. If it was raining in the city, she would have something. Liam's Spider-Man umbrella. It wasn't quite the impression Mina wanted to make with Vivian McLeod. But it was better than the drowned rat alternative. We'll probably meet Hud, so don't let him bait you. The door to the pyramid center from the parking garage swung closed after Walter, almost hitting Mina in the face. If we do meet Hud, he may try to test your knowledge of the issues. Not a problem. Mina hurried to keep up, legs suddenly wobbly. One of her curls escaped and fell onto her cheek. The traffic had been impossible, and she'd missed her coffee prep time with Walter. 
she was about to meet one of her idols, the woman who'd shaken hands with at least six presidents, a dozen heads of state and probably a Supreme Court justice or two, and she hadn't had the opportunity to collect herself. Or to have a second dose of caffeine. Mina spotted the coffee counter in the lobby. Do we have time to grab a cup of? No. Listen closely. You'll have to pass muster with the McLeod campaign manager, too, Walter continued, passing a hand over his bald head. Stu Fenderson serves as Viv's assistant now. I've heard about Stu. Old, crotchety, set in his ways. Mina knew how to deal with him, never waffle on an issue, speak loud enough for his hearing aid to pick up and never let him have the last word. But it's most important that Viv approves of you. Make a bad impression, Anne. Everybody in politics loves her and they'll do anything she asks. Walter pointed at Mina, as serious as she'd ever seen him. Anything. Including blackball you. So, let's not tell Viv you're having lunch with another candidate unless we have to. I have a meeting with someone else? This was news to Mina. She wondered if she had time to do so and get back to Harmony Valley in time for Liam's performance. I thought the McClouds wanted to hire me, us. This is a preliminary meeting to lay out the challenges HUD would face were he to run and to see if they like you. Your next appointment is with another potential candidate. Roger Bartholomew. I sent you an email this morning with the details. Walter headed toward the security station in front of the elevators, steps quick and confident. I would have prepped you earlier, but you had to move to the weeds. I had to reschedule our meeting with the McClouds because it took you nearly four hours to get here. Have you ever driven in Bay Area traffic during the rain? It had been mostly stop and go on the highway. I don't commute because I wisely chose to live in the city, Walter quipped. No one but dot-com millionaires and old money live in the city now, Mina countered, practically running to keep up on her short legs. The rents are sky high. Work out a deal with the McClouds and I'll give you a raise. A raise won't keep my son's identity a secret. The large lobby suddenly felt small, with walls that were closing in. There had to be an out here. If you're so hot to land Hudson McLeod as a candidate, why schedule a meeting with Roger? Never show up without a bargaining chip. That's smart politics. Walter frowned at Mina over his shoulder as he handed the security guard his ID, you'll want to run the campaign your way. But in order to do that, we need the McLeods to believe that there's a choice. And in this case, the choice is yours. Choice? Mina dug in her laptop bag for her wallet. You're giving me the responsibility for this decision, only because you don't want to risk your friendship with Mrs. McLeod. She produced her I.D. to the security guard, frowning right back at her boss. But there is no decision other than Hudson, is there? You'll work on his campaign. Hands on. And if I say no? Walter searched her face. This isn't like you, Mina. You love highly visible, tricky campaigns. This is your show. And it will open the door to bigger campaigns which would mean bigger money. You could afford to move back to the city. Afford a nanny. I know you don't enjoy writing speeches and policy copy for websites. This will benefit us both. I don't. But that's not. You said that she'd have the freedom to accept or reject this offer that she'd be able to define her role in the campaign. Curiosity killed the cat. Stupid, stupid curiosity. Mina glanced back at the exit, fighting the urge to flee. But it was too late for that. She needed calm. She needed composure. Because for the first time, she wasn't going to do what Walter wanted. He'd probably fire her. In search of a backbone, her gaze dropped to her Jimmy shoes. Shoes don't fail me now. Mina squared her shoulders, lifted her posture, and hardened her expression until she was certain Walter wouldn't see how scared she was at being forced into a corner. It wasn't just her privacy or Liam's at stake. It was her paycheck. I'll listen to what the McClouds have to say. But you said it yourself. I don't sugarcoat anything. You can tell it like it is. And give me your answer on Monday morning. Walter led her toward the elevators. The answer we all want to hear. Everyone except me, that is. They got into an empty elevator car. Mina's mind raced. Liam. Samuel. Secrets. 
A web was closing around her. A sticky web. She stared at the button marked L for lobby, then at the electronic display flashing floor numbers, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. They exited at the 42nd floor. Walter marched ahead while Mina trotted behind him past several clear glass entryways, providing a look into the businesses they held. The McLeod offices loomed ahead. Their doors had been replaced with frosted ones so that no one in the hallway could see in. Walter pushed open the door, letting it swing shut behind him. Mina hesitated in the hallway, palm resting on the cool, pebbled glass, tension buzzing in her ears. Don't shy away from hard things. That was her father's voice, barking with military command as if she was one of his soldiers. Always be honest and do yourself proud. Mina pushed the door open and stepped into an opulent reception area that was decorated in muted greys and deep burgundies. She let the door close behind her, taking in her surroundings and coming face to face with a large oil portrait of Hamilton and Vivian McLeod flanked by their two grown sons, Hudson and Samuel. The men all shared a strong nose and cleft chin. No one smiled. It was a somber portrait, no doubt created as a legacy marker. All the mischievous charm had been painted out of Samuel's expression, which was sad. There you are. I thought we'd lost you. Walter stood next to an old man with a grizzled appearance, whose rumpled suit was a far cry from Walter's fine wool one. Mina DeWitt, this is Stu Fenderson. Stu wrinkled his nose until his lined face complemented his rumpled suit. His hand latched onto Mina's like a tentacle, trapping Mina's until he found a weakness. You're shorter than I expected. It was odd how men in politics liked to throw insults. Mina smiled, grateful her heels put her at the old man's height. She'd bet no one ever described Stu as tall either. She looked him up and down. Yeah, I hear that a lot, especially from men with a 24-inch inseam. Those who were also height-challenged. Hand still pumping hers, Stu glanced down at Mina's shoes, which were barely visible beneath the cuff of her blue slacks. Might be hard to keep up with us in those. Are you kidding? These are a campaign necessity. Since Stu still pumped her hand, Mina leaned closer until she could almost smell the oil he'd used to comb over what few strands of white hair he had left. You see, I double as campaign security. These heels are licensed to kill in 10 of the 50 states. At the price you paid, they should be illegal in 15. Vivian McLeod stood in a doorway to Mina's left looking just as beautiful and composed in real life as she did on television, only taller. Hamilton McLeod's widow wore a conservative cream-colored skirt and jacket that accented her statuesque figure. Her silver hair was stylishly cut at shoulder length to accent the classic bone structure of her face. Women in Jimmy Choo's don't mess around, especially when those shoes haven't gone on sale yet this season. Let her be, Stu. Stu reluctantly eased the suction on Mina's hand. So, you were able to get us the candidate whisperer, Walter. Mrs. McLeod towered over Mina as she approached. Liam didn't get his height solely from the McLeod men. Don't think about Liam. Or Samuel. Or secrets. But that was all she could think about. Only the best for our boy. Walter gave his raincoat to the receptionist as he made the introductions. Mina's strong on strategy and a compelling speechwriter. At the receptionist's outstretched hand, Mina relinquished Liam's Spider-Man umbrella, to which, the well-trained staff member barely blinked an eye. But Mina had no time to ponder her impression since she was suddenly shaking hands with Liam's grandmother. The strength of Vivian McLeod's grip rivaled that of many powerful men Mina had met. This was a woman who'd be fearless against those who inflicted injustice and deception upon the McLeod family. Like me. I should have told them years ago. Guilt rose like a rogue wave and washed over Mina, leaving her both hot and cold. And yet, the guilt must not have shown on Mina's face because the McLeod matriarch spoke warmly to her. Thank you for coming. My pleasure, ma'am. Mina prided herself on her composure. She was a pro, a woman with a solid reputation in politics as a straight shooter. And a big fat liar about. Do not think about Liam or Samuel or secrets. Ma'am? That reference makes me feel old. Mrs. McLeod's cool, amused gaze swept over the men before returning to Mina. You may call me Vivian. Later, you can tell me where you got those shoes. This was surreal. Thank you, Vivian. 
Vivian smiled approvingly. This looks like the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Don't you think so, Stu? Let's see what she can do with him first. Stu gestured to a door behind him. Vivian strolled past Mina to that door and opened it without knocking. HUD, everyone's here for your meeting. Chapter 3 Most people hated the rain. Cherise Beam prided herself on not being most people. She loved the wild elements of nature. She taught botany at Berkeley while her husband Toby worked as a researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They traveled the world, traipsing through forests and deserts, visiting their daughter and her family at the different overseas military bases where they were deployed. Even when Mina came to live with them for four years during high school, they'd continued to have adventures around the globe. No. Rain had never stopped Cherise. But a bum hip and other health issues might. She limped past a row of coyote brush on the lookout for snails and slugs, enjoying the rain's patter on the hood of her yellow slicker. She'd have to go in soon and eat. She felt empty inside and the begins of a headache forming. But who wanted to go inside to eat carrots? Cherise. She turned as a faded green Buick pulled up in front of the house. Agnes Villanova was behind the wheel. Did you find Liam's shoe? Yes. Cherise limped to the curb. What are you doing out? She knew Agnes disliked big weather systems. They'd been neighbors and friends for decades. I'm headed over to Mildred's for lunch. Agnes was a widow, like Cherise, with short gray hair, like Cherise. But that's where the similarities ended. Agnes was short, like Mina, and relatively slender, like Mina. While Cherise was of average height and was overweight for the first time in her life, a fact she blamed on her bum hip. Agnes leaned away from the open car window and the splattering rain. I was wondering if you had any houseplants you wanted to sell at May's Pretty Things. The boutique run by Agnes and others on Main Street. Jill Patrizio, the woman who runs that retreat center? She makes pottery and brought over some beautiful planters. They'd sell better with plants in them. I do have some houseplants I've been propagating in the kitchen. And Mina had been urging her to reduce the number of plants inside. I'll swing by the boutique this weekend. Cherise took a few steps back from the curb, limping, and feeling a bit lightheaded. That was a more common occurrence lately since she'd been dieting. That limp of yours is getting more pronounced. Agnes didn't miss much. The doctor wants me to lose weight before he does the hip replacement, Cherise grumbled. Seems impossible most days. It's not as if I'm going to jazzercise. Not when it hurt to walk or sit or turn over in bed. Luckily, she had an alternative option to exercise and a meeting about it scheduled for Monday. An appointment she'd kept secret from Mina and was nervous about. Doctors are the devil, aren't they? Agnes smiled ruefully. They'll grant you the surgery if you fall and break your hip, but not so you won't fall and break your hip. Ain't that the truth? Cherise waved before limping back to her hedges, walking carefully so she wouldn't slip on the slick grass. Because with her luck, if she fell, she'd break more than her hip. And then her chances of having any more adventures would dwindle to none. Chapter 4 HUD, everyone's here for your meeting. HUD's mother held his office door open as the jury filed in with a verdict, salvageable candidate or not. Dad, if you're looking down from heaven, I could use a little intervention. HUD drew a steadying breath. The quality of the campaign manager Walter O'Connell brought with him on this stormy day would be telling. If he brought a no talent, HUD would need to come up with plan B. HUD stood and came around his desk, nodding to Stu and shaking hands with Walter. He didn't see anyone behind Walter's tall, broad frame. I have my answer. My political career is over. The breath HUD expelled was heavy. Dejected, he turned back to his desk. His mother cleared her throat inclining her head almost imperceptibly toward the door. Hud glanced around to face a pixie with big, dark eyes and long, wild black curls, including one artfully arranged on her cheek. She'd been hidden behind Walter. Mina DeWitt. Cheeks pinkening, the pixie thrust out her hand. Mina DeWitt. He'd heard of her. She was good. Very good. So good, in fact, that she'd earned the reputation as a candidate whisperer. 
spirits rising, Hud took Ms. DeWitt's hand gingerly in both of his, afraid his normal grip might crush her delicate bones. Warm and soft, her hand fit nicely between his. And her eyes. A man could gaze into those eyes for hours. She was beautiful. Truly breathtaking. That can't be good. Despite her solid reputation, there was no way Mina DeWitt was capable of the cutthroat behavior HUD needed from a campaign manager. Her hands were more suited to soothing babies than salvaging careers, those dark eyes more fitting for comfort in a storm than combat in the political trenches. And that wild mass of hair. He wanted to test if that curl on her cheek was as silky as it looked, wanted to know if the dark corkscrew would bounce back if he tugged on it. As if sensing his assessment fell short of her reputation, Ms. DeWitt's eyes flashed. She gripped his hand firmly, gave it a good shake and then dropped it. You don't want to greet a woman like that. You should acknowledge everyone, male or female, with a brief but firm grip. The absence of her warm hand in his robbed hut of speech. Or maybe it was the chill in her tone. That chill was shocking. Didn't she realize who he was? Hadn't she felt that bolt of attraction? While he was dumbfounded, his mother came to his defense. I think it's a sweet gesture. Women see it as something more subtle and, Ms. DeWitt gave Hudson a quick glance as she crossed the room to set down her stylish leather briefcase. Perhaps belittling. Sometimes even a bit suggestive. Whoa. I didn't mean. I know you didn't. Ms. DeWitt cut him off ruthlessly, digging in her briefcase with quick, choppy movements, as if she, too, had been thrown off kilter when they touched. Good. She pulled business cards from her bag, passed them out, and then perched on a chair beneath a portrait of Hud's great-grandfather, the first McLeod politician. She gestured for everyone to be seated as if this was her office, not his. My point is that every gesture, every word, every interaction must convey what you want it to, and only what you want it to. If that was true, what was she conveying? It felt like rejection. Of him. They'd only just met. Walter, what kind of game are you playing? Hud frowned as he gave the attractive Spitfire a wide berth on the way to his seat behind the desk. The kind of game you should have played when you were Senator McLeod. Ms. DeWitt looked past Hud's shoulder in the direction of Alcatraz, although the clouds were too thick to see it today. Play up your strengths, admit your mistakes honestly and sincerely, and then move on. Do you want me to continue? No, Hud said at the same time his mother said, yes, arching her silver brows as she looked at Hud. Okay. Point to mother. This was going to be just as painful as she'd predicted. Hud rolled his shoulders back, trying to rid himself of his rising annoyance. Ms. DeWitt, I'm done with hearing advice about what I should have done. Every political pundit with a TV show or a podcast has already weighed in on that. Now, if you have thoughts on my current situation, please go on. She nodded briefly and addressed the room instead of him. According to a poll we conducted this week, one-third of registered voters believe Hudson did the honorable thing by stepping down when it appeared the family business was benefiting from legislation he signed into law. One-third considered his resignation an admission of guilt. And one-third couldn't care less about him. Ms. DeWitt leaned toward Hud's mother. Now, if you look at women, two-thirds considered what Hudson did honorable. We'll need to keep the female vote happy, but at a distance. We can't have as much as a breath of scandal. Her gaze bounced to Hud's hands, which were folded on his desk blotter. Hud's fingers flexed, tightened, white-knuckled. Her summation explained her aversion to his handshake. Didn't make Hud feel any better, but at least he had a bead on where she was coming from. Mina cleared her throat before continuing. Voters were also asked who they'd prefer sitting down to dinner with, Hudson or the current president, and the majority chose our commander-in-chief. Then we gave them a choice between Hudson or Samuel, and the majority chose Samuel. She seemed unexpectedly pleased that Hud had failed on both measures. What kind of question is that? And how had Hud lost to his happy-go-lucky, never-run-for-office, dead brother? Sorry, Samuel. But that's not fair. It's a standard question, Walter explained. If voters can't relate to you, they won't vote for you. I would have chosen the president, too, Stu inserted almost absently. His mother shushed their family's longtime assistant. Ms. DeWitt smiled and nodded at Stu, clearly agreeing with him. 
If Hudson is serious about his candidacy, he'll have to publicly address why he stepped down and the past won't come into play here, Hud interjected. This is about the present and the future. Ms. DeWitt's brow creased ever so slightly. She turned to his mother once more. Regardless, we'll need to create a more appealing persona. Hud's jaw tightened. The verdict was in. Despite his mother recruiting the A-team, his prospects were grim. In fact, Mina DeWitt, who had a reputation for doing the impossible in politics, didn't like him. Of that, he was certain. If you enter this race, your opponent will most likely attack your Senate record relentlessly. That's what I'd do in their shoes. Ms. DeWitt gave Hud a look that dared him to contradict her. So, Hudson, why don't you tell us why you think anyone should back you? Donors? Unions? Law enforcement? Let's hear it in your words. Walter started to speak, but Ms. DeWitt held up a hand. Let him answer, Walter. He has to be able to handle the heat. Since you're hesitating, Hudson, I'll ask you in a different way. How do you expect to increase your chances to win? It had been years since anyone had challenged Hud. He was a McLeod, for heaven's sake. People, especially those in politics, tended to give the McLeods a wide berth. His pulse quickened. I thought we paid you to improve my chances. Something flared in Ms. DeWitt's eyes. She may have dressed in designer clothes and spent hours to get that hair of hers to fall artfully over her face, but she wasn't an all-fluff, no-substance debutante. Her fact-gathering proved that, and her nearly black eyes accented with minimal cosmetics told him she was no-nonsense. For an instant, Hud considered giving up. But that wasn't the way he rolled. Are you saying that your reputation isn't what it's rumored to be? And what is that exactly? Ms. DeWitt's gaze hardened the way only seasoned backroom dealmakers could when someone got in their way. Good. That you're a proven winner. Hud leaned forward. That you take weaknesses and turn them into strengths. That you have honor among the blowhards that fill this industry. I don't back candidates who don't have what it takes to win. She was so certain. So, so, annoying. In that moment, with her eyes blazing and her dark hair spiraling in wild waves around her face, Hud wanted to kiss her. He sat back, stunned. Walter? His mother turned to her friend, a look of alarm on her face. Walter cleared his throat. I'm fine. Hud silenced the older man with a gesture before the older political consultant could enter the fray, tucking thoughts of kissing aside. What makes you think I don't have what it takes to win, Ms. DeWitt? She'd come on too strong. The rain, the traffic, the games Walter was playing. They'd all combined to throw Mina off. No. It was him. Hudson had gotten Mina out of rhythm. From the get-go, his greeting had created cracks in her composure and put her on the defensive. His touch was electric. And up close, he was magnetic. She'd seen Hudson speak before from a distance but had never met him. He was tall, taller than Samuel, and so perfectly put together, not a strand of black hair out of place, not a wayward crease in his expensive suit. His penetrating gaze challenged as intensely as it beckoned. And yet, Samuel's voice filled her head, my brother Hud is larger than life. Determined. Dependable. He's never lost at anything he set his sights on. That's what Samuel had told her. The important thing being that Hudson never lost. That is, not until two years ago when he gave up rather than fight, stepping down from his elected position. She'd assumed his confidence had been shaken. She'd wanted to goad him into realizing his campaign would be too messy and thus he'd decide not to run. Only she'd played that card a bit too hard, unsettled by the rain, the traffic, Walter. Him. And instead of demoralizing Hudson, she'd awakened a sleeping giant, a man who was used to winning his way. Mina stood, capturing Hudson's gaze, ignoring the familiar, stubborn cleft to his chin. I'm no different than any other voter. I want to believe that you're a good person worthy of my trust. I'll even forgive you a few mistakes if you own up to them, admit what you learned, and apologize. But you haven't said anything that tells me you're in this for me, not you. Not two years ago, and certainly not today. Why do you want to run? Serving others is what McLeods do, he said tightly. There are many ways to serve. Why run for mayor? 
Mina was backing Hudson into a corner. Pushing and pushing until she badgered him into answering, not deflecting. There was something off here. Something she was missing. Hudson's mouth thinned into a hard line. He exchanged a look with his mother but didn't say anything more. And Mina was oddly, disappointed. There was something about sparring with him that both frustrated and invigorated her. I'll tell you another hurdle you have to overcome, Mina continued, resting her hand on Walter's shoulder, giving it an apologetic squeeze. Voters want to back someone with a captivating personality. I admit, you have a presence, but you don't let the public see who you are. Mina disregarded a twinge of discomfort for being brutally honest to Hudson in front of his mother. There was a code among mamas about not criticizing each other's children and she was breaking it. I could find little about you of personal note in the press or social media. You're not married. You don't date. You don't show up at ball games or the beach. Do you have a dog? A hobby? Who knows? Everything about you, from this high-rise office suite to the domineering expression on your face shouts, stay away from me. Mina faced Vivian, hoping Liam's grandmother might understand, hoping she wouldn't hold Mina's rejection of Hudson against her. But as a mother, Mina wouldn't forgive anyone who stood in the way of her son's dreams. I was hoping Hudson was someone open, honest and humble, someone I could trust to watch out for the interests of my son. I'd pour my heart into a campaign for someone like that, regardless of what his last name was. Too much, Mina. You've said too much. But Hudson wants to run an old-school campaign with a campaign manager who obeys his orders. He won't take advice, certainly not from me. Silence buzzed in her ears. She'd managed to make the McLeod speechless. Not good. Mina waited for Walter to jump in. To support her. To impress upon Hudson that his attitude was a losing one. Walter kept his mouth shut. It was time to make an exit. Mina gathered her briefcase. Excuse me. I have another appointment. In the unemployment line. Well, that's that, Hud's mother announced flatly. I'm sorry. You agree that my political career is over because I have a private life? There was so much frustration pumping through Hud's veins that he could barely sit still, could barely process the past few minutes other than the fact that Walter's consultant thought he'd lose the mayor's race. You agree that I can no longer be in public service because I don't want to address the past? Mina's assessments are usually right on the money, Walter said before mom could reply. She's a regular firecracker, Stu admitted, smiling a bit too wide. I'd pay to see that again. Are all your strategists like her, Walter? Who shall we bring in next? No one. His mother waved a weary hand, sending Hud a pitying look. Pity. His mother's sentiment turned Hud's stomach. I wonder who else is entering the race. Stu was still smiling. And if Mina will back someone. Oh, she'll have a horse in this race. Walter smiled in that all-knowing way of his, giving away that he had something else up his sleeve. Because Mina is the best on my staff, she can pick and choose her clients. She has a lunch meeting next. With another potential candidate? Stu asked before Hud could. Walter nodded, patting Mom's shoulder consolingly one last time. Mina told you what you needed to do to run and win, Hud. I've never known her to steer someone wrong. She was giving me advice? Hud ran a hand through his hair. It felt more like she was steamrolling me. Mina doesn't beat around the bush. She laid out the obstacles to your campaign. She asked what you'd bring to the race. She told you what voters want and what you need to do to win their vote, Walter said in a neutral voice. And you shut down, falling back on the family name or perhaps wounds of the past. Mina doesn't work with candidates who aren't open to do what's needed to win. That's why she wins. The candidate whisperer, Mom murmured, gaze connecting with Huds. Too late. Hud recognized what he'd let walk out the door. Walter stood, smiling fondly, at Mom. It was an interesting idea. Or it would have been if Hud was willing to turn the campaign reins over to Mina. Now, just so I don't feel as if I wasted the morning, would you like to go to lunch, Viv? I'm always free for lunch with you, Walter, his mother replied with an apologetic look in Hud's direction. Maybe I can convince you to call Mina and ask her for a second meeting with Hud, now that he understands what she expects of him. 
to put myself in her small, capable hands. A part of Hud rebelled at the idea even as a part of him was happy to do so. A second meeting? Mina is more decisive than that. Walter buttoned his suit jacket. I imagine after lunch at the Golden Loaf, she'll have made a decision, even if I gave her until Monday to choose a candidate our firm will back. Hud had time to change Mina DeWitt's mind. Without another word, he sprinted toward the door. Chapter 5 Well, I, Vivian didn't know what to say as she watched Hud's retreating back. He's usually very steady, Walter. Stu filled in the void. I'm sure he is, Walter agreed considerately. I'm still free for lunch, Viv. From the day her husband had introduced Vivian to the tall, broad-shouldered political consultant, Walter had called her Viv. She'd always been Vivian to her husband, yet there was something about the way Walter said the nickname that she'd always liked. Do you think Hud went after Mina? If he wants to re-enter politics, he better be hightailing it after her. Walter gestured for Vivian to precede him out of Hudson's office, and then called his driver requesting he bring the car around. Frankly, it's what I was counting on. Sly dog. Vivian smiled, accepting her raincoat from the receptionist. Mina was right, you know. About Hud being a stuffed shirt. Was she? That was just like Walter to be evasive. He didn't so much as smile. Before today, I thought they'd met before. Why? Vivian couldn't think of a reason. Oh, I don't know. Same circles and all that. Walter glanced at the door to the hallway. If they met before, it didn't end well, did it? Vivian chuckled. Hud was as wound up as an eight-day clock. They're both tightly wound. Walter was being incredibly agreeable considering he might have lost some business with them. Walter helped Vivian into her raincoat. He smoothed her coat collar, his hands drifted down her arms slowly. Vivian froze. Walter was always such a gentleman. She'd probably misread the moment. They were friends. That touch, that touch was just supportive. What had they been talking about? Uh... Hud and Mina. In that way, they're equally matched. I like Mina. It takes a strong woman to go out in Jimmy Choo's on a day like today with only a Spider-Man umbrella. Most admirable. Walter held the door and bid. Goodbye. To Stu. Vivian passed Walter and headed toward the elevators, her walk unusually self-conscious. How are your kids? Healthy. Still married. Financially sound. Walter reached in front of Vivian to press the elevator button. Now that the grandchild is talking, I've found he's actually interesting. Really? I always preferred holding babies. Vivian suppressed her envy. With her husband and Samuel gone, her life was too empty. Not that she wanted it filled with politics again. She'd lost most of her friends in Washington after Hudson stepped down, which just proved they weren't really her friends. Returning to the present, Vivian forced herself to smile. Walter didn't deserve her melancholy mood. You're too young to be a grandfather. He chuckled, the textured sound filling her chest in an odd way. I'm old enough to be a widower, as are you. Ten, fifteen years ago when our kids were in high school, we were old enough to be grandparents. We were just lucky, that's all. You don't fit the mold of any grandparent I know. Vivian stepped into the empty elevator, noting how thoughtful Walter was to have a hand on the door as she moved in. Let me tell you about today's grandparents. Walter crossed his arms and leaned against the wall. He was one of a few men from their generation who was considerably taller than she was. Grandparents nowadays still vote, but they travel and go out to eat at nice restaurants, too. And every once in a while, if they're lucky, they go on a date and lock lips with someone. Lock lips, Vivian's pulse raced. And it wouldn't slow. Despite the fact that she'd given up on the idea of romance years ago when Hamilton died. She forced herself to chuckle. Forced herself to speak. But she couldn't quite force herself to meet Walter's gaze directly. You always did have the oddest observations. It's called the truth, Viv. Walter sounded as if he wasn't aware he'd unsettled her. And she was unsettled. And overheated. And looking at Walter through the lens of a woman suddenly tempted to seek the end of a liplock drought. Chapter 6 
It's a pleasure to meet you, Roger. Mina extended her hand across the table at the golden loaf. Already, her mind was cataloging Roger's potential. His looks, his posture, his demeanor. Many women probably found Roger Bartholomew attractive, but his sun-streaked blonde hair and average chin didn't make near the impression on Mina that Hudson's presence did. Stop it. She tried to tell herself on the car ride over to the Golden Loaf that Hudson's features were similar to Samuel's, explaining her attraction to him. But Hudson was more intense, more serious, more, more, everything that she liked, in a candidate she represented. Mina drew a breath. Okay. She'd admit it, at least to herself. Hudson McLeod was everything she hadn't known she liked in a man. How unfortunate to realize that now. Roger cradled Mina's hand in both of his smooth, pale ones without shaking it at all. Handshake failure? Twice in one day. Mina extricated herself and tried to lift at least one corner of her mouth in a weak interpretation of a smile. She needed Roger to be a stellar candidate. And quickly, because she had to get back on the road to Harmony Valley if she wanted to make Liam's performance tonight. But that handshake wasn't promising. Once she settled into a chair across from Roger, Mina looked up to find Hudson at the maitre d'Eat stand. Their gazes collided, sending her heart to pounding. He knows about Liam. Why else would Hudson be here except to demand visitation and subject Liam to the kind of media circus and pressure to be perfect that Samuel had grown up with and rebelled against? Because he's a conceited nuisance who wants to be mayor and can't take no for an answer. Of course, that was it. Hud didn't like to lose. Calm returned, along with a steadier heartbeat. Would you excuse me, Roger? Mina hurried to the front of the restaurant, grabbed Hudson by the arm and tugged him toward the restrooms, out of Roger's line of vision. What are you doing here? Don't you have a company to run? Yes, but I took the day off to meet you. You're not finished with your assessment of me. Hudson thrust his hands into his raincoat pockets, looking pleased with himself. We didn't talk about my ideas for the city. Don't be a sore loser. Even in her heels, Mina had to tilt her head back to look him in those caramel-colored eyes, to take in his rapidly hardening expression. And yet, she still registered his handsome features framed by well-behaved, dark hair. Heaven, help her. He was a 10 on a 10-point scale. Although her time with Samuel had been brief, Mina had appreciated the fact that the hair at the nape of Samuel's neck curled uncontrollably and that he occasionally accented his laughter with a snort. Perfection like Hudson's should be off-putting or make him an 8.5 out of 10. Hudson scoffed at her. I don't lose. I'll just wait by the door for you to realize I'm a better risk than Roger. True to his word, tall, dark and annoying went to stand in the foyer. As Mina walked past him, he leaned close to say, what did you think of Roger's handshake? He saw. Mina didn't want to admit to him that Roger's handshake gave her the heebie-jeebies. With only two candidates on Walter's radar, if Roger had other qualities that were marketable, Mina was recommending him. Handshakes could be fixed. Personality flaws like Hudson's ego and stubbornness could not. I'm sorry for the interruption, Mina said to Roger as she sat and arranged her napkin in her lap. She looked about the table. Didn't we have menus? Yes. Roger's smile was too slick. I ordered for you while you were in the ladies' room. Mina tried to mask her irritation at Roger's presumptuous behavior. We've never met before. How did you know what to order? Roger leaned forward. I know what women like. He delivered the line with innuendo. Ew. If it wasn't for Hudson McLeod's standing watch, Mina might have left. Instead, she vowed to get the upper hand. Never presume, Roger. Flagging down a waiter, Mina requested a menu. I apologize. Roger looked quite unattractive when things didn't go his way. His features pinched. His eyes dulled. Even his golden highlights lost their shine. The press will eat him alive. Mina gave the menu a cursory glance before ordering an endive salad and lobster bisque served in a bread bowl. And then it was back to business. Roger, why do you want to be mayor? Roger's expression lightened but his smile felt as slick as butter, something that would melt when exposed to high heat. My family settled in the city over 100 years ago and it seems like a good place to start a political career. That wasn't an acceptable answer. 
but Mina wasn't giving up on Roger just yet. She tried again. If you were mayor, Mina trailed off as she caught Roger's attention drifting after a twiggy woman in a too short skirt passing their table. Excuse me? Sorry. Roger gave Mina an unrepentant grin, as if this were a common occurrence a female campaign manager wouldn't find both insulting and problematic. I'm always on the lookout for the next Mrs. Bartholomew. I've heard it's easier to get into office as a married man than as a single one. Oh, police. Roger wasn't politician material. Mina didn't need any more time to make that judgment, but she couldn't bail with Hudson waiting. And he was still waiting. Mina frowned. If she had to bear the burden of Roger's company through lunch, she was going to need a glass of wine. She held up a hand, signaled another waiter and requested a Pinot Grigio. At least the service at the Golden Loaf was excellent. Mina? Hudson appeared next to their table with an affable smile. I thought that was you. And then you waved Anne. I did not wave at you. Mina frowned at Hudson. Did you think I was asking you to join us? May I? There's a huge wait for a table. And I know Roger won't mind. Hudson gave Roger a dismissive smile and then sat beside Mina. This place is packed. We're having a private conversation, McLeod. Roger scowled. Hudson pointed at Mina and Roger. I'm not interrupting something romantic, am I? No. Mina felt like jabbing an elbow in Hudson's rib cage. Good. Just pretend I'm not here. I need to check emails anyway. With that, Hudson pulled out his phone and began scrolling through his messages. Mina bit the inside of her lip. Where was that waiter with her wine? The lady wants you to leave. Roger had lasted a whopping 30 seconds before saying anything to Hud. Really? Hud set his phone face down on the table, eager to prove to Mina what a bad candidate Roger would be. Given your track record for sexual harassment, Roger, I prefer to stay. He flexed his fingers from fully extended into a fist, sending a private message to the man on the other side of the table. Years ago, Hud's fist had connected with Roger's glass jaw when the jerk and his friends had tried to gang up on Hud. Far be it from Roger to start a fair fight. Lucky for Hud, Samuel had shown up to even the odds. And just to annoy Roger even further, Hud leaned back in his chair and put his arm across the top of Mina's chair in a proprietary gesture, as if to say, she's mine. It wasn't an unpleasant thought. Mina. Somewhere between Hud's office and the Golden Loaf she'd become someone who could believe in him, and he'd started thinking of her as Mina, not Ms. DeWitt. Gentlemen, please. Mina may have said gentlemen, plural, but she only stared at Hud. She bobbed her head in the direction of the door, accidentally freeing another wayward curl from the clip at the back of her head in her effort to get rid of him. If Mina wasn't going to willingly give him a second chance, Hud had no choice but to create his own opportunities. I hear you're interested in running for mayor, Roger. I'm curious. What would you put on your agenda? Agenda? The other man frowned. Thank you, Roger, for making this easy. Yes. What issues would take priority for you? Education? Healthcare? Transportation? HUD was feeding Roger lots of options to pursue. Public assistance? Roger shrugged. Doesn't the city have a lot of programs in place already? Yes, we do. HUD smiled and brought his head closer to Mina's because he knew it would annoy Roger. There are several great programs in San Francisco, but there are challenges, too. Affordable housing, solutions for the homeless, traffic congestion, balancing the needs of industry against tourism. HUD could go on. The city was at a crossroads. Roger waved dismissively. Like you know what's going on in San Francisco. I know that with the most attractive, public health care and services programs around that we attract more than our fair share of homeless. Hud sensed Mina's appraising gaze upon him and hoped she realized how passionate he was about serving his community. Our infrastructure is strained, and the New Bay Bridge isn't large enough to handle all the traffic during rush hour even with the increase in telecommuting. What? Are you running for the mayor's job? Roger snapped. Then he looked from Hud to Mina and swore. You are. That's enough, Mina interjected. Hud continued to turn his unflappable smile Roger's way. 
I'd like to think I can make the city a better place. That proves a lot right there. Roger shook his head. You're a dreamer. No one can change a thing. The best you can do is ride shotgun and hope for no earthquakes or terrorist attacks. I think you're wrong. And now, hopefully, Mina would, too. You're not going to impress Mina with lines like that. Roger's voice turned sour. These political consultants are realists. Aren't they? He appealed to Mina. I think, Mina said after looking the two of them over, things have gotten out of hand here and. You should go, Hud told Roger, moving his hand closer to Mina's shoulder. She brushed at his hand, but Hud held on. Roger stood, scowling. Don't make any hasty decisions about Hudson, Mina. Everyone knows he's a quitter. Tossing his napkin on the table, Roger left. Hud hadn't realized he'd gripped Mina's shoulder until she plucked his fingers free of her jacket. He apologized. Please tell me that more people in that survey wanted to go to dinner with me than with that pompous jerk. She didn't say a word. The waiter placed a glass of white wine in front of her. Mina scooted her chair away from Hud's. I've never seen such a childish display in my life, she told him in a low voice. You barge in here. Pull out your charts and show me Roger's numbers. Sit down in the midst of what is clearly a business meeting. Or I'll do it for you. And bully Roger into leaving. Her eyes were blazing, and her breath was ragged. For some reason, Hud couldn't stop smiling. He hadn't experienced a good fight in a long time. This morning, he'd been angry and frustrated and trying not to appear desperate. But he'd come to realize while waiting for her in the restaurant's lobby that Mina DeWitt made him feel again. For two years, he'd kept his emotions bottled up inside. But Mina. Sparring with her was like playing a lively game of tennis against an opponent that kept him on his toes. Mina made him feel refreshed and purposeful and more committed than ever to return to public service. With her, he could regain a shine to his legacy. Hud gave her laptop bag a significant glance. I can wait all day for those survey results. Because he was going to get Mina's endorsement for mayor if he had to follow her home. Chapter 7 Perhaps I should call Hud. Vivian fiddled with the stem of her wine glass as she sat across from Walter in one of San Francisco's most exclusive restaurants. Walter put his chin on his hand and studied her intently, much the way he'd been doing all through lunch, as if he'd just met her and was trying to figure her out. Why? He's a grown man. I know, but I want him to be happy. After age 18, they have to be in charge of finding their own happiness. True. Vivian attempted a smile. She'd spoiled Samuel because Hamilton had been so hard on Hud. It had taken Samuel a long time to grow up. He'd dropped in and out of college so often that Hamilton had washed his hands of him. That had been heartbreaking. But Samuel had seemed to find purpose in the army after Hamilton died. When he was killed overseas, Vivian was glad she'd made his short life so special. Adversity builds character, Walter pointed out, reaching for Vivian's hand. More so than an easy life. And character is what makes a good politician. Walter was smart. And always so supportive, always there when she needed him. A decade ago, Walter had stood by her side when Hamilton passed away from complications created by his kidney disease. He'd helped Hud see her through the loss of Samuel nearly five years later and had been one of the few people who didn't disappear when things fell apart for Hud in the Senate. When she called earlier in the week to discuss Hud's options, Walter had been the one to suggest Mina and she'd readily agreed, having heard of her reputation as someone who could handle tricky campaigns. With her hand enveloped in Walter's larger one, Vivian felt safe. We've had enough adversity in our lives. Hud doesn't need any more. Your son is strong enough to weather a few more storms by himself. Walter stroked his thumb across the back of Vivian's hand, sending an almost forgotten thrill skittering through her. You're the one I want to see happy. Vivian tried to ease her hand back, but Walter held on with a gentle but firm grip. If she had any sense, she'd think her old friend was making a move on her. But Vivian knew better. Powerful men like Walter pursued young, noble bodies. She was nearing 65 with skin that had lost its elasticity and body parts that drooped. Believe me. Vivian patted Walter's hand and gently extricated herself, because she knew what he wanted even if he seemed not to at the moment. I'm happy. 
With a significant glance at his empty hand, Walter's eyebrows went up a centimeter or two. They both knew her statement was a fib. Vivian had spent the last two years moping around. A change of subject was in order. Why on earth are you considering Roger Bartholomew, she asked, having known Roger since Hud was in elementary school. Roger is what my mother-in-law would have called a huckster. Someone who aspired to office for fame and monetary benefits. I thought you didn't want Hud back in politics. She nodded. I've grown accustomed to the peace and quiet. But perhaps, it's too quiet? Vivian sighed. I'm being wishy-washy. I apologize. You've retreated from the world, but you can't quite give up influencing it. Walter gave her an indulgent smile. You can't have it both ways, Viv. She laughed. I admit, I'm torn. I don't want HUD hurt. And when you've done all that I've done, why be bothered with the spectacle of politics and public life? Vivian gestured to the room full of men and women in suits. So much pretense. Next thing you know, you'll be telling me that I'm overdressed. Walter straightened his tie. It was a designer tie with swirls of varying shades of blue. Do you want me to buy you some support hose and a rocking chair? I don't consider myself elderly. Vivian bristled. Then don't act like it. There was that spark of male interest in his eyes again. Vivian didn't want to admit that she longed for a rocking chair and a lap filled with babies more than she longed to stand behind Hud while he gave speech after speech. Maybe I want something different. Maybe I want to be, needed. Go on, Walter urged softly. Never mind. Vivian wasn't ready to tell Walter that she had no reason to get up in the morning and no reason to climb into her empty bed at night. Chapter 8 Mina's lunch still hadn't arrived. And increasingly, Mina was having a hard time ignoring Hudson. She checked her phone. Shoot. It was 1.15. It would take at least three hours to get home, if not four. She couldn't stay any longer and miss Liam's performance. I've got to go. With her wine relatively untouched and her stomach empty. Wait, Hudson commanded. Tell me if my polling figures are stronger than Roger's. I have to pick up my son. Grabbing her laptop bag, Mina wended her way to the door. On her way out, she left money with the maitre d' for the bill. Do you have an umbrella? The maitre d' tasked. It's really coming down. Glancing up, Mina saw the downpour. Idiot. She'd left Liam's Spider-Man umbrella in Hudson's office. And she'd left her car at the Pyramid Center, which was at least 10 blocks away. Getting a taxi or a rideshare midday in the city was always challenging, but during a deluge would be next to impossible. A hand touched her shoulder. Mina jumped and twisted her ankle as she lost her balance. She would have fallen if not for a steady hand on her arm. Let me give you a ride. Hudson's eyes were a different color than Samuel's soft caramel. Hudson's were the shade of strong whiskey, a potent, potentially overwhelming force. She'd never liked whiskey. I'll get a taxi. Mina tried to remember where the nearest hotel was. That would be her best bet for finding transportation. You'll need this. Hudson pulled Liam's small Spider-Man umbrella out of his inner raincoat pocket. My assistant realized you left without it. Hallelujah. My shoes are saved. That was very nice of you, she allowed. I can be kind. Hudson smiled, gaze searching unexpected, as that seems to you. Given how we rub each other the wrong way, I don't think we can work together. There. That was both gracious and truthful. Hudson continued to look into her eyes. You don't pull any punches, do you? Neither do you. Mina didn't like that they had that in common. She turned toward the door. The rain came down so hard it sounded as if there was a rocket blasting off outside. My shoes. The umbrella might not be enough protection. How about we declare a truce? Hudson's expression hadn't changed. He still seemed determined to win her over. You'll never get a cab, and my driver is just around the corner. I can give you a ride. Mina didn't want to accept. But if she didn't, she might not get home in time for Liam's performance. All right. Thank you, she relented. 
While he called his driver, Mina removed her beloved shoes, stuffed the toes of them in her laptop bag and covered them with the flap before clutching the bag to her chest. She glanced at the maitre d. Sorry. I'll have my bare feet out of here before you can say health inspector. You're good. The man grinned. I've never seen a health inspector come in during a downpour. Where can we take you? Hud asked Mina after she'd run barefoot to his electric Mercedes. Most women he knew would have complained about the rain rather than go barefoot. Mina continued to surprise him. I parked at your building. Mina opened her briefcase and pulled out her precious shoes, spilling a file bursting with clippings, photos, and papers on the seat between them. Hud recognized the edge of one of his Senate campaign photos. His fingers twitched as he wondered what else was in her bag. Roger's survey results? They didn't get wet, she murmured, reverently placing the shoes on the floor before sinking back and closing her eyes. She curled her wet toes, shimmering with pink polish, into the carpet. I'll just sit here and pretend I'm invisible and that both of today's meetings didn't happen. Can you wake me when we get there? It's going to be a long drive home in this weather. Sure. Hud stared at her in wonder. Graham, back to home base. Mina's eyes fluttered open. She glanced at Graham, behind the wheel, before closing her eyes again and sinking deeper into her seat. Hud continued to stare at her. Mystified. Most political consultants would be making polite conversation with a McLeod, not close their eyes for a catnap. Politics was a small world, after all, and one never knew when a contact would come in handy. Was she that confident? Or did she truly not care what he thought about her? Graham inched the car forward in traffic. Caving into his curiosity, Hud flipped through her file, stopping on an editorial about his senatorial campaign viewpoints. Mina had written a fair assessment, in the margin as well as underlining a passage claiming Hudson was passionate but too young and green for the responsibilities of office. She'd also written, admirable agenda, near the bottom. What are you doing? Mina turned her head slightly to look at him. He didn't shy from that level gaze. Trying to find out what you think of me. I believe I made that clear in your office. Her tone was uncharacteristically soft, almost as if she regretted coming at him so hard all day. Was that possible? I can still wonder about how you formed your opinion. We have no history. Mina stiffened, almost imperceptibly, then faced forward again and closed her eyes, but her eyelashes fluttered as if she was trying to peek at him from beneath them. Hud resumed his perusal of her notes. She printed off his Senate record. There was a defense bill he'd voted for that she'd written a mistake next to, but a medical bill he'd helped write had a good piece of work scribbled next to it. Again, Hud agreed with her. He'd voted for a defense bill he wasn't a fan of in exchange for a vote on a child care bill. Unfortunately, effective politics required negotiating to find common ground. Compromise. That's what Walter said Mina had wanted. But Mina also wanted an unveiling of sorts, allowing the public to see who Hud really was. I can compromise. Letting people in. That was another story. Give the press an inch and they'd make up a mile's worth of stories. Hud rolled his stiffening shoulders back, trying to ease the tension. The traffic moved forward. Inch by inch. A metaphor for the way he was broaching the distance between himself and Mina. Hud flipped to a clipping of his high school debate team winning the state championship. There was a small picture of him in action looking as if he could conquer the world. That was a lifetime ago. And proof that Mina had done her due diligence on him. She'd gone far back in time. There was an article on he and Samuel spending a summer volunteering to help storm relief efforts in Puerto Rico. They were pictured arm in arm near a house they'd helped reshingle. Samuel's larger than life smile caused an ache in Hud's chest. Although the devastation in Puerto Rico had been sobering, they'd enjoyed their trip. Out from under the thumb of their father, Samuel had thrived. He made friends everywhere. He didn't have his music playing in isolating earbuds all the time. Instead, he sang along with the radio, played with kids, and made jokes about his skills with a hammer. Do you think mom and dad would let me travel the world like this? Helping people, I mean, Samuel asked as they walked back to their housing one night. Nope, Hud answered without thinking. He'd been tired and dragging his feet. They'd walked in silence the rest of the way. 
when they got back to the room they shared, they called home. I want to join the Peace Corps, Samuel blurted before greetings were exchanged. I want to help people rebuild their lives after devastation. Oh, mom said into the awkward silence. That's admirable, son, dad's voice was filled with gravitas, as if he was giving a speech on the Senate floor. You're learning to embrace your duty to others, but… With dad, there was always a but. Think of how many more people you could help by making and enacting public policy. While dad went on about how much more impactful serving in elected office was, Samuel had shrank back, expression closing off. It must have been hard growing up in the public eye. Mina's finger twitched on the door handle as if she were impatient to get away from HUD. The expectations of my father were harder, HUD said absently, still thinking about his brother. I fell in line. Samuel fought the mantle. He was a rebel. At least, until he found his footing in the military. He was the relatable bad boy. A smile tugging at the corner of her mouth. HUD suspected that smile had the power to turn his world upside down. Reality was, it already had because instead of holding things in, HUD kept talking. I'm the one who suggested Samuel enlist in the army after he dropped out of college the last time. It allowed him to see the world and help others without having to worry about family expectations or legacies. I almost wish. Go on. She gently urged. HUD shrugged, setting the picture of him and his brother back in the file. That I could have had that freedom. For the first time since they'd met, Mina's gaze softened, warmed, just the way he'd expected it to when he'd taken her hand back at the office. Graham slammed on the brakes. Sorry. Jay Walker. Mina blinked at Graham and then at Hud. She turned, looking out the window. I suppose your brother found comparisons to you just as difficult as you find comparisons to him. So true. People love him, even to this day, Hudson said when he trusted himself to speak. Samuel liked making friends, but he had no interest in politics. Much to his parents' dismay. And Hud's. It would have been easier on Hud if he hadn't had to shoulder all the hopes of his father. Samuel had an interest in serving, but not the passion or composure to be a candidate, Mina said in a voice tinged with surprise, as if this was something she just realized. She was spot on in her assessment. I have the composure and passion to run, he told her. You used to, Mina corrected him, still giving Hud a view of the curls on the back of her head. And you know this by reading my file? She didn't know Hud at all. And there was nothing in her folder about Roger. Why was that? Maybe there are things that aren't in my file, details that might make you feel differently. She glanced at him, shaking her head. I've been trained to be a judge of what sells and what works in the system. It's my professional opinion, nothing more. You don't really want to run for office again. You envied Samuel his freedom. And you have second thoughts about revealing your private persona to earn public office. He had. He did. But that didn't change anything. Chapter 9 Why don't you grab a seat while I find Liam and let him know I'm here? Mina shooed Hudson toward the rows of folding chairs set up in the small auditorium that also served as the school gymnasium. She liked Samuel's brother. Hudson had heart and a sense of humor. He was personable, too. If he let the public see that side of him, he'd have a better chance of winning an election. They were nice people, the McClouds. And Samuel would have wanted them to know Liam. But I'm not ready. Despite the guilt over her secret growing exponentially today, she wasn't ready to tell the McClouds about Liam. The truth. The truth required privacy and diplomacy. Mommy. Liam stumbled as he ran to Mina backstage. You came. Of course, I came. I promised I'd be here. Mina hugged him, careful of the white face paint and black nose. Then Mina held him at arm's length and fiddled with the headband that held his black Snoopy ears in place. In his costume with makeup on, the McLeod features would be hard to recognize, thank heavens. How could I miss you playing Snoopy? Mina waved to Corey and Michael on the other side of the stage. Michael was playing Schroeder. He carried a small toy piano. With a little more searching, she found Annie and Maddie in a back corner. Maddie was playing the little red-headed girl Charlie Brown had a crush on. She wore a bright red wig. 
This is the best day ever, mommy. And after I'm done playing Snoopy, it's Friday. And that's our pizza night. Liam danced without any rhythm. Pepperoni. Pepperoni. Then he stopped dancing and looked at Mina expectantly. The Friday night pizza dance was one of their traditions, and considering she'd nearly missed out on his performance, Mina didn't dare short her child on anything else. She pumped her arms and moved her hips. Veg GIE pizza. Veg GIE pizza. Liam's lip thrust out. Gross, not mushrooms. Yum. Mina kept dancing. And green peppers. What are we doing here? Rose Cassia glided over to them. Her white hair was in a neat bun. She wasn't much taller than Mina, but unlike Mina, she had the grace of a ballerina. The elderly town councilwoman was in charge of the night's production. That's not the floss or the Snoopy dance I taught you, Liam. But I like it. And Mina, she mimicked Mina's dance moves, although she was clearly the better dancer. Kudos. Mommy wants to ruin pizza night by adding vegetables. Liam tugged Mina's arm while she continued to dance with Rose. Promise we'll do half and half. Deal. Mina stopped dancing and fiddled with his Snoopy ears again. But only if you eat salad first. Sounds fair to me. Rose glided off. Break a leg, Liam. She doesn't really mean that, Liam told Mina, an excited smile on his face. It's a stage thing. And I guess I can eat salad if you let me wear my Snoopy costume to eat. Double deal. Mina shook on it. She turned to find Hudson leaning against a wall near the stage door, smiling their way. Wow. That smile. Mina's heart pounded out a rapid beat, one that increased double time when she wondered how he'd look at her if he knew the truth about Liam. The truth would gum the works of his campaign. That was an attraction killer. Places everyone. Rose called out, shooing children toward the stage and the drawn curtain. Parents to your seats. Have fun, Liam, Mina called after him as he skipped and stumbled off. And then she faced Hudson. What are you doing back here? I felt awkward out there alone. His glance drifted toward the curtain. The noise from the chattering audience was louder now. People were staring. And this is unusual, because. I have no reason for being here. He held open the door for her. Did you notice? There are a lot of grandparents out there. Ah. Uh. Yes. She lingered backstage, wanting to prepare him for what was bound to happen. You're a celebrity. People know your face. But Mina was determined that they wouldn't associate Liam's face with Hud's. Not that you being famous would stop them from staring or striking up a conversation. About whatever struck their fancy. Them? He peeked at the audience. The elderly population here takes an active role in everything. They're the largest demographic group in town because they stayed when jobs dried up and families left. Long-term residents are used to speaking their minds. She pulled him back into the shadows. Only recently have businesses returned to town and jobs been filled by younger people, like me. Hudson smiled at Mina, which caused only a mild case of butterflies this time. Interesting social experiment. Every community has its quirks. Don't say I didn't warn you. Mina walked into the main auditorium, spotted her grandmother, and hurried to sit beside her, introducing Hudson only by his first name. You look awful familiar to me. Grandma Beam squinted at him. Darn fluorescent lights. Have we met before, Hudson? No. And call me Hud. He nodded toward Mina. You, too. She'd heard others call him Hud, but that had seemed too intimate. It was a nice, approachable name. He should use it on his campaign posters. Not that she needed to make note of that idea. Mina waved to Annie and Corey as they took their seats a few rows closer to the stage. They stared at her curiously before leaning close to whisper to each other. Oh, there'd be questions from her friends to be answered later about the man beside her. Excuse me. Mayor Larry edged his way through the aisle and took a seat next to Hud. The elderly politician was reed thin, had a long gray ponytail and wore a purple and white tie-dyed hoodie tonight. He had his sights on Hud as he introduced himself. Are you Hudson McLeod? 
Hud nodded, shaking the mayor's hand. You can call me Mayor Larry. The old man pumped Hud's hand nonstop, speaking enthusiastically. It's a pleasure to meet you. I love your mother. Most people do, Hud acknowledged, extricating his hand. Are you here to watch someone performing tonight? No. I'm just like you. Out here with my constituents, available to listen to their concerns, and meet one of his idols, Grandma Beam said with a chuckle. That's why you look familiar, Hud. You're famous. She tapped Mina's leg. Was he your meeting today? Mina nodded, hoping the show would start soon to cut off any further questions or speculation. And you brought him home. Grandma Beam waggled her gray eyebrows. There's a first time for everything. Mina shushed her. I'd love to talk shop, Hud. The mayor beamed. Holy moly, Larry. Grandma Beam leaned forward and shook her finger at the mayor. You can't talk once the curtain goes up or I'm going to have Hud escort you out. Hud grinned. He looked completely up for the task. With a subtle head shake, Mina hoped Hud understood that school bouncer was not a role any political candidate should take on. But Hud kept grinning, delivering more of that wow, feeling when he whispered in her ear, social experiments aren't all bad. The mayor is harmless. You haven't seen anything yet, she whispered back. Hud, is that what we call you? Mayor Larry kept right on talking. Oh, we're going to get along just fine. And then he launched into his resume of never having lost an election. Mildred pushed her walker down the aisle behind them, hitting every chair she passed. She was channeling Mrs. Claus today, what with her red slacks, red sweater, and her rosy-cheeked smile. I'm sitting here, Agnes? Yes, Mildred. Perfect. Agnes, the elderly sprite who followed her, plopped into a chair and tapped Hud on the shoulder. Excuse me. Are you the gentleman who drives the Ferrari that's parked outside? Hud half-turned. Yes. Is it in someone's way? Oh, no. Nothing like that, Agnes was quick to clear that up, ignoring Mayor Larry trying to wave her away as if Hud was his and he wasn't going to share. Social experiment or not. After this play is over, I'm going to owe Hud an apology. Hud was political royalty and used to the overly familiar way everyone in Harmony Valley treated everyone else. They were invading his space. And Mina knew all too well that the man liked his privacy. Like me. It's just that Mildred used to race cars, Agnes continued sweetly. And even though she's legally blind. He didn't need to know that, Mildred grumbled, looking less Mrs. Claus-like. She recognized your car as a Ferrari. While I, Agnes smiled and shrugged. I thought it was a Corvette. Hud gasped dramatically, placing a hand over his heart. The horror. Despite the onslaught of the elderly, Mina laughed, adding charisma to the list of characteristics Hud hid from the world. That was my exact same reaction to Agnes, Mildred told Hud, smiling like Mrs. Claus, once more. The horror of mistaking a Ferrari for a Corvette. Hud laughed, a big, bold sound that had heads turning in the audience, including Mina's friends. But his laughter also invited folks to join in, the way Samuel's laughter had. Mina was surprised to find she was laughing, too. How, unexpected after their contentious first meeting. He'd make a great uncle for Liam and a great mayor of San Francisco. I could get this man elected president. Excitement blossomed in Mina's chest like a night sky firework. And then just as quickly, the thrill faded. Reality intruded. Mina had a little boy to protect. She could never work for HUD. The object of her thoughts laughed at something else Mildred said, turning that gem of a smile Mina's way. Wow, 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 wow. Mina's mind went blank, short-circuited by the abundance of wow. She inched closer to Grandma Beam, needing space and perspective. The school principal stepped out from behind the curtain, promising a reprieve from Hud's magnetism, but then almost immediately darted back behind the curtain again. Agnes. Mayor Larry made a cutting gesture across his throat. You're on the town council. You don't want to waste time talking about cars with Hudson McLeod, not when he's here to help us. Hud stilled, casting a quick glance at Mina, who shrugged. She had no idea what the mayor was referring to. We applied for a federal grant to update our floodwater protection. 
Mayor Larry laid a hand on Hud's shoulder. The river overflowed recently after we had several inches of rain. It cut us off from the main roads into and out of town. And when someone needed emergency care, he had to be airlifted, Agnes added. I'm not a senator anymore, Hud said in a well-modulated voice, as if he'd had to say the words often since he'd stepped down. And then he told the mayor which agency he should contact to help him with the process. Sorry about that, Mina whispered to him as the principal took the stage once more, this time to open the show. No worries, Hud whispered back, mischief in his whiskey-colored eyes. You can repay me with a pizza dinner. It felt natural to tease back. To roll her eyes and smile. One thing you don't know about pizza night is that you have to dance for your supper. I'm up to any challenge you toss my way. He grinned. Wow. Mina liked him. A lot. Even worse, she wanted to work for him. But she was going to let both those possibilities pass her by. And then just as quickly, the thrill faded. Reality intruded. Mina had a little boy to protect. She could never work for HUD. The object of her thoughts laughed at something else Mildred said, turning that gem of a smile. Chapter 10 The school performance was cute. Liam, as Snoopy, stole the show. By the time it was over, Hud was starving, more than ready to dance for his supper since he'd skipped lunch. But food wasn't presenting itself quickly enough. After the applause, folks didn't clear out. At least, not the elderly ones. They gathered round Hud, eager to meet the McLeod in their midst. Mostly, they wanted to shake his hand and tell him how much they loved his mother, which was by no means unusual. Finally, Mina worked her way to his side, carrying Liam, still in Snoopy costume and makeup, on her hip. Hey, folks. Hud needs to drive back to San Francisco. We need to say goodnight and let him go. He can't drive home in this downpour, the old woman who was legally blind said from her seat on her walker. Can't you hear the rain? The crowd quieted, allowing the pounding rain to be heard. That's right. Mayor Larry nodded profusely. There are flood warnings. We told you what happened last spring. Wouldn't want that fancy car to sink in river water, Agnes added. That would mean he'd have to spend the night at the Lambridge bed and breakfast, someone said. The announcement was met with overwhelming silence. Hud glanced at Mina and caught a fleeting expression of horror. Hard pass. Well, if the road conditions are as bad as you say, I suppose I could sleep on Cherie's and Mina's couch, Hud said carefully. Mina's eyes widened and her mouth opened, no doubt to reject that idea. We'd be honored, her grandmother told him, beating Mina to the punch. Her short gray hair was combed over and almost covered one eye. Will you look at that, Agnes said to no one in particular. Mina snagged a big fish. Don't make it that easy for him, Mina, Mildred advised. That's right. The elderly woman he'd seen dance with Mina backstage did a little tap dance. Make sure you have time to get to know him first. Slow down, people. Mina rolled her eyes, setting Liam on the floor. If Hud was anything to me, he'd be a client, one who was kind enough to drive me home when I had a flat tire. A friend, of sorts, Hud corrected, fully intending their relationship to improve until the point where Mina agreed to work for him. Now that sleeping arrangements have been made, it's on to dinner. Folks didn't have to be told twice. People began departing into the storm. A few said they were meeting at Giordano's for pizza. Mommy, I'm hungry. Liam looked tired. Is it pizza night or not? It's pizza night, Hud said firmly, famished. Let's go. Liam gasped, drawing himself up. Are you trying to invite yourself to dinner, mister? Cause my mom says you need to wait to be asked. The kid was well-spoken for a kindergartner. He frowned at Hud's faux pas. Besides, you have to dance for pizza. Right, mommy? Right. Some of the sparkle had returned to Mina's dark eyes. Everyone dances for pizza. And then she smiled. It wasn't the smile of a political aide. Nor was it the cool smile of a woman who rejected his candidacy. No. This was a smile loaded with mischief. And the lips that formed that smile? They were incredibly shaped, kissable lips. 
And just thinking about kissing Mina had Hud smiling with what felt like his entire being. He's not joining us for dinner. Hud would never dance for us. Mina had made up her mind. Never say never. Hud handed Mina his raincoat, adjusted the lay of his jacket lapels, and then leaned over, swinging his arms while he shuffled toward the door. How's this? What is that? Liam squealed, running after Hud. That's not dancing. Hud stopped and turned, trying to appear offended. That was the gritty. Haven't you ever seen a football player do the gritty after a touchdown? Liam shook his head, sending his black snoopy ears wagging. We watch soccer. Mommy says that's true football. He opened the door, staring at the pouring rain. They don't dance in soccer. When they score, they slide on their knees. True football, Hud murmured, looking at Mina. My brother used to say that about soccer after he got stationed overseas. Mina was coming up the aisle, walking at the slow pace of her grandmother, speaking in low tones. Her gaze met his, and she smiled softly. I could stay the weekend and get to know her better. If Hud had a change of decent clothes, he would. All he had was his gym bag in the Ferrari's trunk. He kept staring into Mina's eyes as she and her grandmother slowly closed the distance between them. At the same time, a multitude of feelings were gathering in Hud's chest. The spark of attraction. The intrigue of Mina's layered personality. The growing impression that she could be trusted. That he could open himself up to her. Careful now. His guard came up. A reflex that had been pounded into him by his father. His old man had believed it took years to earn a trusted place in the McLeod inner circle. But Mina. Hud tried to puzzle out his feelings for Mina, their strength and source. If he approached their chemistry logically, maybe he'd be able to navigate to a place on the professional spectrum. He let his gaze travel over Mina slowly. There was that black mane of thick, curly hair. And the dark brown eyes that were the key to her soul. But Hud saw more than that. He saw her intelligence, wry sense of humor, and honesty, plus her obvious love for her family. And how could he forget the contradiction of a woman who wore expensive shoes but ran barefoot in the rain to protect them? In a sea of women, Mina DeWitt is unique. But he wanted Mina more for his campaign than as a date or a girlfriend. And so instead of grinning like a fool at Mina, he smiled at her grandmother. Cherise, did you drive here? I did. I won't be joining you for dinner since I'm on a diet. The old woman lowered her head and fluffed her tumble of gray bangs over her face as if wanting to hide her true feelings about the D-word. I suppose you'll be wanting a lift to Giordano's, seeing as how your fancy sports car probably doesn't have a back seat. Very astute, Cherise. Hud turned on the charm. I see where Mina gets her intelligence. I wish I had my rain boots. Liam splashed his Spider-Man sneaker in a puddle near the door, getting the cuff of his white pants with black spots wet. Hud held out his hand. Cherise, if you give me your keys, I'll bring the car to the door. Liam took Hud's other hand, black snoopy ears fluttering in the wind. I'll go with you because that's what a man does. You just want to splash in the puddles, Mina said, smiling as she slipped out of her expensive shoes and tucked them inside her grandmother's large purse. Oh, mommy. Liam teased Mina. Then he swung an adoring gaze Hud's way. Do you like to splash in puddles, mister? Come on, Hud. Samuel hopped in rain puddles. His yellow slicker hood was down. His blue rain boots were splattered with mud. Samuel didn't care. He hopped up and down as if riding a pogo stick. And then he lost his balance and fell on his backside where he laughed and laughed until Hud pulled him up. And then he only laughed harder. But so did I. Hud bent down until his face was even with Liam's. I love splashing in rain puddles. And with that simple statement, a pact was made between them. A silent pact. One that would probably do damage to fine Italian leather. But Hud didn't care. He was going to splash in every rain puddle between the door and the car, just the way Samuel would have done. All right, boys. Time to put your jackets on. Mina gave Hud his raincoat and then helped Liam put his on. Wait. I lost Snoopy's tail. Liam ran back to the stage, followed at a slower pace by a barefoot Mina. 
Your mother would be proud, Cherise told Hud when Mina was out of earshot. And my granddaughter is impressed. Good. Hud had been watching the pair go. He drew his attention back to the older woman. I need Mina to run my campaign for mayor of San Francisco. Cherise laughed. Young man, that wasn't the kind of impression you made. Her breath caught when your eyes met after that dance you did. I hope you're single because she hasn't dated since Liam's father. Really? Hud reminded himself of his goals, of duty to family, community, and country. If you ask her, I'm just someone she's considering representing. What a waste of time. It's like saying you'd be satisfied being friends. Life is too short. Your generation has it all wrong. Cherise shook her head. All wrong. Tell us everything. Jill dragged Mina to a seat next to her in Giordano's while Hud was greeted at the door. Then Jill sent her son Teddy to refill her water glass before continuing in a hushed voice, we ordered you pizza, half veggie, half pepperoni, in exchange for all the juicy gossip about Hudson McLeod. And be quick about it. Annie had sent her daughter Maddie on a mission to refill her diet soda. Then she placed a slice of pizza loaded with vegetables on a plate and handed it to Mina. Corey can't hold him there forever. Corey can't, Mina glanced toward the door. Oh. Talking excitedly, Corey kept stepping into Hud's path every time he took a step Mina's way, dragging her son Michael along with her. Liam stood next to Michael. He decided to worship Hud after getting soaked together in the school parking lot. Liam bounced up and down, twirling his black Snoopy tail as if it was a noisemaker. A few of the others who'd moved to greet Hud smiled indulgently at Liam while waiting their turn to take a photo with Hud, which, thankfully, didn't include a side-by-side -side shot with Liam, whose Snoopy makeup was wearing thin. And speaking of wearing thin, Hud's smile was looking worn at the edges. Mina almost took pity on him. Almost. Not only had Hud invited himself to dinner, he'd invited himself to spend the night at her house. Hey. Earth to Mina. What took you so long to get here? Why is he here? Why didn't you warn us a celebrity was coming to town? Jill asked in rapid-fire style. A text message would have been kind. I would have put on makeup. He's single, right? He's gorgeous. And have you seen the way he looks at you? Annie asked just as urgently. We've seen the way you look at him. And he makes you laugh. Humor is important in a relationship. Is he staying the weekend? Going to any harvest festival activities? Jill demanded, slowing the inquisition. I wouldn't mind getting lost in a corn maze with him. Annie gasped. Is he coming to Maddie's birthday party? How to answer? What to answer? Mina's brain was on overload. You're acting like my grandmother and her meddling friends. Annie and Jill laughed, shaking their heads while Hud kept inching closer. Jill sobered. If you aren't comfortable with Mr. Hot and Famous, say the word and I'll get rid of him. Her change of heart was surprising. Even Annie looked at Jill as if she'd suddenly lost her mind. I. Uh. I'm fine but the reality of the situation was sinking in. Hudson McLeod was going to spend the next 12 hours in Harmony Valley. How was Mina going to keep Liam's identity a secret? An hour later, Mina still had no answer. With so much attention focused on Hud at Giordano's, she and Hud had little time to talk about his campaign aspirations and Hud had little time to focus on Liam. Mina would take the small wins and be thankful. But now, her darling baby boy was in the bathtub scrubbing the makeup off his face and Hud was settling into Liam's room for the night. She'd insisted Hud have a proper bed. No way was she going to let a McLeod sleep on Grandma Beam's lumpy couch. But the task of hiding Liam's face from his uncle remained. Mommy, why can't I have a little brother? Everyone else has one. Pushing a plastic boat around the tub, Liam blinked in faux innocence at Mina, as if it was the first time he'd asked. The familiar question was loaded with pitfalls, so Mina set aside thoughts of HUD, confessions, and guilt aside and gave Liam her standard reply. First off, not everyone has a little brother. There's Teddy, Maddie, and Michael for starters. Not to mention, I don't have any siblings. You don't count. Liam was quite good at pouting. 
his duck-lipped expression was adorable. Second, you need a daddy around to get a little brother. I'm afraid it's just you and me. She told Liam his daddy had gone to heaven. Thankfully, he hadn't asked many questions about Samuel. Mina dreaded the day she had to explain who Liam's father was. Some kids at school have two daddies, two mommies, two houses, and two dogs. Liam took a plastic chess piece and stuck it on top of the plastic boat. You're not too old to find another daddy, are you? 29 isn't old. Not even in dog years. But I'm too busy to find you a second daddy. You'll just have to make do with me and Grandma Beam. Mina had been sitting on her knees on the bathroom rug, but her joints were getting stiff. She stood, bumping into two plant stands with tumbling, ivy leaves. The bathroom was just like the rest of the house. Every flat surface, ceiling, and spare floor space was filled with planters. Purple and pink African violets grew in pots on the window sill. A philodendron was suspended in a jute, macrame hanger above the toilet tank. Succulents crowded the counter on either side of the sink. If I think the plant life in the house is excessive, what does HUD think? But mommy, Liam pushed the plastic boat around the tub, not willing to give up on his requests just yet. I don't have anyone to play with in the house. If I can't have a brother, can I at least have a puppy? Mina bit back a smile. Oh, so it's a choice between a puppy or a little brother? Or a chicken? Come on, mommy. I'm bored all the time. Liam pushed the boat around in a circle, creating waves, and you're always working. He wasn't bored all the time. He was dramatic all the time. But it was a mischievous kind of drama, not the whiny kind. Mina wondered if Samuel had been like this when he was a kid. It would be nice to be able to ask his family. Something bumped against the wall. Hud must already be getting into Liam's bed. Thank you for letting Hud sleep in your room tonight. Mina shook out Liam's Star Wars terry cloth bathrobe, the one that was too big and had a hood. Liam enjoyed walking around with it half covering his face. It's time to dry off before you shrivel into a raisin. Do you think Hud likes chess? Liam got out of the tub, clutching the plastic chess piece in one hand. I don't know. But it's too late tonight to play. And the last thing Mina wanted was for Hud to sit across from her son and stare at his face. Hey, where'd your suit go? Liam stood in the doorway of his bedroom, wearing dinosaur-themed pajamas and a brown, hooded bathrobe with a Star Wars logo on the breast pocket. He was a tall, gangly kid for a five-year-old and the robe had obviously been purchased for its length, not its fit. He didn't fill it out. The hood hung over his head, hiding most of his face. Those aren't my clothes you're wearing, hud. Or mommy's. Or grandma beams. I had a bag of clothes in my car. Hud wore a pair of black basketball shorts and an orange San Francisco Giants t-shirt. He'd driven Cherise's car back to the school after dinner to retrieve them. His business suit and wet loafers were on top of his gym bag. I bumped into your chessboard while you were in the tub. Sorry about that. I think you were mid-game. But the pieces fell, and I didn't know where to put them, so I placed them in their starting positions. I can't seem to find the Black Knight. You set up the game? The kid came forward, staring at the chessboard. There was something about the boy that felt familiar. But the impression quickly faded. I had the missing piece in the bathtub. Liam placed the Black Knight in its spot. Do you know how to play? Hud nodded. Do you? I love chess. Liam bent over the chessboard, adjusting the placement of pieces. Are you someone's daddy? I'm not anyone's daddy. Where's your daddy? Mina didn't wear a ring. He died. The words were uttered in such an emotionless tone that Hud assumed Liam had never known his father. Poor kid. Tell you what. Hud sat on the twin bed, coming down to the boy's level. Tomorrow morning, I'll play a game of chess with you. I haven't played in a long time, but it was one of my favorite games as a kid. Liam gasped, turning to face Hud squarely, although the hood hovered over the tip of his nose. Not checkers? That's what the old people play at Martin's. They say I should like checkers, but I don't. Chess. Hud chuckled, thinking of Samuel and his skill for the game. I played chess. 
Liam laid his hands on Hud's shoulders. Can we play tomorrow morning at Martin's? They have hot chocolate and cookies. Hud nodded, amused by the boy. Hot chocolate and cookies it is. Liam flashed a mischievous smile, so like his mother's that Hud couldn't help but smile back. I think I could beat you in less than ten moves, the kid said. You could probably beat me in five. Hud chuckled. I haven't played in a long time. In that case, after we play, old man Takata will challenge you to a checkers match. Maybe that's more your speed. Liam grabbed a well-worn teddy bear from his bed. Old people like easy games. Old? Who said I'm old? Instead of answering, Liam ran out and shut the door behind him. Coffee? At this hour? This is my second shift. Mina glanced up at Hud, who was bending to walk beneath a philodendron that trailed from a high kitchen shelf. I'm writing a speech and it's just not coming together the way I want it to. She sat at the kitchen table with her laptop and a mug of coffee. Sorry about all the plants. It's my grandmother's passion. Mina gestured to the wall behind her. Over twenty glass beakers were filled with water and held cuttings of all different kinds of plants, their roots visible in the water. It was cool, but Mina feared Liam or one of his friends would break a beaker. We don't mess with her plants without permission, Mina continued. Liam enjoys taking these out and examining the root system up close, much to Grandma Beam's glee. She thinks he's a botanist in the making. Whatever he is, he's a good kid. Hud sat down next to her, a big presence in the small, outdated room. Smart. Curious. Creative. Since we met, he hasn't thrown himself on the ground in a screaming fit or picked his nose and flung it at someone. Not once. By those standards, I'm doing great. Flattered by his praise, she closed her laptop. Do you need anything? Water? Tea? Energy bar? A chocolate chip cookie? Grandma Beam always has baked goods on hand. Despite her proclaiming that she was on a diet. What I need is you on my team, Hud said evenly, his handsome demeanor returning to its San Francisco polish. I've spent all week looking critically at the situation in the city. I have several ideas. Before you go any further, let's go back to the two obstacles you'll need to overcome, the allegations behind your resignation from the Senate, Anne. If you insist on telling me that I have no personality after the day we've had, I may have to call in character witnesses. He tapped his chest. I did the gritty. I worked the crowd at school auditorium and the pizza parlor. Mina frowned. You did that to impress me? No, his brow furrowed. I did it because they were nice and respectful. And they wanted to tell you how much they love your mother. Mina couldn't contain a smile. She's your secret weapon. Not me. Hud let his hand drift to the tabletop. I'd prefer not to bring her into this. That was considerate of him. And honorable. Mina covered Hud's hand with hers and withdrew it almost immediately because, wow. In the public's mind, you've become this icon of wealth and power. You're a wealthy man who drives fast cars and dates women who buy designer clothes. I buy designer clothes. To avoid his gaze, she went to the refrigerator and added more cream to her coffee, needing some sweet comfort to ground her. You lock yourself away in a tower, don't grant interviews, and don't admit to missteps or misfortunes. She sat down next to him. Of course, the voters can't identify with you. I couldn't. Not until you let your guard down. Hud's handsome features looked carved from ice. So, you think Roger Bartholomew is a better choice? Not in a million years. Hud sat back in his chair, expression thawing. There's hope for us working together then. He studied her expression. Or not. All traces of a smile vanished. Why? Isn't what I said in the city enough? Or the fact that we barely get along? You've been in my face all day. And let me tell you, that was quite a surprise. Mina laughed softly. I had no idea that you were so, magnetic. Determined? Driven? Polarizing. Mina looked at him levelly, searching for the right words, the right tone, a political consultant's tone. You spent half your day annoying me and the other half just being yourself. Which is witty and charming. 
He gave her a smile that felt so genuine with a look that felt so personal that Mina had to grab hold of the table to ground herself. Admit it, Mina. You like me, don't you? Yes, but I will admit no such thing. Just because my personal opinion of you has changed, doesn't mean my professional opinion has changed. You won't like to hear this, but if you let the world know you were more like your brother, your campaign would have a better chance for success. He jerked his body around to face her, no longer relaxed. That's at least the second time you've mentioned my brother, if not the third. Did you know Samuel? Chapter 11 Did you know Samuel? The air left her lungs in a whoosh. Hud's demanding stare bored into Mina, searching for answers. Answers she wasn't ready to give, even if she had enough air in her lungs to give them. With a tilt of his head, his cleft chin thrust at a determined angle, and his shrewd whiskey-colored eyes taking in every little breath she made, Mina had to choose her words carefully. To lie carefully. You dated him, Hud blurted in a shocked, disappointed voice. How did? And he broke your heart. Hud's eyes narrowed. Is that why you don't want to work with me? That's not. Do you know how many women dated him? Hud closed his eyes briefly, and when he opened them he seemed calmer, although his tone was still cold. Do you? Lots, she murmured. All kinds of women approached me in the year after Samuel's death. Hud stared at the refrigerator, which was covered with Liam's artwork. They wanted to connect over the fact that they'd dated him. They'd go on and on about how easy it was to be with him. How quickly they'd developed feelings for him. He stopped, drawing a deep breath. And Mina did the same. What he'd described hit a little too close to home. Samuel, aren't we rushing things? Even back then, Mina had doubts, couching her feelings for him with the term, fascinated rather than a love. On some level, I knew they were grieving. Hud dragged a hand through his dark hair. It fell right back into place. I knew they needed their feelings validated. But I was grieving, too. And so, I wasn't very nice to them. But it's too late to apologize. Had she thought Hud unfeeling? Mina clasped his hand. I'm sure they understood. She certainly did. Hud stared at Mina, but it felt as if he wasn't seeing her, that he was looking into the past. I'm surprised more women don't contact us claiming to be raising my niece or nephew. More women? How many have come forward? If there had ever been a time in Mina's life that she'd wanted to faint, it was now. Hud's face swam out of focus. She clung to him. She clung to him for all the wrong reasons. And Hud offered her comfort, lacing his fingers with hers. A few showed up in the year after Samuel's death. There were DNA tests and private investigations. But no one told the truth, and our lawyers kept it quiet. Is that how Hud would have treated Mina if she'd come forward years ago, claiming that Liam was Samuel's child? I was right to keep him a secret. She couldn't have taken that kind of suspicion and scrutiny back then. She'd been questioning everything from her attachment to Samuel to her decision to keep Liam. Single parenthood wasn't for the faint of heart. But she had no regrets. The world came into focus. Hud came into focus. His furrowed brow. His troubled frown. His need for answers. I'm sorry, Mina said in a voice barely above a whisper. Samuel wouldn't have wished that on you. He wouldn't have wanted to cause his family any upset. But he would have wanted them to know his son. The pressure to do the right thing for Samuel Ward with her fierce protectiveness of Liam. Thoughts raced through her head. She wanted to walk away. She wanted to tell Hud the conversation was over. But if she ran or became too touchy, he'd wonder why. It was imperative that Mina stay calm and choose her next words with care. What would you have done if Samuel had a child? Hud's gaze came into focus on Mina's face. But instead of answering, he had a question of his own. What was Samuel to you? Someone you had a few dates with? Or was he something, more? His brother had been many things to her. A fast friend. One of her most life-defining relationships. And yet as the years passed, she realized their insta-attraction had been based on a leap of faith, on the hope that she was wrong about love, on a physical and emotional connection she'd assumed they'd have time to explore. 
Mina wouldn't know how to explain any of that to HUD in a way that didn't draw attention to Liam. And although the day had created the urge to tell the truth to the McClouds, she wasn't sure it was in Liam's best interest to reveal the extent of her relationship with Samuel tonight. Yes, we dated, Mina admitted quietly. Yes, I cared for him, the way you do when a relationship is new. But our time together was too brief and I, I don't believe in love. Hud's eyes widened at this last confession and his lips parted, as if he was ready to challenge her belief. She was having none of that. It was past time to shift back into professional territory. But when I say you should be more like Samuel, I mean you should be more yourself, the way you've been since you came to Harmony Valley. Hud's scrutiny was intense. You deftly changed the subject from Samuel to me. She'd hoped he wouldn't notice. I was honest about the extent of my feelings for him to you. And the next time someone asks you why you stepped down from the Senate, maybe you should be honest about your feelings, too. How it destroyed your ability to trust and made you want to be more hands-on in every endeavor you take. Hud stared at the refrigerator once more. When he finally spoke, his voice had a raw, defeated quality to it that she hadn't heard all day. I didn't mean to make Samuel sound like a gigolo. He lifted his gaze to hers. The intensity was gone but hurt lingered at the corners of his eyes. Hurt tinged with grief. Talking about my brother is still hard for me. And whenever things get hard, I tend to come across as cold and uncaring. It was a huge concession for HUD, but Mina knew he had to open up even more to win over the public and to win an election. And she wasn't sure he could do it. Chapter 12 It's still your move. Little Liam scratched his head as he studied the chessboard on Saturday morning in Martin's Bakery. He dressed in his Halloween costume this morning, a ninja all in black, including a hood and a mask over his eyes. You haven't played in a long time, have you, Hud? Nope. Hud sipped his coffee. He'd spent a restless night sleeping on Liam's twin bed, wrestling with two unwelcome facts, Mina had known Samuel, and Mina didn't believe in love. He hadn't expected Mina to have dated Samuel. He was curious about their relationship, however brief it was but Mina had drawn a line in the sand on the topic. And frankly, he was more than happy not to talk about her and Samuel. He'd rather expend his energy with Mina smoothing out their relationship than poking holes at it. He continued to believe that if he could win her over, she'd change her mind about managing his campaign. As for the other thought that had kept him tossing and turning in bed last night, Hud shouldn't have cared about Mina's opinion regarding love. She could believe what she wanted to believe. He'd learned over the years that love meant different things to different people. He'd seen clingy marriages, marriages of convenience, and open marriages. And then there was love in his own life. He'd loved his father, but it had been a respectful kind of love. He'd loved his brother, but it had been an immature kind of love formed when he was more self-centered, trying to scrabble his way to his place in the world. Now, he mourned how surface level that love had been. Mina doesn't believe in love. Hud snuck a glance at her, feeling again that tug of attraction, that certainty deep inside that Mina could be someone important to him. He thought he was in love a time or two, but the feeling had always faded as time went on. Granted, he never dated more than a few weeks, a few months, tops. His mother had told him that he didn't give love a chance. But he did. He just never looked at a woman and felt this way, like she could make life more meaningful. Why did he have to feel this way with this woman? Hud heaved a sigh, swinging his gaze back to the chess board. But he was still unable to concentrate on the game. Mina had dated Samuel. What had she seen in his brother that she didn't see in Hud? All the unresolved feelings he had about his brother had been reawakened. They'd been best friends when they were young. Then competitors for their father's affection when Hud started laying the groundwork for a political career in college. It was only after Dad died and Samuel entered the military that their journey back to closeness had begun. If only we'd had more time. Then Hud wouldn't feel as if things between them had been left unsaid. I'm not going to date a senator's daughter. Seventeen-year-old Samuel had raised his voice at the family's Washington, D.C., dinner table. I'm your son, not a political asset, like Hud. You're a liability, Hud snapped back, earning Mom's protests. Anytime someone says the phrase, damage control, it's in reference to you. Hud ran a hand around the back of his neck. I didn't mean it. 
HUD had been under too much pressure back then. And Samuel had often made an easy target upon which to vent his frustration. HUD glanced around the bakery, not even pretending to contemplate his next chess move. Martin's bakery was quaint as bakeries went. Faded, framed photographs on the wall implied multiple generations of bakers had toiled here. The floors were scuffed and looked original. The tables and chairs were wooden and mismatched. But the bakery case was full of confections and the fancy coffee machine behind the counter was being put to good use. He and Liam had an audience, of course. Many of the people he'd met last night were here for coffee, the mayor, in a yellow tie-dyed hoodie, Agnes, who helped Mildred and her walker get around, Rose, who flitted about the bakery singing snatches of songs from last night's performance. And so many more aging residents. Mina had shooed the patrons away after they'd had a chance to greet Hud and repeat their devotion for his mother. Mina sat at a nearby table, talking to the woman behind the bakery counter about a speech she was writing, asking for her input and picking at a cinnamon bun. Mina's coffee was supersized, not surprising given the shadows under her eyes. Had she been upset by their talk of Samuel, too? Or had the late intake of caffeine kept her from sleeping soundly? Do you want me to let you win? Liam asked, all fidgety, innocent glee. He twined his fingers in the tie ends of his black ninja mask. You're not much of a challenge. I'm gonna beat you. Hud's hand hovered over the board as he considered which piece to choose. My father used to say that a win isn't worth much if you didn't have to work to earn it. You sound like mommy. Liam returned his attention to the game. Your move. Hud sighed and moved his queen out on the board. He'd already advanced a couple of pawns and a knight. Five moves in and Hud hadn't lost anything yet. Go, me. You don't think far enough ahead, Liam noted, inching a pawn forward. I'm not afraid to put my power pieces into play. Hud sent his bishop out to take Liam's pawn. Strategy wins games, not how many pieces you have on the board. Liam took Hud's bishop with his knight. Check. Hud hadn't seen that coming. Was he going to be defeated in ten moves like the kid had told him last night? How old are you? I'm five. I told you that already. Liam sked. Old people are so forgetful. Hud chose to ignore that remark. At five, I was playing soccer and t-ball. He hadn't started playing chess until he was eight. Of course, Samuel had been six and he often beat Hud. I play sports. Liam shrugged before bringing out his troublemaking grin. But I like chess better. Your move. Later, after Liam had beaten Hud twice, Hud admitted defeat and told old man Takata that he wasn't up to being beaten in checkers, too. The little boy who'd played Schroeder last night dashed inside the bakery followed by his mother, a tall, willowy blonde. The kid spotted Liam and waved excitedly. Hud tried to remember their names, and failed. He shouldn't have. The kid's mother had fangirled him last night at the pizza parlor, blocking his way in. If that's what campaigning would be like nowadays, Hud wasn't sure he was up for it. Michael. Liam went to greet his friend before darting back to Mina's side, stumbling, righting himself, and then gesturing toward Hud. I like him, mommy. We're not keeping him, Mina said, making Hud laugh. Liam pouted. But. Mina sighed. He's mommy's work friend. A part of Hud wanted her to describe him differently. As her client. As her. Don't finish that sentence. Hud's thoughts toward Mina were as clouded as his sense of purpose toward public service this morning. He needed perspective. And Mina, as a political consultant, could give that to him. If he told her everything that happened two years ago. She'd have an opinion about what he should do. But he suspected it was the same opinion she'd already voiced, come clean about the past. No matter the cost to his pride or his political legacy. His gut clenched. A petite blonde with short, flyaway hair entered the bakery, followed by a little blonde girl in a bright pink dress. Hud had been introduced to them, too. Their names also escaped him. Liam. The little girl rushed over to the chess-playing ninja. She frowned. We said we weren't wearing our Halloween costumes until Halloween. We're three ninjas. You, me, and Michael. Three. Not one. Liam shrugged. 
My mom said it was okay, Maddie. The little girl stomped her pink sneakered foot. If we get married someday, you have to keep your promises. The elderly peanut gallery erupted in laughter. Maddie, stop the wedding talk and come pick out a pastry, her mother called. The little girl stomped over to join her mother. I don't like it when she talks about weddings, Liam muttered. Me either. But Hud was grinning, too. Michael trotted up to their table and whispered in Liam's ear. Liam perked up. Mommy, when can we go to the corn maze? Mina glanced up from the printed speech she'd been reviewing, taking in her surroundings. I don't see Jill and Teddy. And everyone has to finish their food and coffee first. I haven't been to a corn maze in years. Hud leaned across the aisle and reached for Mina's printed work. May I? Mina stared at him suspiciously. Read my speech or go with us to the corn maze? Hud smiled his most trustworthy smile. Both. Spill it, Mina. Jill held Mina back from starting the corn maze with the kids. Her brown hair was pulled up and in a ponytail threaded through the back of a pink baseball cap. It swung back and forth as she looked from Mina to Hud, who'd been waylaid by the mayor and town council. What's the reason Hud hasn't left town? I'm not sure. He'd had coffee and breakfast. He'd fulfilled his promise to Liam to play chess. He'd reviewed the speech Mina was having trouble with, told her it wasn't hitting the mark, and made some good suggestions. Without thinking, she told him she wasn't going to work for him. And yet, he hadn't been deterred. He'd somehow managed to join them at the corn maze. The man either couldn't take no for an answer or. He was interested in a non-professional relationship. Mina rolled her eyes. Professional. She'd meant a professional relationship. But despite correcting herself, Mina recalled the electricity of his touch and felt her pulse quicken in response to the memory. She became annoyed with Hud all over again. I should tell him to leave. Heavens, no. Annie took hold of Mina's arms, giving her a friendly shake. The ends of her short blonde hair lifted in the warm, fall breeze. He likes you, Mina. You always come up with a good excuse not to date. But just look at him. Do you really want to say, thank you, next? You mean thank you, none. Mina doesn't date. But she should date this one. He's a hunk a lunk. Corey nodded. And yes. That's the scientific name for a drop dead gorgeous man you must date. Mina sighed. She and her friends stood at the map to the corn maze. The kids clustered at the entrance several feet away, talking excitedly. The corn was seven or eight feet tall. The green stalks thick and leafy, rustling softly in the breeze. It would have been perfect except the ground was muddy after the storm yesterday. It would have been perfect if Hud was gone. He caught her eye, smiling apologetically, and her wish that he was gone evaporated. He could be nice. And in a t-shirt and basketball shorts, he was a different kind of attractive, an approachable kind of attractive. Liam giggled. The corn stalks swayed in the breeze. And Mina realized she was letting her fascination with Hud take too strong a hold over her. I'm not going to be that girl again. The one who let a pounding heart lower her guard. I choose to be single, Mina said quietly, almost like she would an affirmation. Her friends laughed, making Mina's cheeks heat. She closed her eyes, lifting her face to the late morning sun and repeated softly, I choose to be single. Mom, can we go now? Teddy asked Jill. He towered above the younger kids, even Liam. Jill gave him the wait a minute sign before turning back to Mina. If you like Hud, live a little, Mina. So we can live vicariously through you. Annie chuckled. Mina rolled her eyes. You can live a little and still be single, Corey said. Mommy? That was Liam, pointing into the entrance of the corn maze, as if to say, let's go. The maze was on the Jackson family farm in Harmony Valley and was the day's harvest festival event. Since the maze had been brought back last year, it had drawn a crowd from other towns. Mayor Larry was sponsoring the event, giving every ticket holder who made it out in under 90 minutes a free, tie-dye t-shirt with his logo on it. He sold tie-dye products online and was rumored to be profitable doing it. Mina nodded toward Liam. We should start without HUD. 
The four kids took that as permission to go. Kids against moms. Teddy called, hurting the younger kids ahead of him while simultaneously starting the stopwatch function on his watch. We're going to beat the old ladies. We're not old, Jill called after them. A group of teenagers exited the maze, running over to the prize table and chattering excitedly. We better get going. Mina took a step toward the entrance. Oh, no. Annie caught hold of her arm. We can't allow you to leave a. What did you call him, Cory? A hunkalunk. Cory grinned. We can't let you leave a hunkalunk out where anyone can steal him away, Annie concluded. We'll head in after the kids. You and Hud can be a team unto yourselves. Mina shook her head. Yes, and don't forget that a couple who encounters a dead end has to exchange a kiss before turning around. Corey's laughter filled the air at the recitation of one of their teenage rules. Fine. I'll wait for him. Mina gestured to Hud, keeping her voice low. But it's not because he's a hunkalunk. And I'm not doing the dead end exchange. Smirking, Cory and Annie linked arms and entered the maze. All kidding aside, I'm worried about you. Jill lingered behind, concern furrowing her brow. And not because I think Hud will hurt you, but because you've built this small box of a life when you used to live large. Maybe it's time you took a deep look at why. Or at the very least, think about what regrets you might have ten years or so from now if you stay in that box. Her friend's words hit home. But they also made Mina think. Teddy was ten. Has your box gotten too small? Some days I, Jill glanced off toward Parish Hill and the retreat she ran, either visible from this part of town. And then she looked at Mina, smiling wistfully. My answer depends on the kind of day I'm having. Today, the box isn't too small. Jill. Corey and Annie shouted from just inside the maze. It's time you make sure the box that's your life still fits. Jill hugged Mina. How do I know? Mina muttered. I just made this box. Not more than a few months ago. Yes, but you might have overcorrected. Jill held Mina at arm's length. Life is like shoes. Sometimes they fit when you decide to buy them, but when you actually wear them to work, they pinch your feet. Corey and Annie called for Jill again. Coming. Jill marked time on her cell phone and disappeared into the corn maze. My life isn't too small, Mina muttered. But then her gaze lit upon Hud, and she didn't seem so sure. Chapter 13 Hud, surely you can see my point, Agnes was saying when Mina joined the circle of elderly politicians who wouldn't let Hud go enjoy the corn maze. Hud made room for Mina, grateful she'd come to his rescue. Sometimes you outwear your welcome, Agnes continued, drawing his attention once more. She was a short, petite woman with the determination of a professional fisherman, trying to reel in her catch, which in this case was Hud's support of her idea. Hud, you have to agree that we should retire. Not for the first time since Agnes had started this conversation, Mayor Larry gasped. I've been mayor for decades. If you're ready to retire, Agnes, that's your prerogative, but I've got years of public service left in me. I'm not saying you're useless. Agnes gently touched the mayor's skinny arm. And neither are we, your town council. But now that there's a new generation returning to town, we might be out of touch. Her two sidekicks, Rose and Mildred, nodded their heads. Mina remained carefully neutral, saying nothing. I know exactly what this town needs. The mayor bristled with a front, tossing his long gray ponytail over his shoulder. After the grain mill exploded and folks left Harmony Valley in droves, we didn't become a ghost town, did we? And just when things are getting interesting again, you want me to retire? Hud, tell her how wrong that is. Yes, Hud. Do tell. Agnes smiled at Hud the way one does when expecting agreement. After all, you retired from public service at a very early age. Ouch. As one, the three elderly town council women, the hippie mayor, and Mina all turned to face Hud, waiting expectantly for an answer. Well, Mina wasn't waiting for an answer. She was losing a battle with a smile, probably envisioning Hud as unable to give an answer that pleased everyone present. It was a touchy subject, after all. But Hud hadn't been raised in a family of politicians for nothing. The decision to serve and how long to serve is personal. See? 
Mayor Larry gloated. And extended or cut short in the ballot box. That said. I've never lost an election yet. The mayor raised a finger in the air for emphasis. Those you work with may have an opinion about your relevancy and effectiveness. You should always listen to your team, Hud told the old man, although he also took stock of Mina's reaction. She nodded slowly, approvingly. Silently, Hud reveled in her approval. My team. You think these ladies are on my side? Mayor Larry scoffed. They're not my team anymore. So much for years of service together, Mildred muttered. She'd taken a seat on her walker and was staring at her hands. Not your team. Rose sniffed disdainfully, although elegantly. She swayed as if music played in her head. Agnes, remind me of this moment the next time Larry wants land rezoned for some business he wants to start. We're not on the same team, Agnes huffed, delicate cheeks a bright red. Not anymore, Rose said stiffly. It's pride standing between us, plain and simple. I understand pride in service. Mildred wrinkled her nose, nearly causing her big, round lenses to slip off. But I had pride in my auto racing ability, and I had to decide when it was best to quit. I'm not quitting. I'm perfectly electable, Mayor Larry crowed. I've run unopposed for years. And I expect to be unopposed next term. We'll see. Agnes was unwilling to give ground. We'll see, the mayor grumbled in return. I have a legacy to protect. The old man's words reverberated inside HUD. A legacy to protect. You've already created a legacy to be proud of, Mina told the mayor kindly. Not that I'm saying you should retire. Can we table this conversation? I promised HUD he'd get a chance to solve the corn maze, and the others have already started. The town council shooed them off. Mina led Hud toward the corn maze entrance. Take a look at the map before we start. I couldn't find a pattern and there is always a pattern. He peered at the map. The cornfield was a rectangle. Within that rectangle were a series of lines representing the paths. And the paths looked like. It's a pumpkin. Hud glanced back at the town council and mayor, frowning. I don't have a personal legacy to be proud of. What's that noise, Mr. McLeod? Mina cocked her head. I hear a violin playing Cry Me a River in the key of P for pride. Not funny. She was adept at getting under his skin but in a good way. Hud studied at the map once more. How could you not see it's a pumpkin? Mina shrugged, sending a lock of dark curls tumbling temptingly over her shoulder. I see the trees, not the forest. It's a pumpkin, he teased. Not a tree. Mina smirked. I mean, I'm a detail person. I naturally see the minutia. Like my handshake. This was intriguing. He set the stopwatch on his phone, and then led Mina into the maze, having determined a right turn was called for. The ground was still wet from yesterday's storms, and slick from all the people trundling through it. There were puddles here and there, some deeper than others. He imagined their shoes were going to need cleaning after this. You see minutia, including my lack of a public apology. Yes. She sighed audibly from behind him. While you see the forest and refuse to believe paying attention to the details will get you across the finish line. You can't tell the public everything. Hud pivoted, walking backward as they continued down the gently curving path between the stalks. The sun was out. The sky was blue. And Mina. Mina wasn't looking him in the eye. She was looking. At my legs? Hud grinned. Now, there was progress. Back to us. We're Yin and Yang, Mina. It's why we should work together. I could help you diagnose where you lose sight of the forest, like in that speech this morning. No, I. Watch out. Mina caught hold of Hud's arms, pulling him to a slippery stop in a mud puddle. Water quickly seeped into his tennis shoes. He didn't care. Mina was close enough to kiss. Dead end. Mina released Hud and started to turn. Hud caught her arms. I heard what you were saying earlier about dead ends with your friends, Mina. Dead ends were where you exchanged kisses before turning around. Hud's hands lowered to her waist. If we aren't going to work together then. 
Then we could test this attraction. He let the idea hang in the air between them, let his arms ease her closer, let that sharp mind of hers receive the message he was sending. Hoping she wouldn't mind the slick, cold mud around their feet. If we aren't going to work together, then this maze is our. Goodbye, Mina said after too long of a pause. There was a clear dismissal in her tone. She started to turn away again, but her foot slipped in the mud. Her arms flew in the air. Her torso fell back into his, and then they both went down in a wet, muddy splash. The back of Mina's head connected with his temple in a resounding thud. The lights went out. Or at least, Hud thought so. Turns out, Mina's dark hair hung over his face like a curtain. Are you all right? She scrambled off him, only to slip back in the mud next to him. I should be asking you that. Despite his temple pounding, Hud threaded his fingers through her hair, searching for a lump on the back of her head. Are you seeing stars? No. I'm just seeing, you. She took possession of his hand, removing it from her hair, the ends of which were muddy. Her dark brown gaze lingered in his for too long before she startled, releasing his hand. You're going to have a shiner. Walter won't be pleased. Come on. Let's get you up. She moved to all fours and from there tried to get to her feet. At the same time, Hud sat up, wet and cold, head and heart pounding, not only because his head was smarting, because he was certain Mina had kissing on her mind a moment ago. The same way she'd had kissing on her mind while staring at his legs. Had she been staring at his legs? Holy smokes. Hud laughed, getting to his feet beside her. You weren't admiring my legs. You were staring at the puddle behind me. He laughed so hard that he lost his balance. Instinctively, he reached for her. They contorted their bodies like first-time skaters, trying to stay upright. When they finally found their equilibrium, they had their arms wrapped around one another. They grinned. And then those grins faded but they didn't look away. Kiss her. Hud could think of a thousand reasons why doing so was a bad idea. Still, that didn't prevent him from giving in to impulse and drawing Mina closer, despite it not being the most romantic of moments. They were both wet and muddy. The breeze that had been warm before was now chill across his wet clothes. It didn't prevent Hud from lowering his head until his lips hovered over hers, holding himself back just long enough to ask, May I? You talk too much. Mina rose up on her toes and sealed her lips to his. And then she was kissing him the way he'd wanted to kiss her, with complete abandon. And that kiss was everything Hud had known it would be, full of heat and passion and longing, because Mina was always so tense. As tightly wound as he was. As coiled up inside as those ringlets of hers. Just as abruptly as the kiss began, it ended. Stupid, small boxes, Mina muttered, pulling away. She turned and headed back the way they'd come. We missed a turn. I thought you studied the map. The corn stalks rustled. Somewhere in the distance, a child giggled. And Hud. One thought was playing on a loop in his head, she's a keeper. It took a moment for Hud to snap out of his kiss-induced haze, pick his feet up out of the puddle, and slosh after Mina. I studied the map. We need to keep moving to the right, always taking the turn inward. You missed this. She stepped onto another path and moved forward without complaining about being wet or muddy, without bringing up their kiss or telling him she wasn't running his campaign. Despite that, she's a keeper. So, I missed a turn. I was distracted. I haven't done a corn maze in over a decade. Frustration tried to get the better of him. No one had ever kissed him and then walked away. This woman was going to be the death of him. Don't worry. I'll get us out. And then they were going to have another go at this kissing business. Mina paused, glanced at Hud over her shoulder with a challenging look in her eyes. I don't need a man to rescue me. We'll get out by working together. Yin and Yang, remember? She turned her backside to him. Forest and trees. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere nearby, someone crashed into the corn stalks and began to laugh. Back ramrod straight, Mina sped up. If you're angry, we should talk. I just want out of here. She took a branch to the left and then another, leading them into. Another dead end. Min turned to face Hud, cheeks a bright pink, nose in the air, gaze focused at his feet. 
Hud held up his hands in surrender. A man knows when not to test his luck. Smart man, she muttered, making no move to backtrack. Or push him out of the way. What's going on in that pretty head of yours? Hud knew immediately it was the wrong thing to say. Mina frowned so hard, it was nearly a scowl. If you could see yourself, you'd know that you are three bus stops past handsome right now. I don't need to see myself right now to realize I'm at the same point as you on the pretty scale. Don't compliment you when you don't think you're looking your best. Hud tapped his temple. Noted. We, Mina gestured from herself to Hud and back again. We are anything but yin and yang. You're wet and muddy and your head is probably pounding. Hud approached her, arms extended to give her a supportive hug. Let's not make judgments when we're upset. Why don't we talk about a topic you love, Liam? Oh, oh, no. Mina tried to push past him, but the stalks were crowded together here, as if planted to encourage intimacy in the dead end. She stopped next to Hud and slowly raised her gaze to his. Hud wasn't sure what button of hers he'd pushed, but he was determined to get her to open up. We've got a long way to go to get out of here. We could talk about what happened at the last dead end. Those perfectly shaped lips of hers pursed together. Or we could talk about your son. He took her hand, turned around and took the lead. They didn't talk for a bit. Laughter drifted to them from other parts of the maze. People were having a good time. Hud wished he and Mina were having a good time. You and I are like oil and vinegar, Mina said briskly, sounding as if she'd recovered her professional demeanor despite mud baths and impulsive kisses. Oil and vinegar, Hud said lightheartedly. Two ingredients that work together with bread to make a very tasty appetizer. One of his favorites, actually. He came to a stop at a junction, listening for her response while he considered their options in the maze. Oil and vinegar isn't a popular flavor combination or butter would be in a heap of trouble. Mina darted past him, nearly slipping on the slick ground. I'll take the lead. And the consequences if we run into another dead end. Hud was hoping for a dead end. Rather desperately. Mina proceeded forward with tentative steps. There were puddles. There were options to consider. She kept moving, taking a turn, following it around to. Dead end, Hud announced happily. Look. Mina faced him with a stern expression, not giving ground. The dead end thing isn't going to happen. Her cheeks bloomed a soft pink color. Again. Oh, he had leverage here. Hud gave her a teasing smile. That hardly seems fair. We should compromise. You know, the way good politicians do. Mina frowned. What are you proposing? That we get to know each other better, he said in his gentlest tone of voice. Every dead end, the leader decides if it will be a traditional dead end. Nope, she practically growled. Or if it will be a truth. After a beat, he added softly, tell me about Liam. He's a great kid. And that said a lot about her. Mina sighed in defeat, as if talking to him about her son was the worst of taboos, after kissing him, that is. And then she started talking. Chapter 14 Liam is too smart for his age. Sometimes I wonder how long it will be before he'll be clever enough to outsmart me. Mina was babbling, distracting by the effort it took not to look at Hud's completely capable lips. He loves games of strategy, like his father. Ack. Say something else. Which is why, I don't hover over him. Liam needs challenges to stay out of trouble and learn how to be a well-behaved, independent person. You see? That wasn't so hard, was it? Hud spared Mina the kindest of smiles, one that was far too brief, before taking the lead down a different maze path. Mina breathed a sigh of relief. I'd expect a former military brat to raise their kid that way, Hud said in a matter-of-fact tone. And I mean military brat in only the kindest of terms. My mother was a helicopter parent and my father would tell you that was necessary given we were McLeods. The only time we had some measure of freedom was when we volunteered for storm cleanup one summer in Puerto Rico. He headed down a trail that curved gently to the right. The sounds of raucous mazegoers carried over the corn stalks. And then someone cried, dead end. Mina would have smiled at the enthusiasm in that voice if she hadn't kissed Hud in a dead end. 
And the worst of it was, she had the most persistent longing to kiss him again. It made no sense. Hud was Liam's uncle. He wouldn't want to kiss her again if he knew that fact. Kissing him again would only complicate things later. But her brain didn't receive that signal with due diligence. Her brain was off on a tangent, comparing Hud to Samuel. Samuel had been like Peter Pan, living life to the fullest when he wasn't on duty, creating a fairy tale experience of falling in love for Mina. Hud, on the other hand, Hud was a mature man. Granted, he seemed more like Samuel in the way he acted like being covered in mud was no big deal. But he was a man driven by his career aspirations, the way Mina had once been. And he was also someone who'd experienced great successes and painful failures. Like Mina. How could they simultaneously be so very much alike and on polar ends of the political strategic spectrum? Hud paused at a junction. He'd been looking at Mina differently since that kiss. And it wasn't just that his right eye was puffing up and turning purple. There didn't seem to be a stiffness in the set to his shoulders anymore. And there was no longer unwavering command in his tone. The fight to establish a pecking order was over. They were equals now. Whatever upper hand she'd once had was gone. And as equals, that wet, muddy, impulsive, ill-conceived, and totally hot kiss wouldn't have been as demoralizingly devastating, if not for Liam, who was truly the love of Mina's life. There was no room for any other MacLeod, past or present. Mina? Hud stopped to look at her. Did you hear me? What? She forced herself to hold his gaze. No. Sorry. I was, thinking. You didn't answer me. I was worried you might have a concussion. He peered at her with his unbruised eye. Whiskey never looked so good. You were thinking so hard you didn't hear me? Hud continued. Were you wrestling with the unexpectedness of this attraction? Or were you wondering how to reconcile what's happening between us? Good guess on both counts. Mina nodded. It's not a guess. I'm feeling what you're feeling. Hud smiled a little. It was amazing how powerful a little smile from Hud could be. Heart pounding. Spirit lifting. Kiss inspiring. And, truth telling? No. But the rest. I must have hit my head harder than I thought. As if confirming that hypothesis, she became aware of a pounding at the back of her head. How are you feeling? he asked. Other than confused. Mina knew she shouldn't breath a word about Samuel. But that didn't mean she had to stop herself from moving closer and reaching up to brush her fingers lightly over the bruised and swollen skin around his right eye. I'm off kilter but I'm also sorry about this. Does it hurt? It's in the weird swelling stage. There's a dull ache. He moved his fingers around the side of her neck, brushing them into her hair as he searched and found her bruise. Nice little lump you've got yourself. Only your bruise will show tomorrow. Mina let her hand drop away, tried to find her professionalism. Failed. Grinned instead. Sadly. You can't hide that shiner. Hud shrugged, staring down at Mina with a look that warmed her to her wet, soggy toes. If anyone notices, I'll just say they should have seen the other guy. Someone ran past on a parallel path through the corn, laughing. Where were we? Mina couldn't remember where their conversation had derailed. And if they didn't start talking again, she was going to kiss Hud a second time. He smiled as if pleased that he'd gotten her off track. Take your pick. Military brats, childhood independence or the lack thereof. The McLeod upbringing. Exactly what she didn't want to talk about. Mina couldn't look at Hud. And by not looking at him, she noticed, dead end. How prophetic, because the conversation was a dead end, too. Yep. Hud didn't bother confirming her sighting. But he did wait for her choice. My choice. It was either kiss him or exchange some kind of truth. Mina really wanted to kiss him. Jill was right. When she'd moved to Harmony Valley, she created too small of a box. I should have been casually dating. Then this, Mina gestured at everything and nothing wouldn't have happened. She blew out a frustrated breath before turning and walking away, not really caring where she was going. How did this happen? I shouldn't be attracted to you. 
A professional wouldn't be in this situation. This wacky, scary, almost wonderful, emotionally risky situation. Professionals are humans, too. His voice came from close behind her. It wouldn't take much to turn and reach for him. Her heart pounded. I can't afford to be human. With you. Mina took a right branch and almost immediately faced a dead end. She turned slowly around to face him. You can't afford to be human? Because humans feel? Hud started to frown, winced, and pressed his fingers around the edges of his swollen eye. Because humans love? Because humans hurt. Her muddy, wet clothes had finally gotten to her. Mina was cold. She shivered. They don't mean to. But they do. They promise to love each other until death do they part and then they can't keep their promise, even for the sake of their little girl. Her words were lost in a sudden gust of wind that shook the corn stalks around them and made her shiver once more. It was good that they were lost. Mina shouldn't have said anything because her outburst had opened the door to a memory, a door she thought had been locked away forever. Mom. Mina had tugged her mother free of a man's embrace. That's not dad. Mina, you shouldn't be home. Go to your room. Now, mom had commanded without a caring note in her voice. Later, after mom's lover left, Mina came out to ask why she'd been kissing someone other than her father. Don't you love him anymore? Love? Mom scoffed. Love is a fairy tale. A myth. A bedtime story. You're not your parents, Mina, Hud said quietly. You mentioned they went through a rough patch. It was a statement but also a prompt, an opening for her to talk things through. And yet, his gaze spoke of empathy and patience. He'd wait until she was ready to share her past. How do you know, she asked, dumbfounded. How do I know what? That I'm not ready to talk about the past. Not any of her different, painful, and private histories. Her parents, Samuel, Liam. I know you, Hud said in a voice gruff with earnestness and more than a tinge of surprise. Mina felt the same surprising connection, and it scared her. Not because it was anything like her experience with Samuel. That had been a light-hearted fling. But because Hud made her feel things for him she didn't want to. And so, she tried to challenge him, albeit weakly. You just met me. And yet, you know me, too. Mina didn't deny it. But if you truly know me, you'll understand that things have happened to me that make me shy away from anything that could be mistaken as love between two. Humans. Hud nodded. You don't disbelieve in love as much as you want to avoid being emotionally crushed. Again, Mina was struck by a chest-crushing belief that Hud knew her better than her closest friends. And it was because of that dangerous inkling that she started talking, presenting her case. My parents only had a few pictures taken together on their wedding day, Mina said in a low voice. Their faces were so full of joy and what might be called love. But by the time I came along, there were no public displays of affection at home, certainly none caught on camera. Love had cooled. Maybe they were each too tied up in their careers. Maybe one of them had to sacrifice for the other for a promotion and there was resentment. I don't know. And she probably never would. But then when I was 13, my mom had an affair with her aide. I walked in and. That would have been about the time you came to live with your grandparents, Hud surmised. Yes. Mina managed to work up enough saliva to continue. My dad began negotiations to keeping the marriage intact at the dinner table. The goals of the negotiation were to keep their records clean. There were no tears. No raised voices. No bitterness. No, love. She'd felt so empty, as if all her childhood dreams had been shattered. It changed my mind about what love was. They're fond of each other, I think. And they might even love each other in a way. But in love? Like in the movies? No. Without her realizing, Hud had led her down a new path. This one was long and gently curving with no intersections. And yet, you dated, Hud said carefully. So carefully, that she knew what direction he was leading the conversation, and yet, you dated my brother. I hung out, Mina said, tiptoeing around the truth. We had a lot in common. A knowledge of politics and the state of the world. She nodded, although Hud was ahead of her and couldn't see. 
Samuel made me feel, not alone. Or like a misfit. But it didn't last. No, Mina felt a stab of guilt at implying it had ended by one or both of them calling it quits. It hadn't lasted because Samuel had died. We could go the distance. Hud took an abrupt turn in the path. The corn rustled. The wind chilled her wet blue jeans and sweatshirt. Mina slowed. She couldn't let Hud think they were starting a relationship. There wasn't just a massive secret standing between them. There was also Liam's normal upbringing to be considered. Hud reappeared, smiling apologetically. Mina bit her bottom lip before asking, dead end? That seemed to sum up any chance they might have of a future together. I may only have one good eye at the moment, Hud told Mina as he led her down a winding path in the corn maze. But I recognize that expression on your face. You'd run for the exit if you knew the way. He'd pushed her too far, too fast with that go the distance comment. She didn't deny it. It doesn't matter if we're fascinated with each other on a physical level. On all levels, Hud quickly amended. Physical, emotional, spiritual. Whatever. There wasn't sarcasm in her tone. There was something else. Hud glanced back at her, searching for a clue. Mina's shoulders were hunched, her arms crossed, and her eyes. Those dark brown eyes conveyed worry. We can't be anything. I don't live in the city. I don't want any part of the McLeod spotlight. And. And. Hud turned to face her. Stopping. Standing in her way. Silently willing her to tell him what stood between them. You need me to continue? Mina's chin came up a notch. Okay. If you run for office, I can't date you. That was odd. But, you think I'd do a good job? Yes. She bit her bottom lip. Let me get this straight. Hud rolled his shoulders back, trying to ease the tension. You won't manage my campaign even though you think I'd make a good mayor. Correct. And you won't date me if I run for office. Mina shook her head. I won't date you. Period. Hud might have believed her if her gaze hadn't dropped to his mouth. There's got to be a compromise somewhere. You don't do compromises. She wasn't successful hiding a hint of a smile. I'd start compromising if it meant being with you to see where this leads. He lowered his gaze to her lips. What do you say? You'd have to convince me. Mina smirked. Really, really convince me. Oh, that smirk. He considered it a challenge even greater than her words. Hud inched closer and wrapped his arms around her. My lips can be very persuasive. And then he kissed her. If anyone had told Hud he'd start to fall in love in a cornfield, backside caked in mud, with a black eye, and a tenacious woman who frustrated him to no end, he'd have said they were crazy. Love grew with time and care. Love was nurtured by candlelit dinners and a blanket laid beneath a starry sky. But as the kiss continued, Hud realized that crazy things did happen. And that love could barrel into him at the most unexpected of times. If only Mina felt the same way about love and about him. A burst of laughter from teenagers running past them brought an end to the kiss. That wasn't you compromising, Mina whispered, cheeks pinkening. That was you conquering. This woman. So frustrating. Can't we both just say that was a doozy of a kiss? Hud considered himself a good negotiator. But he'd never had to negotiate a relationship before. Women usually threw themselves in his path. Mommy? Is that you? Liam's ninja-disguised face appeared between the cornstalks two rows over. You're so close to the way out. Is that them? One of Mina's friends joined Liam, bending over to look. She was the long-haired brunette. Hud thought her name was Jill. We were getting worried. They said we could send up a drone to find you if you didn't come out soon. Another one of Mina's friends joined Liam and Jill. It was one of the blondes. I bet you got waylaid by a dead end. She laughed. Hud and Mina didn't laugh. They moved down the path which curved away from Liam and the women. Hud dragged his feet. He wasn't ready to leave. Once they were out of the stocks, someone would claim his attention. 
HUD wanted a few more minutes of privacy, not for kisses, but to return them to a more neutral footing. He turned at the last switchback, facing Mina, and the guarded look on her face. Do you think Mayor Larry should retire? Mina blinked in apparent surprise. No. He listens to what people want and he's good at bringing different factions together. Plus, he loves being mayor. Good. She was talking to him. Does he take advantage of his position? A little. Mina smiled. Progress. If the current town administration is effective, why would Agnes want them to retire? Mina took a moment to think about it. Maybe Agnes knows it will take a long time for the mayor to come to terms with retiring. Ah, uh, time. I get it. Just as Hud was beginning to suspect that it would take time for Mina to get used to the idea of dating him. He made a mental note to ask her why a political consultant, such as herself, would shy away from the McLeod spotlight. It felt counterintuitive. Mommy? Liam called from the direction Hud assumed was the exit. Jill says you have to hurry if you want a free t-shirt. Coming. Mina stared up at Hud, almost frowning. Why haven't you left town? I'm enjoying, being with you. Hud brushed a wayward curl behind her ear. Mina blushed. If you want me to leave, I will. But Hud hoped she wouldn't give him the boot. He took Mina's hand. She didn't protest. She didn't protest when he laced their fingers together. She didn't even protest when he pulled her next to him and began walking side by side toward the exit. Liam ran to meet them, tripping and recovering. And then he crashed into them, throwing his arms around their legs, only to quickly step back. Yuck. You're wet and muddy. Did you fall? He rubbed at the ninja mask that was drooping on his nose. Hud, what happened to your eye? Ahead of them, Jill gasped. Did Hud try something, Mina? Did you pop him one for getting fresh? No, Mina dropped Hud's hand and started talking, but whatever she said to Jill, even when Mina had her friend feel the bump on the back of her head to confirm their story, it didn't stop Jill from giving them both speculative looks. Which made Mina frown. And Hud grinned from ear to ear. Because he was going to do it. He was going to make Mina believe in love again. By making her fall in love with him. Chapter 15 Mermaids? Hud glanced around the small park by the Harmony Valley River, as he infused his voice with faux sarcasm. Why did it have to be mermaids? A dozen kids ran across the grass wearing mermaid-themed hats, sunglasses, and skirts, a whimsical sight that made him want to laugh. I told you to stay at the house with an ice pack on your famous face. Mina tossed her still damp dark hair over one shoulder. They'd gone back to her house after completing the corn maze, showered, had lunch, and Cherise had very kindly washed and dried Hud's gym clothes. Mayor Larry had given them both tie-dyed t-shirts, and gifted Hud a tie-dyed sweatshirt. Groovy. But no, Mina continued. You wanted to come to Maddie's birthday party, Hud, even though I warned you that everyone agreed to dress up as mermaids. You left out three key words, Hud said succinctly, if softly. Even the adults. Hud stared down at his ensemble. He wore the purple and yellow tie-dyed t-shirt he'd received for making it out of the maze in a timely manner. He wore a mermaid skirt he'd pulled on over his basketball shorts, the ones Mina had graciously washed for him on the speed setting after they returned to her grandmother's house. His mermaid skirt was a tight fit, plain purple cotton with a large fishtail printed on the front and on the back. There were slits on the sides to allow him to walk. A little. Unfortunately, or fortunately, his mermaid skirt hit him just below the knees, ruining the effect of a tail. You make a better mermaid than I do, Hud told Mina, hoping it might earn him a kiss. Thank you. Her t-shirt and mermaid skirt were also purple. Her skirt hit her mid-calf. And thank you for being a good sport. One good thing about your merman costume is that your skirt shows off your legs. She's teasing me? Hud considered that progress. Who knew attending a mermaid-themed birthday party would lower Mina's guard? Boys and girls gathered around the birthday girl preparing to sing at the next table over. Liam was a ninja mermaid, still wearing his hood and mask, much to Maddie's chagrin. Mina and Hud had volunteered to put ice cream on plates, allowing it to soften while Maddie was serenaded. 
they'd completed the ice cream scooping. All they were waiting for was Annie to light the candles and the singing to begin. It was a far cry from birthdays Hud had when he was a kid. There were more kids present than adults, for one thing. Plus, no one wore a suit or high heels. And politics wasn't being discussed. Annie lit the candles and led the group in singing Happy Birthday. When they were finished singing, a few helpful parents came over to shuttle the plates with ice cream over to the main table where Annie cut the cake. You saw my legs all day and you just now decide to admire them? Hud whispered, turning this way and that. Don't go fishing in the sea for compliments, Mr. McLeod, or I'll send you back to shore to get an ice pack. Mina was a bit reserved in her teasing, but she was protective of Hud, as well. She'd requested the other parents in attendance to refrain from taking Hud's picture with his skirt on. You know we both need ice packs. Oh, he could deliver a punchline as dryly as she could. And I suppose if I admit that, I must admit we both need our heads examined. Mina laughed. Hud liked her laugh. He liked a lot about her, not the least of which being her sense of humor. She was a good person. A good mother. Good with kids. Good with her friends and townspeople. Good with me. His gaze dropped to Mina's lips. Do you know what I don't like about ice cream? Mina scared. Is this going to involve a story about a scoop of ice cream falling out of a cone when you were a kid? No. I don't like that you have to eat it so fast. Something that good, like kissing Mina, shouldn't be rushed. Mina's cheeks pinkened. She turned away. Keep your eye on the prize, Hud. That was his father's voice. But Hud was sure his father wouldn't approve of what Hud's prize was, Mina. San Francisco and his McLeod legacy were far from being top of mind. What did that say about him and his dedication to serve again? Was Mina right? Immediately, he rejected the idea. When can I open presents? Maddie asked, her mouth ringed with melted vanilla ice cream. After you eat all your cake, Liam told her. After all the cake is gone. Michael shouted enthusiastically, the way little boys sometimes did. More cake. More cake. More cake, Liam chanted. The two boys began shoveling cake toward their mouths, often missing and making the group laugh. My father wouldn't have laughed. No. He would have put a stop to it right away. This is what it's like to be normal, isn't it? Hud surprised himself by saying. Pretending to be mermaids serving up cake and ice cream to little mermaids? Mina smiled. That's what you call normal? Hud drank in her warm smile, her playful tone of voice, and the way the sunlight turned some of her curls a blue-black color. But she was waiting for him to say something, and he wanted to say something clever. Any birthday party without adults in suits and ties is what I'd call normal. Samuel would have loved this. Mina's smile fell. She rubbed a hand along his arm, almost consolingly, and then left him to mingle with the kids eating cake. Jill sidled up next to Hud. She wore a pink mermaid skirt that matched her pink baseball hat and a dogged expression. I have questions for you. Something in the way Jill presented herself, the stiff set to her shoulders, the undercurrent of steel in her tone, the apprehension in her eyes, told Hud she'd had a dark, bruised history with relationships. He wanted to hug Jill and tell her she could call on him if she ever felt threatened again. He wanted to reassure Jill that he hadn't overstepped propriety where Mina was concerned. But he suspected he had to let Jill lead the conversation. As Mina's friend, Jill began. I want her to get out of the small box she's made of her life. I thought a little flirtation with you would do her good. But that black eye of yours and the way you don't seem to have any desire to leave town are red flags. You think I'm moving too fast? Yeah, Jill looked him up and down. Not to mention that you two move in different circles. You undoubtedly have important people on speed dial. And your career would always come first to Mina's needs. And Liam's. I like honesty, Hud allowed, not wanting to think about the truth in her words. I always have. But I also like boundaries. Jill smirked. I know you mean well, Jill. And I know that I look like a merman pirate without his eye patch. Hud tried to smile, baring his teeth and everything. Jill's expression didn't warm. But I'm sincere. 
I like Mina. A lot. I haven't felt this way about anyone in a long time. He caught a glimpse of Mina wiping the cake from Liam's face. They were laughing and having a good time. His smile felt more natural as he turned his gaze back to Jill. I'll make a deal with you. If I do something stupid and hurt Mina, you have my permission to blacken my other eye. Why are you having a serious conversation, cousin? Annie slung an arm over Jill's shoulders and gave her a squeeze. It's Maddie's birthday. I'm threatening HUD with cement shoes, Jill said in a serious tone of voice. You know, violations for misbehavior. HUD refrained from rolling his eyes. Barely. Ah. Annie nodded, then gave HUD an apologetic smile. You have to excuse us, HUD. The four of us are all only children, Mina, Jill, me and Corey. And because we love each other so very much, when we feel one of our own is threatened, we take on the role of the stereotypical big brother. And in the case of Jill and me, we add a little Vegas color since we spent time there as kids. Mina is lucky to have such caring friends. HUD meant it. He crossed his heart. I promise to tread carefully where her heart is concerned. Annie hugged Jill once more. I like him, Jill. He took a blow to the eye and hasn't gone all macho on us. Not to mention that he's wearing a mermaid skirt and that his mother would never be a monster-in-law. Cut him a little slack. Hud kept trying to look trustworthy. A little smile. Casual body language. He even fiddled with his mermaid skirt. Yes, Jill. I'm one of the good ones. You know what my problem is? Jill sighed. Mina is a little sparrow with flashy feathers. And Hud is a rare and powerful bald eagle. They could exist in the same ecosystem. But the eagle is higher up in the food chain. Chomp chomp. Mina's laughter filled the air. You have it wrong, Jill. Chapter 16 So, my granddaughter called you a flashy bird. Cherise laid a fresh ice patch on Hud's swollen eye on Saturday night. Mina and Liam had gone to bed, which was where Cherise should have been since it was after 10. Her hip was aching, but she couldn't abandon her famous guest. Hud was stretched out on Cherise's couch, wearing his suit slacks and white dress shirt, bare feet hanging over the edge. And even though Cherise was ancient, she wasn't so old that she didn't recognize a handsome man with a bruised ego. She called you a flashy bird and you got your nose bent out of shape. Yes. No. I don't know. Hud's deep voice was pitched low. He placed a hand over the ice pack. How long until my laundry is done? You still have time to talk to me. Cherise chuckled, settling into her husband's recliner, breathing a sigh of relief as her hip pain receded. Thank you, Toby, for your divine intervention. What's wrong with being a flashy bird? From what I heard tell, she called herself one, too. The alternative was an apex predator, Hud grumbled. At least one of us should have been the bald eagle. At least one of you. You, you mean. Cherise chuckled again. Men and their egos. So predictable. I heard her tell you that there are people out there who could ruin either one of you. That's why she called you both flashy birds. Hud grunted, staring at the ceiling. Why do you think Agnes wants the town council and the mayor to retire? Agnes told you that? Cherise rested her head against the chair back. Her friend hadn't said a word to her. She might have grandbabies on her mind. Or she might know something we don't know about the health of one of the members. Or, she might be burned out on serving. The latter seemed unlikely. Agnes lived to serve. When I retired, I was ready to do away with all the politics and petty demands of the college administration. Teaching was a joy, but the rest. There is that, Hud allowed. None of his characteristic charm was on display tonight. His eye must really be bothering him. Or perhaps his whining covered the real hurt of being classified as a flashy bird. Instead of thinking about what's motivating others, why don't you tell me what's really bothering you? Maybe then she could trundle off to bed. Silence. Or I could tell you, Cherise cut to the chase. You're falling in love with my granddaughter, and you're worried because she doesn't believe in love. He lifted the ice pack and stared at her. How did you? 
I see the way you look at her. And the way Mina looked at him. And you need to forget about this idea she has regarding love. She knows how to love. She loves me. And Liam, of course. But she's afraid to trust those feelings when it comes to a man. Because of her parents. Cherise chose to be silent. There were things she knew and things she suspected when it came to Mina. And although she had hopes for HUD, it wasn't her place to go into more depth about Mina's past. What do you suggest I do, he asked, placing the ice pack back on his face. She let you in, HUD. That hasn't happened since Liam was born. Cherise heard the dryer ding. HUD's clothes were done. Don't put pressure on her about the future. Just enjoy the now. Wise words. Thank you. I have some other wise words. Cherise eased herself to her feet. Tomorrow is another day full of activities with energetic youngsters. You need to recharge. Get your clothes out of the dryer and get yourself to bed. I'm headed there myself. Good night. Maybe in the morning, Hud and Mina would stop overthinking things. Chapter 17 Mina slept in on Sunday morning. Mostly because she'd had a hard time getting to sleep Saturday night. She'd reworked the speech that had been due Friday, trying to see the forest the way Hud did instead of the trees. She drafted an email to Walter in which she recommended looking for a third candidate, someone who wasn't Roger or Hud. And then, she'd got into bed without sending the email, staring at the ceiling and thinking about Hud while her darling little boy snored softly next to her. Mommy. Liam burst into her bedroom. He wore the mermaid baseball cap and sunglasses he'd gotten at Maddie's birthday party yesterday. The petting zoo starts soon. Why are you still in bed? I'm awake. Mina sat up too quickly, making the bump on the back of her head throb and the room spin. I'm almost moving. Is there any coffee left? I don't know. Liam stumbled into her bed. I don't drink coffee. Yes, there's coffee left. A deep voice. A tall, broad silhouette filling her bedroom doorway. Hud entered carrying a mug of coffee and sporting a dark shiner. He set the coffee on her nightstand. I made it the way you like it. Strong with lots of cream. Thank you. Mina was also grateful that she'd worn her best men's style pajamas and put her hair in a ponytail. She probably didn't look her best, but she could have looked much worse. A picture above her desk caught her eye. A picture of Mina and Samuel, half hidden behind a picture of Liam playing soccer. Hud started to turn in the direction of her desk, in the direction of the picture and the truth. Mina caught his hand. That's so thoughtful. Please don't be nosy and look at my desk pictures. Hud smiled at her, curling his fingers in hers, his back to her desk. Are you sure we can't keep Hud? Liam hopped onto the corner of the bed, bouncing up and down. I beat him at chess three times this morning. But in more than ten moves. I'm regaining my mojo. Hud continued to smile warmly at Mina. He was still handsome, despite the black eye. How are you feeling? Head okay? The sun was streaming through the bedroom window, making Hud's eyes look more like caramel than whiskey. But despite the nuance in his eye color and the same thick, black hair, Hud wasn't Samuel. Hud wasn't a ray of eternal sunshine or a bundle of bottomless energy. Hud led with his serious side, the same as Mina did. He had a pragmatic view of the world, the same as she did. He had a cantankerous side, the same as she did. And Hud valued his privacy, the same way she did. If Mina didn't have Liam to worry about, she'd let this fascination with Hud grow. But she did have Liam and when Hud knew the truth, when, not if, he'd agree that the sensible thing to do was not to get involved with Mina on any level, personally or professionally. She extricated her fingers from his. I'm feeling okay, all things considered. How long do you need to get ready? Hud asked gently. I let you sleep as long as Liam would let me. Long enough to play another game of chess? Liam bounced on the bed some more. He bounced so hard that he fell to his knees. His sunglasses flew off his face and into Mina's lap. Long enough to play two games? Mina snatched his sunglasses and tossed them back to Liam, not caring that he was wearing them inside. 
They offered more than UV protection. They offered anonymity. In her angst about kissing HUD, she'd forgotten about Liam's features. Thank heavens, her son liked wearing play glasses and costumes. One game, boys. I'm going to hurry. The less time HUD spent opposite Liam, the better. You're not going to win in less than 20 moves this time, kid. With one last smile for Mina, HUD walked around the bed and out the door. Squealing, Liam leaped down and ran out of the bedroom, slamming the door behind him. Mina leaped out of bed, tucked Samuel's picture behind a photograph of her and her Harmony Valley BFFs, and then grabbed clothes. Last night, she'd imagined HUD trying to kiss her good morning. She'd practiced what she'd say as she ducked away. But he hadn't tried to kiss her. He said he knew me. He said we had a chance at forever. His signals were as mixed as the ones she gave him. What's this? Mina emerged looking beautiful after two chess games had been lost by HUD. She'd pulled her hair into a ponytail and wore a simple pair of jeans and a green hoodie. She pointed at a plate on the kitchen table. Did Grandma Beam make breakfast? No, I did. HUD pulled out a chair for Mina, careful not to bump any of the beakers propagating on the wall, although there were less today since Cherise had contributed some yesterday to help sell Jill's pottery planters. I made you a cheddar cheese, mushroom and chives omelette. You did? Mina sat down but glanced up at HUD, confusion lining her brow. Is that so hard to believe? HUD asked. Kinda, Mina said. HUD cooked while we played chess, Liam said, heavy on the sarcasm. He pushed his plastic sunglasses higher on his nose. He made moves without studying the board. HUD gave the little chess prodigy a look that said, chill out. They'd had a conversation earlier about puppies, chickens, baby brothers, and new daddies. All of which Liam had on his wish list of things he wanted Mina to grant him. All of which HUD told him wouldn't happen unless the boy was helpful and patient. HUD McLeod cooks. Mina poked at the omelette with a fork. Don't you have a personal chef? My mother does. I spend a week every summer attending a cooking school in France or Italy. HUD loved cooking. Cooking makes me happy. Don't tell people you learn to cook in France. It's not relatable in the polls. Mina took a bite, making an intriguing, gratifying sound. This is delicious. It's the butter. It keeps the eggs from getting spongy and, Hud stopped himself from geeking out and talking about food long enough to make her pretty brown eyes glaze over. She was smiling the way he liked, full cheeks and sparkling eyes. You should challenge Roger to a cook-off. You'd smoke him. I'll do it if you manage my campaign. Mina set her fork down, losing that smile. We have a petting zoo to get to. Finally. I'll get my shoes. Liam ran out of the kitchen, gangly legs moving a hair slowly than his upper torso, nearly sending him sprawling. Hud could relate to growth spurt-related clumsiness. He and Samuel had both suffered through those times. I was out of line, Hud admitted, raising his hands in the universal sign of surrender. Let's go to the petting zoo. Hud walked out to the living room, dodging leaves and vines along the way. He bent over to pick up his sneakers near the door, sending blood flowing to his black eye, making it pound, making him dizzy. He bumped into a collection of planters in the foyer. Hey! Mina steadied Hud, having followed him from the kitchen. Maybe you should see a doctor. Before Hud could answer, a horn honked, sending Liam charging toward the door. Liam, do you want to ride with me and Maddie? Annie called from her car. Liam bounced up and down. Can I go to the petting zoo with them, mommy? Mina moved to the door and waved. Yes, honey. Be good for Annie. Her son tossed his sunglasses on the ground and charged out of the house, shouting enthusiastically. Mina waited until they'd driven away to close the door and face HUD once more. I need to tell you something. Something you may not like. And by the look on her face, she didn't like what she had to say either. Hud got the feeling her truth would have to do with why she didn't aspire to the McLeod spotlight. And although he wanted to know what issue she wrestled with, he didn't want to ruin what was promising to be a nice morning together. Why have a conversation that's going to ruin both our days? Hud reached behind her to open the front door. Come on. 
The bunnies and goats are just waiting for our attention and affection. HUD, be serious. Mina closed the door once more. I am. It's Sunday. No one has serious conversations on Sunday. You're a McLeod. You have serious conversations every day. Do not. Do too. Do not. HUD smiled. Mina didn't. Yikes, whatever she had to say must be really bad. What's all this arguing? Cherise tottered out to the living room, limp more pronounced than yesterday, although she didn't bump into any plants. I thought you two liked each other. We do, Hud assured her, earning a frown from Mina. And a huff as she put her shoes on. Affection for each other has no bearing on anything. I started a discussion and... We hadn't started, Hud insisted but I imagine it would have become an argument. It wouldn't have been an argument. It was going to be a discussion, Mina insisted. Whatever Mina wanted to say, she would have claimed to be right, Hud continued, not without some satisfaction. She always claims to be right. Mina scoffed. Baby girl, if you were right all the time, more people would know your name. Cherie sat down heavily on the couch. Ouch. I made you an omelette, Hud told Cherise. It's been warming in the oven. I'll go get it. He went to the kitchen and plated the omelette while Mina poured her grandmother a cup of coffee. They set her breakfast on the coffee table. I feel spoiled, Cherise gushed. Now go on. Off with you. If you're going to argue, I don't want you doing it around me. They left the house and walked toward the town square where the petting zoo was being held. Several people were also heading that way. And Mina. She looked unhappy. Where did the sun go? Hud took Mina's hand. I know I said I didn't want to ruin the day but go ahead. Tell me what it is that's bothering you and we'll fix it together. Mina frowned. This isn't anything that's fixable, by you, Anne. Do you want coffee? I want coffee. She began walking faster. Let's go to Martin's. What about Liam and the petting zoo? Hud dragged along behind her like an anchor, recognizing that one of the toughest women he knew had just lost her nerve. Besides, you just had a cup of coffee. That was my first cup of the day. Second cup at Martin's is always the best, especially on Sundays when they have fresh cinnamon buns. She tried once more to hurry him along. They had cinnamon buns yesterday. Hud continued to hold her back. You should tell me what's bothering you. It's not the right time. She sounded pained. Not the right time? What did that mean? He brought her to a halt. Do we need a full moon? The stroke of midnight? A hundred candles and a priest? You forgot a four-leaf clover. Mina stared at her feet. Hud gently lifted her chin. This sounds like something you've been carrying around alone for a long time. Some secret that's bothering you. Something to do with her dead husband? I understand secrets, Mina. You don't have to tell me. Not now. Maybe not ever. Hud shrugged, trying to act casual despite the tension knotting his shoulder blades. I have things I want to tell you. But now doesn't feel like the right moment either. We're a lot alike. Mina took a step back. I hate that. Why? Because, Mina's expression morphed into one of determination. I'll tell you my deepest, darkest secret if you tell me yours. The one about what happened to make you quit the Senate. Hud was suddenly in need of more air. I'm a coward. Mina sat on a short stool in a small, portable fenced-in area and held a large, white rabbit named Schnookums. She had her chance and hadn't been able to tell Hud the truth about Liam. A few feet away, outside of the bunny pen, Mayor Larry had cornered Hud and was talking his ear off. If it's not broke, don't fix it. The mayor wore a blue and yellow tie-dyed hoodie and an unwavering expression. There's no need for me to retire from politics. Maybe I'm not the right person to talk to about that, Hud said. He'd been on edge since she'd asked him about trading secrets. You know, I did step down from elected office. And by his tone of voice, it still pained Hud to admit it. Mina stroked Schnookum's ears. 
On the other side of the town square, Liam and Maddie were in the considerably larger, baby goat pen, hopping around with the same enthusiasm as the two black baby goats. That's right. Mayor Larry nodded. You quit. Why am I trying to convince you? Not that your feelings should be hurt by that question. You may be a quitter, but you still have usefulness, connections, and such. Although you shouldn't do any public appearances until your black eye heals. Hud sighed. Send me an email and I'll see what I can do. Excellent. The mayor pounded Hud on the back. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got to rub shoulders with my constituents. The mayor scurried off. Hey, Will. Can you spare a minute? There's nothing as humbling as a small town. Am I right? Mina set the bunny down as two youngsters came into the enclosure. She took note of Hud's sad expression and made her exit, needing to comfort him even if she knew it wasn't entirely wise. She rubbed Hud's arm, which was better than hugging him, she supposed. You know the only opinion that counts is your opinion. If I were mayor of San Francisco and I made a difference, I wouldn't be known as a quitter. Hud's gaze struck Mina's hard, the way it had when they'd first met. Tomorrow is Monday, Mina. What are you going to tell Walter? That's none of your business. Her hand fell away. I can't be your campaign manager. Her chin started a downward descent before she course-corrected and lifted it. She had nothing to be ashamed of work-wise. That's all you need to know. Walter has several capable strategists on staff. Hud took her hands, giving them a little shake. But they wouldn't be you. You'd keep me humble. You'd keep me on my toes. But I couldn't make you tell the truth to the world about why you stepped down from elected office. Mina squeezed his hands. Could I? After a moment's hesitation, Hud shook his head. You should go home today. Mina couldn't look him in the eye when she said it. She didn't want him to go. But that was just postponing the inevitable. She stared at her mud-stained sneakers. I'll go home when you want me to leave. Hud lifted her chin ever so gently. You don't want me to leave. Not yet. She couldn't lie about that. No. I don't. Chapter 18 Have you heard from Hud? Vivian asked Graham as he drove her home from church on Sunday afternoon. He usually calls me over the weekend. And he hadn't. Graham pulled out into traffic, clearing his throat. No, ma'am. The last time I saw Hud, he was helping Ms. DeWitt arrange transportation. She discovered a flat tire after her meetings on Friday. That was nice of him. And surprising. Vivian smoothed her skirt over her knees. Are they getting along then? Hud and Mina. It was more like a truce last time I saw them. Graham navigated the Sunday afternoon traffic with ease. The last time you saw them, that struck Vivian as odd. When was the last time you saw them? Friday afternoon. Graham spoke slowly, almost reluctantly. Hud was going to drive her home. I was charged with getting her tire fixed. Vivian waited for more. Because certainly, there had to be more, didn't there? Graham drove the sedan with his usual stoic demeanor, giving away nothing. He was supposed to be her driver, but it was clear where he placed his loyalties. With her son. A feeling of loneliness buzzed through Vivian's head, filling her ears. Samuel had been the son without a filter or a secret. Hud took after Hamilton and had always kept things close to his chest, particularly his feelings. When Hamilton served in the Senate, Vivian had an assistant who kept her ear to the ground. Knowing the details of her family's lives made Vivian feel closer to them. And now. Frustration silenced the buzz in her ears, giving snap to her question. Graham, why didn't you get Mina's vehicle fixed and return to her? Her vehicle was taken care of yesterday, Graham said in a tone that implied he'd taken offense to her thinking he'd neglected his duties. But you didn't deliver it to her. You drove me around yesterday. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure, ma'am. He was so tight-lipped. This was maddening. Who had trained Graham? The CIA? When did you return Mina's vehicle? I haven't, ma'am. Hud told me to hold off for a few days. 
Really? What did that mean? Vivian was struck by a thought. Is HUD spending the weekend with Mina? Trying to convince her to sign on to his campaign? Graham said nothing. And Vivian said nothing back. But she had her answer. Or at least a partial answer. HUD was devoting his weekend to Mina and had delayed the return of her SUV. As soon as Vivian arrived home, she called Walter and explained the situation. What do you think it means? That HUD hasn't convinced Mina yet, Walter said in his most disinterested tone. Vivian was suspicious of that tone. She'd been around politics and politicians enough to know when something sounded fishy. Why is no one telling me the truth? Maybe because no one but Mina and HUD know the truth. Walter cleared his throat. How about we meet for coffee? Will you tell me the truth if I say yes? Viv, I don't have the answers you're looking for. This just wasn't acceptable. You call Mina. I'll call HUD. And we'll compare notes when we have coffee. Slow down, Walter said patiently. Mina won't answer the phone. It's the weekend. Vivian bristled. I find that hard to believe. She works for you. We have an agreement. If we aren't working on a campaign, her weekends are reserved for her son. Walter cleared his throat. It's a generational thing, Viv. Mina's generation wants work-life balance. Oh. She'd heard about that. I'm going to hang up now and call HUD. Or, Walter said quickly before she could disconnect. Or you could come have coffee with me and give those two space to figure things out on their own. Vivian felt frustration ball tighter in her chest, making each breath a staccato punch. Walter, you are the biggest meddler I know. What's going on? But no matter how many times she asked, Walter wouldn't answer. And surprisingly, instead of calling HUD herself, Vivian took Walter's advice. She didn't call HUD. She was going to wait this out. Even if the waiting killed her. Chapter 19 Mina sat at her usual table in Martin's Bakery on Monday morning. She had her hands wrapped around a warm mug filled with aromatic French roast and steamed milk. A small plate in front of her was filled with a warm cinnamon bun. Yes, she'd exaggerated to HUD yesterday morning. There were cinnamon buns at Martin's almost every day. This was her favorite part of Monday. After she dropped Liam at school, she spent a good 30 minutes mentally preparing herself for the week ahead, reviewing her schedule and making lists of tasks to be done. She should have felt relaxed, refreshed, at peace. But there was her email to Walter that needed to be sent. And a very handsome man sat across from her, one who probably didn't want her to send that email. Hud's hair was as black as his coffee and the swollen flesh around his right eye. He'd ordered a bowl of fresh fruit rather than anything decadently sweet and sugary. And those whiskey-colored eyes. Well, the one she could see was just as potent as several shots of their namesake spirit because she was having a hard time finding her equilibrium this morning. Hud's gaze dropped to Mina's cinnamon roll. I'll give you half my fruit for half that bun. It was a nice compromise. She didn't need to eat the entire cinnamon roll and she did need to add more fruits and vegetables into her diet but it was HUD who'd offered. It seemed natural not to readily accept because sometime yesterday, they'd fallen into an unspoken truce where they talked and flirted and basically avoided the territory where they couldn't agree. So, Mina smiled at HUD. You're assuming I want fruit. Yes. And I'm assuming each half is equal in value to you. He lifted his dark brows and gave her a half-smile. Man cannot live on coffee and sweets alone said no campaign strategist ever. Mina was tempted to roll her eyes. Shouldn't you be running your company? I took a personal day. Why not a sick day? He blinked, lopsidedly given his swollen eye. That would be a lie. Or a political take to cover the real reason for your absence. Mina didn't want to talk about fibs and secrets, so she tried to make a joke about it. Otherwise known as a clever spin, had built on her statement. If you two are flirting, that was old man Takata. He sat at the checkerboard waiting for someone to join him for a game. You're bad at it. Hud and Mina stared at each other for, like, five seconds. And then their laughter filled the air. And this was their problem. They liked each other. 
They'd spent the last 48 hours dancing on a knife's edge between professional near-adversaries and two people considering dating. It wasn't sustainable. And yet, Mina couldn't find it in her to put a stop to it. Mina sobered first. I seem to have lost my cutthroat, campaign strategist touch. Hud leaned forward to whisper, after we kissed? Before, she countered, not realizing until too late that hers wasn't the wisest of answers. It would tell him he'd thrown her off kilter earlier in their acquaintance. Looks like the cornhole tourney after school is going to be rained out. Old man Takata glanced out the window. The clouds are rolling in. Mina said about cutting her cinnamon bun in half, resigned to sharing. I drafted an email to Walter last night recommending he choose a third candidate. I thought you were just going to tell him you wouldn't manage my campaign. Hud dished half his fruit onto her plate. I'm wounded. You're too thick-skinned to be mortally wounded. She placed half her bun in his fruit bowl. It's more like you're annoyed that I'm not bending to your will. You'd write a really great speech for me announcing my candidacy, he said evenly, ignoring her tease. Your work is always personal. You know my work? Mina pulled a layer of cinnamon roll free. You aren't the only one capable of doing research. Hud stabbed a piece of cantaloupe. He was probably the kind of guy who ate all his fruits and vegetables before dessert. Although to be honest, Stu sent me examples of your work. Stu, the prickly, little old man she'd met on Friday. Mina suspected Stu had a wide network of media contacts, perhaps even more than she had. Not that it matters. I'm not running Hud's campaign. Something's still bothering you. Hud chose a strawberry next. I'm ready to listen if you need a friendly ear. Likewise. Mina sipped her coffee, took a deep breath. They stared at each other in silence. It wasn't a peaceful silence. But it was revelatory. Here was an obstacle that they couldn't get past. Not with jokes or joined hands or locked lips. Mina pushed her plate away, leaving her fruit untouched. Someone had to be the adult here. I guess this means we're done. I have an email to send. What's your rush? Hud pushed Mina's plate of fruit and cinnamon roll back toward her. They were riding a pendulum. It swung between friendly flirtation and professionals who couldn't work together. Coffee at Martin's had been on the flirtatious side. Hud wasn't ready for the pendulum to swing back. I believe they call this a grown-up decision. Mina eased the plate to her right. Showing up to work and for responsibilities. I need to turn an assignment down. Are you sure? Hud stabbed a banana. I could be the assignment of a lifetime. The man of her lifetime. Mina shook her head. Whatever she couldn't bring herself to tell him yesterday was the reason she wouldn't work on his campaign. He was certain of it. Hud pushed the untouched half of cinnamon bun in his otherwise empty fruit bowl toward the middle of the table. You're going to miss out on all this. Hud spread his arms wide. And a chance to beat Roger. Mina laughed. I'll enjoy watching it from the sidelines. She wasn't budging. He should have known she wouldn't. She was principled. Fine. You tell me yours and I'll tell you mine. And then we'll decide how my campaign should proceed. If she could understand the choice he'd made, he hoped he could understand whatever she felt wouldn't allow her to work for him. That's a fair deal, the old man at the checkerboard said. I'll tell you mine if you play me a game of checkers, Mina. Mr. Takata, Mina smiled sweetly. Could you pretend not to listen? That'll be mighty hard. The old man smacked his lips. All my regular opponents haven't shown up today and you're the only other ones in the bakery. Ah. Uh. My grandmother went to Cloverdale this morning to buy some plants, Mina said. Where are all the other regulars? Hud probably scared them away. The old man blew out a breath. Since we're alone, I'm wondering where Hud got that shiner. Word on the street is you gave it to him, Mina. It wasn't me. Mina held up her hands, smiling the way she should have been smiling at Hud. My offer still stands. Hud stood, because clearly they needed more privacy than they had here. Truth for truth. Stop. Hud touched Mina's arm on the silent walk home from Martin's bakery. 
he knelt at her feet and tied her flopping tennis shoelaces. Mina hadn't even noticed they were untied. But the fact that Hud had and the fact that he'd tied them for her implied something about their relationship that she didn't want to acknowledge. There were clouds overhead and more to the west, promising rain. The very air felt thick from the upcoming storm, both by Mother Nature and the one that would brew when she confessed her secret to Hud. And Mina suspected now was the time to come clean before things between she and Hud got more complicated. Hud glanced up at her. I want to talk. Mina was suddenly speechless. Hud sat on the curb and patted a spot next to him. Have a seat. No offense to your grandmother, but I can't talk with all those plants around her living room and kitchen. Mina sat down, taking note of the neat knot he'd made with her laces. The reason I stepped down two years ago, Hud cleared his throat, laying his hands on his knees. In shorts, tennis shoes, and a purple tie-dye hoodie, he looked like just a guy who drank beer and ate hot wings on a Friday night with his buddies. I want to tell you so that. So that you'll know why I don't want to talk about the details to the press. You don't have to tell me, Hud. Me or anyone. Mina touched his hand briefly. Hud would be leaving soon. Her answer about working with him wasn't any different than it had been Friday. But what had changed was her compassion toward him. He seemed haunted by the past. And she didn't want him suffering. You don't have to tell anyone if you don't run. Perhaps when you make peace with the past, you'll find you have no stomach for politics anymore. I am not a quitter. Hud frowned. I left office because I had to. Mina stilled. Someone forced you out of office? Were you blackmailed? This was worse than she'd thought and opened an enormous can of worms. No. Not blackmail, Hud said with a big dose of the groompies. It would have been easier if that's what it was. Mina placed her hand over one of his. Tell me. A family was playing with a Labrador in the town square. Their two toddler children squealed and ran after the dog and the ball it carried in its mouth. Two parents. Two children. A dog. Everything she'd wanted as a child when she naively believed in love. Hud glanced toward the town square. I was never involved with the family business. My parents always had other responsibilities for me. Like backing your run for San Francisco City Council at age 25? He'd lost that race. Hud nodded. My father pushed hard for my early career. If only he'd paid as much attention to the family business. Back then, the success of our company guaranteed I'd never have to work a regular day job. McLeod Incorporated was run by businessmen, not by the family. I don't think a McLeod had made a daily management decision since my great-grandfather's time. There's nothing wrong with that, Mina said carefully, knowing that Hud had stepped down because of something related to the family business and legislation he'd passed. There's nothing right with that. Hudson paused, shaking his head. When the rumors first broke that our company had benefited from legislation I authored, I didn't believe it. I went back to my office in D.C. that night and scrutinized the bill, comparing what I'd written to what had finally been signed. She nodded. Anne. Hud glanced once more toward the town square and the happy family. There was a rider on the bill that was attributed to me but that I hadn't written. She nodded again. So you looked into it? I should have noticed it before I signed. I, Hud took a deep breath, keeping his gaze averted, almost as if he couldn't bear to see her reaction to what he said next. But I didn't. You know how it is in politics. There are meetings upon meetings. Barely a minute to spare in the day, much less reread the fine print of what you originally wrote and what a party leader assures you has minimal changes and is worth voting for. Mina nodded. Hud rolled his shoulders back. There was a lobbyist for the garment industry who'd taken the McLeod CEO and me to lunch a few times. He'd submitted several suggestions for legislation, but I wasn't familiar with this new piece. It lifted sanctions from companies who were using child labor in other countries. His voice firmed, strengthened. I'd never support that. Ever. It's sickening. I read about that, but it was never proven that McLeod followed those practices. Right. His nod was tight. Dismissive. But the damage to my career was done. 
And to your point yesterday, it was possibly exacerbated by the fact that I didn't talk about it in the press or my colleagues. I shut down because I felt as if I wasn't living up to the McLeod standards. Nothing I put forth in the Senate after that went through. Senators on both sides of the aisle distanced themselves from me. You know how dysfunctional Congress can get sometimes. I was dead weight, useless to the people who'd elected me to serve. Mina considered his words and what she knew of him. They'd made you a lame duck, which you hated. He fisted his hands. Power is a terrible thing to waste. How could I draw a salary for not doing anything? And my mother? My mother had never quite recovered from Samuel's death. And then people in her circles began to shun her. She retreated even more. Mina squeezed his hand. You felt trapped, so you stepped down. Yes. Hud didn't relax. His fingers didn't unfurl from hers. And that's when my eyes were really opened. I felt the need to investigate our company, to make sure everything had been done above board. And? There was a deep crease to his brow that worried her. Let's just say I didn't like what I found. You asked me how that time in my life made me feel. I was distraught, disappointed in myself, and alone, because I couldn't tell anyone for fear of tainting the family legacy even more. Hud's voice grew hard and cold. I fired the CEO and others in charge. I took over the company. I made everything we do right, protecting children overseas in the process. But making a profit isn't what gets me up in the morning. It's service. Public service. Making sure that people are safe and have a chance to better themselves. His voice softened. He brought her hand to his chest, splaying her fingers over his heart, pressing her hand closer until she could feel his heart beat through his hoodie. You can tell me that those are the values I was raised with. You can tell me that there are other ways to serve than elected office. But I can't give up on that yet. I can't seem to shake the idea that elected office is where I belong. And where I can solidify my legacy. Mina's head was spinning. Hud wasn't at fault in theory. He hadn't been running the company or made the changes to the legislation. But he was at fault in principle. He should have reread the bill. And someone in his family should have kept a closer eye on the family's business operations. But he'd admitted to being gutted. And she, like him, had the inexplicable desire to influence public policy for the well-being of others. She wanted him to succeed. If only she was confident he could succeed without her. If only Liam wasn't a danger to Hud's pride and legacy. I have to ask what you think of me, Mina. Not what his chances were. Not if she was willing to come to work for him. The sun broke through the clouds, warm on her face. His hands were warm around hers. And her heart. Her heart was whispering things it hadn't in years, things she didn't want to put into context, not when her hand was still over his heart. Not when I naively jumped into a relationship with his brother. Mina drew a deep breath. I think you should tell people what you're feeling more often. It makes you so much more, lovable. No. Not lovable. Relatable. Relatable? Hud scoffed softly. You want honesty? Something that will help you relate to how I'm feeling or what kind of man I am. All right. I feel like we could make a life together, a life filled with public service, even if you won't be my campaign manager. And I, I feel like I need to kiss you again, Mina, to reassure myself that I'm worthy of love. Of your love. I need to stop this. I need to be professional. I don't believe in love, and he doesn't know about Liam. But something inside of Mina was rebelling against professional standards and personal distance. Something, her heart maybe, was urging her to throw caution to the wind and believe in fairy tales. They could work this out. They could put a spin on Liam and Samuel. The sun disappeared behind a cloud and raindrops began to fall. Mina couldn't bring herself to move, not forward or back. But she could speak. A little. And so, she whispered, what are you waiting for? Kiss me. Chapter 20 Cherise had lied to Mina this morning. She wasn't going plant shopping in Cloverdale. And all during the drive to Santa Rosa, she had regrets. I'm not the kind of person who lies. 
She was the kind of person who told people the hard truth. She told her friend Eunice 20 years ago that cleavage wasn't sexy in your 60s. 15 years ago, she told her daughter that Mina needed more stability when Mina was about to enter high school and her daughter and son-in-law were relocating to a new country and renegotiating their marriage. Being a teenager was hard enough without constantly trying to make new friends and ducking one's head at home. Ten years ago, she'd held on to husband Toby's hand when the doctor delivered his third cancer diagnosis. And when Toby looked at her seeking hope, she'd shaken her head as the tears spilled over her cheeks. Why lie? She'd never seen the point. And now, she was slinking across the county like a thief in the night. Cherise adjusted the windshield wipers, having driven into the next rainstorm. It was a downpour. And then she shifted in her car seat, eliciting a spasm of pain that radiated from her hip down the back of her leg. She groaned, panting as she shifted to a less painful position. The man on the phone, the one she'd contacted off a flyer in her mailbox, had promised her a quicker way to take the weight off. Come into the office, he'd said when she hesitated. We help people your age lose weight all the time, he'd said when she hemmed and hawed about people her age not having bypass surgery. You'll be amazed at how quickly the weight goes off, he'd said when she expressed doubt. After all, people her age were more likely to die on the operating table. But she was in so much pain. Increasingly so. And the doctor wouldn't even schedule hip replacement surgery until she lost more weight. We have a monthly payment plan, the salesman had said when she'd gasped at the price. And because Cherise was tired of pain and wasn't losing weight, she was willing to believe the impossible. It was hard to drive. Hard to sleep. Hard to cook and garden. What was the point in living if the doctor wouldn't give her a new, pain-free hip? And now I'm a liar and a winner. She drew a deep breath, feeling a little lightheaded. A little slow. She hadn't eaten breakfast. Outside, the traffic was moving fast on the freeway, despite the steady downpour. The truck in front of her on the freeway slammed on its brakes. Cherise sucked in a breath, her reaction slow, because... Chapter 21 Hud kissed Mina tenderly, which was surprising. Tender kisses weren't his style. But she'd whispered, what are you waiting for? Kiss me. That whisper. His admission of what happened two years ago. Her acceptance of it. Hud's emotions were exposed. He was vulnerable. But she'd seemed so, too. And so, tenderness was called for. Because I'm falling in love. That didn't mean his hands didn't dive into her hair, reveling in the texture of her soft, springy curls, but careful of that lump on the back of her head. It didn't mean that her hands didn't steal around his waist, pulling him closer. And their tender kiss by no means meant that his breathing didn't turn ragged. Nor hers. Toot toot. Someone drove past, honking. Laughing. Slowly, had ended the kiss, resting his forehead against Mina's, careful of his black eye, and taking a moment to collect himself. Toot toot toot. Another car drove past. Hud got to his feet, drawing Mina to hers. We need more privacy, not to mention it's raining. His hair was damp, and the rain was increasing in intensity. Wait. Her arms came around his neck and she kissed him without tenderness or hesitation. Mina kissed him the way he'd been longing to kiss her. With feeling. With intensity. The way you did when you first realized you were really into the other person. Into? He wasn't just into Mina. I love Mina. The thought should have scared him. She had yet to share her secret and he had yet to convince her to run his campaign. Love had no place in politics. Toot toot. Mina ended their kiss. You're right. We need to get home. She turned and power walked toward her grandmother's house. He caught up to her easily and matched her stride. Are you going to tell me your truth when we get there? She came to a sudden halt on a street corner, staring at her shoes, not him. My parents raised me to be honest and to live honorably. And I, she bit her lip, flipping up her hood over all that gloriously curly, wet hair. As you know, it's hard in this industry to, be transparent. No one's perfect. I try to live up to their standards. But, no one is perfect. 
HUD wasn't sure why she sounded so hopeless, as if she was going to confess she was an embezzler or an axe murderer, but he nodded anyway. I understand what you did two years ago, HUD. You wanted to do the right thing and regain control of your life. But I also know that as a man who values his privacy that there are probably other instances where you quietly fix something to protect your family. Mina glanced toward the now empty town square with what he interpreted as longing. And then her gaze returned to HUD, shadowed with sorrow. I'm no different than you are. I've done things to protect my family. I can't go to work for you, not because of this attraction between us, but because the specter of my past will resurface and derail your campaign. It will be the secrets you and I have, waiting to be told, that endanger your chances. She hung her head. I worry about that. And you should, too. Whatever Mina was hiding in her past must have been bad because there were tears in her eyes. He'd seen them before she looked down. Hud took her into his arms. You can't worry about the past, Mina. It's the future that needs your emotional energy. Face in his chest, she shook her head. If it helps, you can tell me what's bothering you. Let me be the judge of how damaging this secret might be. With her head still hidden in his chest, Mina drew a deep breath, as if preparing to share everything. But she didn't get the chance to speak. Her cell phone rang. Grandma Beam. Mina rushed into the emergency room in Santa Rosa where they were treating her grandmother. Are you all right? I'm fine, Grandma Beam reassured Mina, taking her hand. She had a goose egg on her forehead, and four in the back of her hand, and leads connecting to a bedside monitor. I've got a bump on my head and a bruise on my pride. She glanced behind Mina. Where's Hud? Did he drive you here or did you steal his Ferrari? Hud drove me. He's waiting in the lobby. Mina tenderly fingercombed her grandmother's hair back into place, being careful not to touch her bruise. She'd been so close to telling Hud the truth when the call came in and couldn't decide if the interruption was divine intervention or a short-term reprieve. What are you doing down here in Santa Rosa? I thought you were going to a nursery in Cloverdale. Which was much closer. I. Uh. Grandma Beam released Mina's hand, looking embarrassed. You're keeping secrets from me? Mina gently teased. Do you have a boyfriend in Santa Rosa? Or were you driving off in search of an exotic houseplant? No. Neither of those. A woman in scrubs entered, pushing a computer on a portable stand, time to update your vitals, Cherise. She smiled at Mina before logging into the computer. Who's this? My granddaughter. Ah. Uh. The one who lives with you. The nurse tapped the keys in rapid succession before turning and studying the monitor next to Grandma Beam's bed, jotting numbers on a scrap of paper. She's the family member you indicated was allowed to stay during medical discussions. That's the one, Grandma Beam said wearily. Everyone else is either dead or in a foreign country. The nurse turned back to her computer, entering information. So, your granddaughter knows about your medical mission this morning and your diabetes? No. What? What mission? Mina gripped the bed rail, trying to process this news and decide how to react other than panic. And when were you diagnosed with diabetes? Are you on insulin? Why didn't you tell me? Grandma Beam pursed her lips. The nurse returned to her grandmother's bedside. We need a blood sugar reading. Just a little poke. She efficiently wielded a finger stick and then a test strip to obtain a blood sample, which she inserted into a small reader. I don't like pokes, big or small, Grandma Beam said testily. I know when my blood sugar is too low or too high. I can tell. I've lived over 80 years in this body. I should know if things are off or not. Your blood sugar was too low at the time of the accident. The nurse spared Mina a glance. She was below 80 when she came in. She probably would have been lower, but the EMTs started in 4 because she wasn't responding coherently. That's concerning. Mina knew a lot about diabetes. The cost of insulin was a hot topic nowadays, and every politician worth their salt needed to have a position on the issue. But she had a lot of catching up to do when it came to her grandmother and diabetes. Could she afford her insulin? Was her fear of needles keeping her from managing it properly? 
So many questions. But Mina knew she couldn't conduct an interrogation, not now. She had to be supportive and gentle. Mina took her grandmother's hand once more. I'm here for you. Tell me what's going on. Everything all right, sir? Graham exchanged keys with HUD in the Santa Rosa Hospital parking lot on Monday afternoon. The rain had abetted, and the air felt fresh and new. You want me to track someone down? Graham gestured to HUD's black eye and then cracked his knuckles. You should have seen the other guy, HUD quipped. I'm joking. Mina and I bumped heads. I guess mine isn't as hard as some people think. I'm here because of Mina's grandmother. She was in a car accident. She's supposed to be released in an hour. Which meant at least two hours in real time. HUD took note of Mina's new tires. Hers had needed replacing and he'd authorized Graham to purchase a set. You put my travel bag in back? Yes, sir. Your mother said she packed your suitcase for any contingency. He gave HUD's tie-dyed hoodie a wry smile. It was all I could find in Mina's small town, HUD said by way of explanation. He'd driven Mina to the hospital in Santa Rosa and stayed to support her, bringing her coffee and lunch, offering to drive to Harmony Valley to pick up Liam, being thanked and told repeatedly that he should return to the city. Upon arriving in Santa Rosa, he'd called his mother and asked her to gather some things for Graham to bring out when he brought Mina's SUV. HUD checked the time on his phone. This political consultant, Mina. Graham paused. She seems like a good person? A question? Yeah, she's good people. Perplexing to him, but good, nonetheless. And the way she felt in his arms. In all the rush to reach Cherise at the hospital, Hud had forgotten Mina's confession that her secret could mean his political downfall. He wanted to believe that wasn't true. But as a political strategist, Mina would know what was damaging and what wasn't. That's great. Graham fidgeted, probably anxious to get back to the city. He wasn't an overly demonstrative person and seemed more comfortable behind the wheel. Thanks for getting all this done so quickly, Hud said briskly. Graham had been a friend of Samuel's in the military and had been injured when Samuel died. He had a metal plate in his head and a prosthetic leg from the left knee down. After his discharge, he'd come to pay his respects and Hud had hired him. As usual, you've gone above and beyond. It's my job, sir. Smiling, Graham gestured toward the Ferrari, which Hud had parked far away from everyone else. It helps that most cars you have are a pleasure to drive. I'll be careful with it. I wouldn't expect any less. Hud said, goodbye, and returned to the hospital lobby, waiting for Mina's call to bring her vehicle around when Cherise was released. Back in Harmony Valley, he'd been on the brink of finding out what obstacle he faced with Mina. He loved Mina. He hoped whatever secret she'd been hiding was something they could get past. Together. The quick afternoon storm had passed. Yet another one was rolling in. Hud drove Mina's SUV without needing the windshield wipers. He drove slowly but inside the wheels of his brain were turning. What in Mina's past could be so devastating to my career? The closer he came to her small town, the closer he felt he'd be to the answer. I feel like a queen, sitting in the back seat and being driven home by my handsome chauffeur. Cherise chuckled. After the day you had, you deserve some TLC, Hud told her. Enjoy it while you can grandma. Because we're going to have to talk about losing weight via dieting rather than gastric bypass. Mina had been frustrated the entire ride after learning her grandmother had made an appointment with a clinic to have the medical procedure. Apparently, frustration kept her awake in cars. That surgery isn't for people who only need to lose 15 or 20 pounds. There are no shortcuts to your health. Well, there should be, Cherise countered, clearly doing well after the accident that had totaled her car. I hate pokes and needles and bum hips. Oh, look. We're home. Hud had been playing peacemaker for over an hour. He pulled into the driveway of Cherise's house in Harmony Valley. The green ranch had white and black trim and fabulously landscaped yards, front and back. And if living in a greenhouse wasn't Hud's thing? Well, it was Cherise's. He wouldn't complain. Her hospitality had allowed him to fall in love with Mina. 
You can't tell anyone that you made me sit in the back seat, Hud, Mina grumped. If Walter hears about this. You still want to argue? We're home. Episode over. Hud turned off the engine and hurried around to open Charisse's door. Admit it, Mina. You would have turned around the entire drive home to check on your grandmother since she refused to sit in the front. You should be thanking me because you don't have a kink in your neck. He helped Cherise out of the back seat. The big bruise on her forehead was an angry, purplish red color. We're like colorful bookends, Cherise. You let me know if the world tilts on its axis. Although she'd been cleared of a concussion, Hud held onto her arm as they walked slowly up the walk. Mina opened the front door. Grandma, we'll get you settled in your bed. Where all invalids go, Cherise said ruefully, continuing in a quiet voice, meant only for him, there goes my freedom. Mark my words, Hud, she'll clean out the kitchen of all my favorite foods next. I should probably do a sugar cleanse of the kitchen after we get you settled, Mina called from inside, as predicted. See? Cherise huffed. Hud laughed. The elderly woman tried to elbow him but only succeeded in doing a dangerous bob and weave. It won't be so funny when your grandchildren take charge of your life, Hud. That's a long way off. And an idea he didn't usually dwell upon, not having met the right woman. He looked inside, seeking sight of the intriguing woman with a firm hold on his heart. You don't mind if I extend my stay, do you? Why would I complain about that? Cherise grunted as she lifted her foot higher to cross the front threshold. You bought Mina new tires and took care of her all day in the hospital. She paused, half in and half out of the door, looking him in his good eye. You like Mina, don't you? Beyond what she can do for you politically? No question. He would have professed his love for her granddaughter if Mina hadn't appeared in the hallway next to a row of pots with four-foot trees in them. Mina rushed forward. Why did you stop? Do I need to check your blood sugar? No, Cherise said firmly, moving slowly inside next to a narrow hall table filled with plants whose tendrils spilled over and grew toward the floor. Before breakfast, lunch, and before dinner. That's what the doctor said about the pokes. Mina leaned against the wall, crossing her arms, readying for battle. But. I know I shouldn't have fallen for that man's sales pitch about gastric bypass, Cherise cut her granddaughter off. I should have at least asked my doctor. But that doesn't mean you need to coddle me. Nobody's going to coddle you, Cherise. Hud escorted her across the living room and toward Mina. We'll get you into bed and leave you alone until dinner. Mina frowned. I'll be checking on you regularly. Every thirty minutes or so. Every hour, Cherise countered, chewing Mina out of her way with a wave of her hand. That's my final offer. You drive a hard bargain, Grandma. Mina led the way to the old woman's bedroom with Hud and Cherise following. After Hud helped Cherise to her bed, he left the women to get settled and went to the SUV to retrieve his bag. A newer model SUV pulled up front. Corey, Mina's willowy, blonde friend, got out, giving Hud a surprised look. I didn't think you'd be here after school let out. She opened the back door. Liam, your chess friend is still here. Hud. Once Liam was free of his seatbelt, he ran across the lawn, tripped over seemingly nothing, and barreled into Hud's legs. For once, he didn't have a hood, mask, hat, or sunglasses over his face. Grinning, the kid threw his head back and stared up at Hud. Wanna play chess? And then he giggled, a gleeful, rolling sound. A familiar cadence. A familiar, high-pitched cascade of pure joy. Samuel's laugh. His childhood giggle. Liam's dark curls ruffled in the breeze. His caramel-colored eyes crinkled at the corners the way Samuel's had, as if he'd been born to laugh. His chin had a developing dimple. His nose wasn't going to be pert or stubby. And those long limbs. Where's your daddy? Hud had asked Liam. He died. And Liam hadn't looked crushed by the statement because he was only five and Samuel had died nearly six years ago. Yes, I dated Samuel. Yes, he broke my heart. In a way. In an unexpected way. This was Mina's secret, the one she claimed would derail his political career. She was right. The world tilted on its axis. 
Hud, did you hear me? Liam shook Hud's legs, nearly knocking him over. Wanna play chess? How could Hud concentrate on chess when he was only just catching on to the game set out before him? Mina's game. Mina's secret. I love her. But could that love survive this? Goodbye, Liam. Corey called as she put her SUV into gear. See you at school in the morning, Michael called. Feminine laughter drifted from the house. Bye. Liam ran inside, chess match apparently forgotten. Mommy? Grandma Beam? Where are you? Samuel is Liam's father. Hud followed his nephew at a slower pace, putting the pieces of Mina's secret together. This had to be the reason she didn't want to work his campaign. She'd said she had as much to lose about the truth being uncovered as he did. And she'd seemed touchier about him saying she'd work on his campaign after each kiss, each of his confidences. The press and his opponents, like Roger, would have a field day if it was known Hud was dating his dead brother's baby mama. It would take center stage over every policy issue, every piece of legislation he proposed. He wouldn't get anything done. It would be worse than the last time. Hud stared at his hands, seeing his political legacy slipping through his fingers. And Mina. Where could they possibly go from here? The answer was nowhere. Chapter 22 Hey! What are you doing in here? Mina entered her bedroom after she'd rid the kitchen of all things sugary and sweet. Hud sat at her desk, a framed picture in his hand. A picture she should have hidden away. And he looked, hurt. Because he knows. Legs failing her, Mina sat on the bed, knowing she had no choice now but to tell all, wondering where to start. Liam and Grandma Beam are watching a movie in her bedroom. They both looked wiped out from the activities of the day. Hud held the framed photograph toward her, his action causing her desk chair to roll back toward the bed. Mina took it from him, staring at Samuel's smiling face so close to hers. Graham had taken the picture with her phone. She brushed her fingers over the glass. I don't like to keep secrets. She set the frame in her lap and faced him. I think that's why I kept this photo around. Hud rested his elbows on his knees and put his head in his hands. Don't shy away from hard things. Her father's voice came back to her. Mina couldn't tell what he was thinking or what he thought of her. But she knew what needed to be said first. I'm sorry. We met on a military base overseas a few weeks before he died. I, she stared at Samuel's picture again. His devil-may-care smile. His proud posture and short, military haircut. It happened just like you described with those other women. Samuel swept me off my feet. But it wasn't, surface level. We talked about everything. His upbringing. His relationship with your family. Politics. Living in foreign countries. His need to find a place in life where he could be his own person. Hud didn't look up. So, Mina continued in a low voice, I was only 24. I just finished an internship in D.C. and needed a break. The pace and the work had been exhilarating. But the backstabbing and feeling that she didn't fit in with that crowd had been painful. I thought visiting my parents would be relaxing. But on the base, memories of not fitting in came roaring back. And when Samuel offered to buy me a drink at the bar. Hud sighed. Mina wished she could see his face. I ended up staying an extra week. And then I flew home. But when I landed, he was, gone. Killed in a military exercise. And in the aftermath of media coverage, I didn't know if what we'd had was real. The same way she couldn't tell if what she was beginning to feel for Hud was real. And then, Liam. Hud raised his head, a haunted expression in his eyes. You should have come to us. She took his hand, leaning closer. And you would have treated me with the same suspicion and disregard that you gave those other women. His expression was still shattered. I want a DNA test done. Mina fought to stay calm. You're assuming I want Liam to be an official part of your family, she said as gently as she could. You're assuming I want something from your family. I don't. I want Liam to decide who he wants to be, not have to live up to his family's legacy before he has a chance to decide if that's important to him. 
That's what Samuel would have wanted. That's what Samuel wanted for himself. Hud's gaze dropped to their joined hands and his tone dropped to dangerous territory, sharp and full of recrimination. And my mother? You'd deprive her of a grandchild? If your position and hers were reversed. I'd want to know. Mina nodded, feeling tears burn behind her eyes. But his last name isn't McLeod. His birth certificate says, Father Unknown. Hud's gaze hardened. This is why you didn't want to work with me. Not a question. That didn't mean there wasn't hurt and anger in his tone. Yes. That's why. Would you still have been against my running for mayor if Liam hadn't been in the picture? Yes. You want to run for yourself, for your legacy, for your pride, not to serve. Hud's chin jutted out. You wanted me to come clean to the world about my past. How hypocritical. True, Mina struggled to keep her voice even, to keep her chin up but not out. She'd known this day would come. She understood Hud's hurt. And she hated that she was the cause of it. In my defense, I had good reason to keep Liam a secret. Hud waved her words angrily aside with a swipe of his hand. And you almost told me about Liam this morning. Yes. And then the hospital had called. If it wasn't for his black eye, his frown would have cut a deep swath across her heart. You said you despised secrets and dishonorable behavior. And that everyone makes mistakes. Mina nodded. Even me. I'm sorry, she said again because it bore repeating. I can drive you into the city tonight. And I'll pay you back for those tires. He shook his head. No. I'm going to stay. I'm going to get to know my nephew. And my mother will know her grandson. And you and I, he swallowed thickly. There's still my need for a campaign manager. He couldn't possibly think. Hud. I can trust you, Mina, he said quietly, getting to his feet. Because we both have something to lose if our truths get out. And then he walked out. Out of her room. Out the front door. But not out of her life. You look like a man who could use something stronger than a beer. Hud sat on a barstool in El Rosal, the colorful Mexican restaurant across the street from the town square and down the street from Martin's Bakery. He was trying to process Mina's bombshell, trying to tell himself he didn't love her and that his political career wasn't over. He'd been hoping for some peace and quiet, some time to mourn. Instead, he got a blonde man similar in age to him with the urge to chat. Hud glanced around the restaurant, but all the tables were taken. He had nowhere to move to. His new, as yet unnamed, friend had a shrewd look on his face while he studied Hud. And then he flagged down the bartender. Hey, Arturo. Mr. McLeod will have a shot of whiskey, plus one of those craft beers without any fancy flavors. Oh, and a plate of beef nachos. Hud started to protest the order, but given his mood, it was actually appropriate. It would be nice to get rip-roaring drunk and console his broken heart with junk food. Thanks. And your name is? Chad. Just Chad. Chad sipped his beer, smiling a little as he pointed toward Hud's swollen eye. I guess I should have seen the other guy? Very funny. Hud gently touched the swelling beneath his eye. That's supposed to be my line. Hey, Chad. Mayor Larry was sitting at a nearby table. He wagged his finger back and forth in the universal gesture for no no no. Don't be doing what I think you're doing. That's the furthest thing from my mind. Chad laughed. It was a borderline slick laugh. Not as bad as Roger's, but not entirely genuine in feeling. Want to clue me in on the joke? Hud glanced around once more, looking for a different place to sit, still finding none. The joke, Chad sobered. The joke is actually on me. I've only been a resident for about six months, but I got off on the wrong foot here. And the residents in Harmony Valley won't let me forget it. He drew a deep breath and held his beer glass up to clink against Hud's shot glass. It's why I know what to order at El Rosal when a man is flummoxed. Thanks. Hud down the shot in one gulp. He took a pull from his beer next before giving Chad another clink of the glass, this time with his beer. Flummoxed isn't a word you hear every day. Are you a teacher? 
Chad flinched back in mock horror. No. I'm a blogger. Formerly a newspaper columnist. It was Hud's turn to flinch back. In real horror. The last thing he needed was someone from the news. Never fear, Mr. McLeod. I'm a fan of yours. And no longer a reporter, Chad was quick to explain. Perhaps you've heard of my column? The happy bachelor settles down? Hud shook his head. Huh. So much for my supposed reader demographic. Chad chuckled. Single men? Hud guessed. Single men who enjoy the good life, fast, expensive sports cars, and dining in fine eating establishments and have now found love. Chad leaned in conspiratorially. I heard you drive a Ferrari. And that you were spotted kissing a local this morning. Last spring, I was spotted kissing a local. Not long after, I traded in a similar ride as yours for a minivan. Ouch. I can assure you that is not happening to me. Hud tapped his beard to Chad's once more. Here's to the success of your blogging venture. Chad's gaze drifted to a table filled with young women and he smiled fondly at someone. Thanks. I'm feeling pretty lucky. And then he sat up. But I'm remiss in my bachelor duties. You came in looking like you'd lost your Ferrari, your best friend, and your dog. The truth about Mina, Samuel, and Liam came crashing back in all its gut-wrenching glory. The shot of whiskey had done nothing to ease the blow. I can't believe I fell in love with her. Yeah, my head's a mess, Hud admitted. Mina. Samuel. Liam. Mom. My campaign. My duty. My pride. Everything was all a jumble. I can't believe I don't know how to react to all this. What to prioritize. What to cling to. What to let go of. Hud sighed. He couldn't believe Mina had even shown up on Friday at the McLeod offices. That took guts. Hey, don't get on mom's case about going to formal teas and fashion shows, Samuel had told Hud one day in D at C, she's working to make things easier for dad and to protect us. To protect you, Hud had said. Their mother was always putting Samuel first. Just like Mina. Guilt mingled with the beer hitting his gut. Hud preferred to see things in black and white. But this situation he and Mina were in. It was all a different shade of gray. Despite drinking too much beer on an empty stomach, Hud took another sip. The beer was cold and offered no clarity. And why would it? The restaurant itself was sensory overload. Above the back of the bar, a football game was playing on television. The walls, tables, and chairs were painted a variety of primary colors, red, blue, yellow, green. Cheery pop music rained down on him from a speaker in the ceiling. The chatter from the patrons created more background noise. Not to mention, someone was singing in the kitchen. Mina. Samuel. Liam. Mom. My legacy. There would be no painted portrait on his office wall. No author seeking him out to write his biography. Hud didn't know what to do. Who to tell. What to negotiate with Mina. Because surely, this called for a negotiation. Not a compromise. There was only one clear thought in Hud's head. He had to control the narrative moving forward. You know, if you need a friendly ear. I'm fine. Mina. Samuel. Liam. Mom. You could talk to Ori. Chad pointed to an elderly woman who was slowly eating a plate of green enchiladas. My fiancé told me she used to be the school nurse, back when schools had school nurses. I bet she's a good listener. And, bonus, her short-term memory is going. Chad tapped his temple. In case you have some state secrets that need sorting. She'll forget by bedtime. I'm no longer privy to state secrets, Hud said absently. And even if she'd forget by bedtime, she might tell someone in between. The population over age 60 in Harmony Valley was a talkative bunch. You really need those nachos. Chad finished his beer, tossed a 10 on the bar, and then slid off his bar stool as the woman who'd worked the bakery counter at Martin's this morning got up from the table of women and approached them. Chad spared Hud a sly glance. I'll let you in on a secret, Mr. McLeod. 
Those nachos that are coming are Italian-Mexican nachos, not the ballpark variety. And the special dinner menu? Also Italian-Mexican. There are chefs in the kitchen. Chad placed a hand on Hud's shoulder. Harmony Valley is a deceptive place. It's also a place to heal once you get those heavy burdens of the past off your shoulders. I hope you can find happiness here. I need another car aficionado to talk to while we load our minivans at the grocery mart. Good luck, buddy. Chad turned and gave the bakery counter woman an all-encompassing hug. Hi babe, did you enjoy ladies' night out? Yep. She kissed him. And now. It's couple's night. The couple moved toward the door. The happy bachelor really was settling down. Hud smiled ruefully, taking time to ponder Chad's advice. Not because it was earth-shattering but because his was the only new voice in Hud's head. Can I find happiness? With Mina? Impossible. Mina wanted privacy. His mother would want visitation. But if mom took Liam anywhere, everyone would know that Liam was a McLeod. While Hud's past mistakes could be glossed over with, no comment, Mina's indiscretion would give rise to an unending wave of questions. Hud's nachos arrived. He dug into light cheese and flavorful pesto. Italian-Mexican nachos. They were surprisingly good. Not as heavy as regular nachos but still offering junk food comfort. But even junk food didn't solve Hud's situation. There were too many complications. Hud still wanted the best person available to run his campaign for mayor. That would be Mina. But she was right. That would be risky. The football game ended. A few people left. Conversations and laughter flowed around him. And still, he had no answers. Mina slid onto the barstool next to Hud as he was near finishing the nachos and his beer. I got worried. You okay? No, Hud frowned. But I didn't call the press with the news. Or my lawyer. Or my mother. So, you're not okay. Mina took his beer bottle and drank the last sip. She asked the bartender for two more beers. We don't have to figure things out tonight. She poked around his plate, filling a chip with cheese, meat and jalapeno. She ate delicately, without making a mess of her face or fingers. And that includes how you feel about me and the choices I made. She met his gaze, an apology in her eyes. It was hard for Hud not to turn on his stool and put his arms around her. Somehow, he managed to sit still. But he couldn't keep everything in. I can't believe I still want to kiss you. What did that say about his muddled feelings? Hud turned his head, looking Mina in the eye. I guess it's true. Mina quirked her brows. Through thick and thin, till death do you part. Hud shrugged, not feeling an iota of romance. I love you, Mina. You can't love me. Mina cried loud enough for the people in El Rosal to hear. She hunched over the bar, cold hands in her lap. Hud leaned closer, frowning in a most upsetting way. Why can't I love you? Unlike Mina, he didn't shout. But he was no less upset about the L word than she was. Mina placed a hand on his forearm and whispered, You can't love me because we argue. We debate, Hud countered, frown easing. Oh, he was infuriating in his certainty. Mina tried again. You can't love me because we want different things out of life. You want a public life and I want a private one. We want the same things when it matters, he was dogged in his defense of love. We want a better world, personal health and happiness, what's best for Liam. It was a relief to hear him say that. You can't love me because. Stop saying that. Hud turned his hand over and laced his fingers with hers. You can't police how people feel. And don't even attempt to give me another reason I can't love you because I already know what you were going to say. Mina tried very hard to give him a scornful look. But there were his fingers entwined with hers, and his persistence regarding his depth of affection for her. Hud inched closer. You know that I know that you are going to remind me that you don't believe in love. Mina blew a raspberry. He was right, of course. But he said it as if her lack of belief in love carried the same legitimacy of someone who believed in UFOs, this is not the conversation I thought we'd be having when I came over here. 
Maybe it should be, Hud said, leaning back and giving her space. Maybe that's how we move forward. He stared at their joined hands, which were resting on his thigh. Maybe we need to acknowledge that the reason we're so much alike and yet so different is that we're meant to be together. We're meant to figure this out. He loves me. He wants to be with me. Mina felt unsteady. Unsure. She'd started a relationship with Samuel without hearing those words. And yet, here she was wanting to reject Hud's reasoning. Not because she didn't care for him. But because there was still a boy to be considered, a precious little boy who deserved to come first. Before Mina. And before Hud. Where do we go from here? Mina asked, because she didn't know. She'd been half hoping that Hud would. Her only thought was to maintain the status quo. But once his mother knew of Liam's existence, the status quo wouldn't be possible. You're moving too fast, Hud said, which was annoying given he'd stated his feelings for her after only knowing her four days. I'm still confused. I'm still angry. I'm still hurt. And yes, he spared her a glance, I can be all those things and still love you. As I understand it, true love means your heart can overcome hardships. Daily hardships? She had to try and make him see. You're like a cactus and I'm like a rose. We're not easy to get along with. I have my way. And you have yours. Hud glanced out the window where it was beginning to rain again. If love was easy, there wouldn't be online apps and matchmakers helping people find it. Love requires honesty. Mina could agree with that. And similar values and goals in life, which require hard conversations. Don't get me wrong. Hud stared into the beer he'd been given. I'm not happy to be in love right now. There are plenty of hard conversations coming. Mina nodded. The next one has to be with your mother. Chapter 23 Thanks for coming with me, Walter. Vivian stared out the back window of the Mercedes on Tuesday afternoon, alternating between wringing her hands and checking her cell phone. When I got the text from Mina this morning asking me to come to Harmony Valley for a meeting, I didn't know what to think. Her text had been followed by one from HUD, requesting the same thing. Neither one of them had answered follow-up texts or phone calls as to why Vivian should make the long drive out to Harmony Valley on a rainy Tuesday. Graham was at the wheel, driving north through rural Sonoma County toward Harmony Valley. They were close to their destination. And Vivian still had no answers. It was unprofessional of Mina. Rude of HUD. And nerve-wracking all around. Why do you think they wanted me to come out with all this secrecy? I don't know, Walter said soothingly, taking Vivian's hand. He wore brown slacks and a blue knit sweater. His raincoat and hers were folded on the seat between them, beneath their joined hands. Mina isn't usually secretive. And you called her? That must be the twentieth time you've asked me. And the twentieth time you haven't answered. Vivian was feeling out of sorts. She smoothed a hand over her black jeans, moving her hand up to tug the cowl neck of her black sweater. Nervous. So nervous. What had to be said that couldn't be told via text or phone? You know I don't like to repeat myself. Despite Walter not shedding light on the purpose of this trip, he was a comforting presence. How far away are we, Graham? Graham turned off the narrow ribbon of a highway. The GPS says five minutes. Soon, they neared neat rows of vineyards and a small sign proclaiming Harmony Valley Vineyards Tasting Room was open. That looks like a quaint place. Walter leaned forward to glance in the direction of the winery. If Mina and Hud have worked out a deal and need us to sign, we might celebrate in their tasting room. You think that's what this is about? The pit in Vivian's stomach said differently. We're almost there. You'll get your answers, Walter assured her. Mina isn't the kind of person to make frivolous requests, although this one is unorthodox. But Hud seems on board with whatever is happening. The country road widened as they entered the town proper with its brick sidewalks, gas street lights, and parking slots in front of historic-looking buildings. There were cars in front of a bakery. More in front of a Mexican restaurant at the end of the block across from a large town square. The rain slowed to a gentle pitter-patter on the windshield. A few more turns and Graham slowed down on a residential street. 
It's the greenhouse over there. The one with HUD standing in the driveway. He wore the jeans and hooded jacket she packed for him yesterday. And, was that a black eye? Mina stood nearby beneath the Spider-Man umbrella she'd brought to the office. Two little boys in yellow rain slickers and rain boots were jumping in puddles. Hud and Samuel used to do that. Vivian forced the words past a throat taut from nerves. Are those Mina's boys? Are they twins? If so, one had gotten all the height and the other took after Mina in that department. The taller boy is Mina's. Walter sounded guarded. Why was that? Graham, park across the street and wait a minute. Walter spared Vivian a glance, giving her hand a squeeze. His mouth opened but he didn't say anything. We should get out. Vivian waved at Hud before unfolding her raincoat. This is all very strange. Not to mention Hud has a shiner. The boys stopped their splashing and stared at the car. Are you getting out, ma'am? Graham asked. I have my umbrella. He was good about shielding Vivian from the rain when she got in and out of the car. Wait, Walter said again, looking from Vivian to the house and back again. The tall boy, he frowned slightly, gathering his raincoat. We should hear what they have to say. We'll get out now, Graham. Graham hurried around to Vivian's side, opening his umbrella before opening her door. She stood beneath his umbrella, putting on her raincoat. Uncle Wally. The taller boy stomped in a circle in a puddle. Look at me. Look at you, Walter, Uncle Wally, said. But Walter looked at Vivian when he said it with an apology in his eyes. Vivian took the umbrella Graham offered and crossed the road, smiling at the boys, because she did so love children. First, she connected with the smaller boy, earning a tentative smile, and then. Hudson's face appeared beneath the yellow rain slicker. Bright, caramel-colored eyes. The promise of a strong nose. The beginnings of a cleft chin. The tall, lanky body. All the signs of a McLeod boy. Walter was right. Hud and Mina had met before. You should have told me, Vivian said to Hud when she reached the sidewalk, unable to take her eyes off what had to be her grandson. All the frustration over the morning's mysterious request. All the angst about not knowing why she'd been summoned. It was all worth it. Worth this. An adorable little grandson. Vivian barely kept herself from sinking to her knees, from holding out her arms and asking the boy for a hug. This explains so much about the meeting on Friday. All that tension. That sexual tension. You two have a history together. Hud crossed the wet grass, coming to her side, looking more serious than usual with that black eye. We don't. He's not, Mina looked at Walter and then at Vivian. He's not Hud's. Hud took Vivian's arm and said quietly, he's Samuel's. Oh, the world disappeared in a spinning vortex of black. Chapter 24 That didn't go as planned, Mina told Hud as Walter eased a passed out Vivian on the couch in Grandma Beam's living room. I'm sorry, Hud. Extremely so. She'd made Vivian McLeod, a veritable saint, faint. She and Hud were still dancing warily around each other. And now this. Hud moved past her to sit on the couch. It's not your fault. It was my idea not to prepare her for the news. He took Vivian's hand. Mom? Mom, can you hear me? Everything's going to be okay. No. Everything will change because of this. Painfully so. You're short-sighted for a McLeod, Walter snapped, sitting on the floor near McLeod Matriarch's head and then stroking her silver hair. You could have told me what you had planned. Either one of you. I could have prepared her. He gently patted her cheek. Viv, Viv, wake up. Is she dead? Liam squirmed between the two men and then poked Vivian's leg. He and Michael had shed their rain boots and slickers. The legs of their jeans were soaked. One of Liam's socks was wet, thanks to the faulty sole of his rain boot. And his other sock had a hole in the toe. The one time Mina wanted her son to show well. It had to be mommy karma. She'd done wrong by keeping Liam a secret from his family. She's not dead, honey, Mina reassured Liam, running her hand over his short, 
dark hair, and drawing him back. Graham, can you get Vivian a glass of water from the kitchen? She nodded in the direction of the room, trusting the McLeod driver would be able to find glasses. Plus, he looked tense enough to perform CPR if called upon. Graham needed a distraction. I wish I kept smelling salts on hand. Do we need to call someone? There's a retired nurse in town and a veterinarian. A veterinarian? Walter scowled, raising his voice. For Vivian McLeod? She's problem-solving, Walter. Hud's gaze was still riveted on his mother's face. That's right. I'm trying to be practical, Mina said with battle-tested composure, fully prepared to take all the blame. We can call 911, but an ambulance will take at least 30 minutes to get here. Give her a second. Hud shook his mother's shoulder. Mom. Mom? If she's not dead, what's wrong with her? Michael asked, following Liam's lead and poking Vivian's other leg. His socks looked brand new. Did she need a nap? Old people are so weird, Liam said. Liam, Mina gently chastised. Even Grandma Beam says it, her son mumbled, dropping to the carpet and removing his wet sock. That's enough poking and teasing, boys. Mina drew Liam to his feet and escorted both boys to the hallway. I want you to watch a movie with Grandma Beam. She made sure they were settled in the garden oasis that was her grandmother's bedroom before leaving them. When Mina returned to the living room, Vivian's eyes were open. She was sitting up and drinking water. The men around her looked relieved. Mina might have been relieved if the hardest part of the day was over, but she was afraid difficult times were yet ahead. Where is my boy? Vivian asked in a shaky voice when she caught sight of Mina. I want to see my grandson. Slow down, Walter cautioned. I don't want you to faint again. Keep drinking the water Graham brought you. Fine. But I need answers. Vivian drank deeply from the water glass, then finger combed her shoulder length, silver hair. I'm disappointed in myself. I trusted you, Mina. You can trust her, Walter and Hud said simultaneously, followed by an exchange of frowns. Why do I get the feeling that everyone knows more about this situation than I do? Vivian's composure was returning, and she was just as upset as Mina had imagined she would be upon learning the truth. Her nose was in the air and her tone sounded imperial. Someone better start explaining why this is the first I'm hearing about my grandson. You have questions? Ask away. Mina moved a plant stand with a tall spider plant closer to the wall and then sat on a square poof ottoman with a primary colored mandala pattern on the fabric. Vivian set her glass on the coffee table. How old? How long? Why? Why didn't you tell me? Us? Her gaze roamed over those assembled, her son, her driver, her old friend, and Mina. One of these people doesn't belong. And that person is me. Mina drew a bracing breath and gave Vivian the short version of the story, sprinkled with apologies. She noticed Graham leaned against the wall, looking weary when she disclosed how she'd landed in the US and learned of Samuel's death. She'd always known that telling the truth would be painful but would lift a weight from her shoulders. And maybe it would remove that weight. Someday. But it didn't feel great to come clean right now. Because as Mina talked, Vivian kept dissolving into tears. And every time she did, Mina paused, blinking back her own waterworks while Walter and Hud tried to comfort her, and Graham paced. Nope. Not great to finally have the truth out into the open. The truth had taken a strong woman and broken her into tiny, fragile pieces. I never meant to hurt anyone. Quite the opposite. But in this case, the truth did hurt someone. Deeply. It brought back Vivian's grief about her son's death. When Mina was done with the telling and question-answering, the room fell silent. The room that now included Grandma Beam, who leaned on a chair near the hallway, the bruise on her forehead still a deep, angry purple. I'm sorry, Mina said again, knowing the words would never be enough. But I hope you understand why I made the choices I did. It's a gift, Vivian murmured, using Walter's cloth handkerchief to blow her nose. No one said anything. Everyone gave the McLeod matriarch the stage. But. Five years. Vivian blinked back a fresh set of tears. You've been keeping this from me for five years? 
Mina didn't mean to hurt anyone, Hud said, which was nice considering they'd been giving each other a wide berth since agreeing to this meeting today. I wasn't talking exclusively about Mina. Some of the strength that had abandoned her during Mina's recap of events returned to Vivian's voice. So many people knew. That's not true, Mina said quickly. I didn't tell anyone. My son knew. Vivian looked at Hud in disappointment. He held up his hands. Only since yesterday. And it's not something I wanted to tell you over the phone. Uncle Wally knew. Vivian's gaze accused the next guilty party. The question is, when did you know? What? Mina shook her head. No. Walter couldn't have known. He would have said something to me. Vivian crumpled the handkerchief, staring at the accused. Walter? Her boss ran a hand over his bald head, looking none too happy to be on the receiving end of Vivian's accusation. You're right, Viv. I've known for several months. We had a company picnic last June. I hadn't seen Liam since Christmas. And at the picnic, he didn't look like a baby anymore. I watched your boys grow up, Viv. He's a McLeod, all right. But I thought he was Hud's. You knew? And you didn't say anything? Mina gasped. On second thought, I'm glad you didn't say anything. It would have been incredibly awkward. She and Walter exchanged a glance and a nod. Her nod thanked him for his silence and his seemed to convey respect for her privacy. But there was also a guarded look in her boss eyes that seemed to let Mina know that he was Team Viv, not Team Mina. I'm going to build on Mina's question, Vivian said in a hard voice, handkerchief in her fist. Walter, forget whose child you thought he was. Why didn't you say anything, to me? Before Walter could answer, Grandma Beam offered a response of her own, I never said anything, and I've known since Liam was born. Why does anything need to be said? It's none of my business or Walter's. I love Liam because he's Liam, not because he's a McLeod. Vivian's intake of breath was audible. Few people probably spoke to her in such a brazen fashion. Hud and Walter tried to soothe Vivian with touches and gentle words. But, Mina shook her head, confounded by her grandmother's admission. Grandma, how did you know? You keep that picture of Samuel, she said in a comforting voice. And don't forget that you called me from overseas and told me you'd met someone special. Liam may call me old. Liam calls everyone old, Hud said dryly. But I'm no dummy. I knew the day before Samuel died, Graham said quietly, managing to draw every pair of eyes in the room. I drove Mina to the airport. We had to stop twice because she was sick. Remember? Mina nodded. I thought it was bad fish. Hang on. Hud pointed at Mina but stared at his driver. You know her? Graham nodded. He'd been standing at attention near the entrance to the kitchen the last few minutes, looking uncomfortable. I met Mina the night she met Samuel. He smiled apologetically at Mina. Sorry that I didn't say anything the other day when you got into the car. I wasn't sure it was you, Mina said slowly, mind blown. Or that you recognized me. It's not my place to greet passengers. The military veneer was back in place. Graham nodded toward Grandma Beam. Ma'am, I have an electric vehicle outside that needs a recharge. Can I trouble you for an electrical outlet? It's the plug the dryer uses. Otherwise, we won't be able to make it back to the city tonight. I'm not going back to the city, Vivian said before Mina's grandmother could answer. I'm staying right here and getting to know my grandson. The room fell silent once more. I've only got my couch to offer, Grandma Beam said in a cordial tone, although that warmth didn't reach her eyes. But there's a bed and breakfast in town. I've got to warn you it's. Perfect, Vivian said briskly. It'll be perfect. Graham, when the car is charged, I'll need you to drive back to the city and bring me a few things. Packing your suitcase is outside of my job description, ma'am. Graham's cheeks flushed. I'll have Hildy pack a bag. Vivian smiled for the first time since she'd fainted, sounding more like herself. It wasn't as if I was going to ask you to rummage through my underwear drawer. We'll go check in and return for introductions. We? Walter began to frown, then must have thought better of it. 
I mean, of course. I'd be happy to stay if you need me, Viv. I do. She got to her feet, brushing off the hands that tried to assist her. I'm perfectly capable of walking on my own. Even in jeans and a sweater, Vivian was the epitome of sophistication. I'll drive you, ma'am. Graham moved swiftly toward the door. And then I'll get the car recharged. Mina stood and gave Graham directions, and then walked the visitors to the door. In no time, Vivian, Walter, and Graham were gone. Only then did Mina's legs give out, dropping away with her composure. She started to cry. Hey. Hey, what's this? Hud helped her to her feet and to the couch his mother had recently vacated. The worst is over. Mina shook her head. The worst wasn't over. Walter had known it, too. The truth would complicate everything. The worst was yet to come. I'm not going to stay at the band B. Hud frowned at Mina, resisting her efforts to get rid of him. I'm fine here. Liam doesn't care if I sleep in his room a few more nights, do you buddy? He leaned against the kitchen sink and ruffled his nephew's hair. My nephew. That was going to take some getting used to. Hud can stay. Liam danced around, catching himself as he stumbled. His smile was broad and unguarded. That means more chess. More games. More fun. Of course, Hud agreed. Despite the light mood, a more sober memory came to mind. I can't believe you ran away. Hud tried to grab ten-year-old Samuel and drag him out of the broom closet backstage. Dad is furious. Get out. Now. They had to appear on stage as a family soon. I don't want to. Samuel's plump tears tracked down his cheeks. Everyone stares at me. Hud had managed to convince him to make an appearance, but his younger brother's smiles had been guarded from then on. More fun, Hud said in a hollow voice. Liam's friend, Michael, had been picked up by his mother. Hud's mom and Walter were at the Lambridge Band B. Graham had left to find an extension cord to connect the Mercedes to the dryer plug in Cherise's garage. And Cherise sat in a kitchen chair. Mina stopped pacing and fixed Hud with a firm stare. Set aside the fact that you're upsetting Liam's routine and think about how much more comfortable you'd be in your own quarters. Her gaze didn't plead, it commanded. Oh, Mina was trying to get rid of him, all right. And Hud wasn't going for it. He may love Mina, but they had a long way to go before love took priority over Liam's transition into knowing he was a McLeod and Hud's pursuit of his legacy. Don't kick him out, Mina. Cherise agreed with Hud, sitting beneath her living garden wall. You need someone from their camp who's on your side by your side. And then the old woman turned her attention to Liam. You like Hud being here, don't you? I sure do. We can play chess every night. Liam hugged Hud's leg and then ran toward the garage door at the sound of the big outside door being opened. Graham's back. I've never seen a car plug in before and Graham said I could watch. He darted through the door, shouting, Graham, why is the cord so long? Why is the plug so big? The garage door swung shut behind him, muffling his stream of questions. Hud's driver was probably going to be peppered with questions from the inquisitive boy. Not that Hud was worried. He trusted Graham with more than just his vehicles. He trusted the man with his family because after nearly six years, Graham was family. What everyone seems to be forgetting is that I need space. Mina took the neck of her red-knit sweater and pulled it up to cover her mouth, adding in a muffled voice, I know I have no right to ask. She released her sweater mask and took another lap around the kitchen. But I know I need to ask. We need to understand each other. Hud stood in her path, taking hold of her arms, considering kissing her, knowing he couldn't until things were resolved. Together, we can make this easier on everyone. Mina drew a deep breath, not shying away from Hud's stare. You may not understand the look I'm giving you, but it implies disagreement. You young people. Always over-dramatizing. I'm going to take some carrots and go watch my shows in bed. Cherise moved slowly, collecting the carrots from the refrigerator, and then heading for her room. I bet you're sorry you tossed all my cookies, Mina. Sugar is the best comfort food. Mina closed her eyes, lips moving. 
HUD realized she was silently counting to ten. Count maid, Mina sat in the kitchen chair Cherise had vacated. I'm exhausted. HUD sat next to her. I know that was hard, but you handled it admirably. She shook her head, sending her dark curls gently rippling over her shoulders. Hopefully, your mother will agree with you someday. Someday soon. Hud stared at his hands thinking about what lay ahead for them. Mina, tomorrow is Wednesday. A day that follows Tuesday. She leaned her head back in the chair and reached up to touch a leafy plant tendril growing from a clear, water-filled flask attached to the wall. What's your point? You never told me what you told Walter. Mina shook her head. Is that what you're thinking right now? About your campaign? Yes. Hud gave in to temptation and brushed a lock of hair from her forehead. Roger is tossing his hat in the ring today. You need to listen to me. Mina caught his hand and brought his palm to her cheek. Forget Roger. Forget your legacy and think about what you told me last night, that Liam is important to you. The hard part is only just beginning for us. What? Why? Because Liam is voter gold, the same way you and Samuel were. You don't get to be a family dynasty in politics without leveraging every family member for as many votes as possible. With his palm still pressed to her cheek, she leaned closer, as if that would get her point across quicker. You know this. You lived this. Times have changed. His father no longer walked the earth. The rules of celebrity have changed. So much so that Hud wasn't sure what they were anymore. They stared at each other a few moments before Mina seemed to realize that she had his palm on her cheek. She dropped his hand, face blooming with color. She reached for the salt and pepper shakers in the middle of the table, a watering can and a flower pot, and fiddled with them as if seeing them for the first time. You can stay at our house and be Liam's liaison with your mother but I'm not working for you, Liam won't campaign for you, and we're not going to pursue whatever this is between us. You're overreacting. Hud balanced his chair on its two back legs. He was feeling decidedly dangerous. That's what wanting to have cake and eat it too did to a man. No. I'm thinking ahead, looking at the trees. Mina sighed, slouching in her chair. Without a doubt, she was a fidgeter. Everyone will assume that you're Liam's father, the way your mother did. Setting the record straight. Heck, creating a record of Liam's existence as a McLeod is going to detract from your campaign. And then there's me, she shook her head. Someone would notice that the air between us is charged when we're in the same room. Is that so? The fact that she admitted it pleased Hud to no end. Their situation was complicated and upsetting, but he'd use his force of will to make everything work out. Who cares? Mina laughed, but it was a mirthless kind of laughter. Don't be naive. It's like when your mother and Walter are in the same room together. Hud nearly tipped over backward in his chair. Instead, he overcorrected and came down to earth on all four chair legs with a loud thud. What did you say? Mina gaped at him. Don't tell me you haven't noticed? Walter worships the ground your mother walks on. And she, Mina apparently thought better of whatever she'd been about to say. It's none of our business. Mine, especially. They're just good friends, Hud insisted. Weren't they? And if they aren't, I'm not sure how I feel about that. The point is that with Liam being Samuels, I can't be your public anything. That's just, polarizing to voters. Mina blew out a breath. And, as I pointed out, you're already polarizing enough. Hud was in system overload, still processing his mother and, Walter? Mina stood. Look. We can talk about negative what-if scenarios all day, but I need to write a policy speech for a client. Hud took gentle hold of her wrist, all thoughts of Walter forgotten. I'm a good speechwriter. I could help you. Do you think that's wise? He didn't argue. He let his eyes do the talking. And his eyes said, wise or not, I want to be with you. To see where this goes even if it led to both their political ruin. If you can't let me go, this isn't going to end well, Mina predicted. But it might, Hud said, uncharacteristically optimistic. I'm willing to go all out to get what I want. Everything I want. 
The only way this will end is down the path that protects my son, Mina said firmly. As a single mother, I know you can't have it all. Maybe it's time you learned that, too. Chapter 25 I have two rooms available, Leona Lambridge told Vivian and Walter in a cool tone. I'm assuming your luggage is in the car? Her question implied she was assuming no such thing. Her tone implied she thought they were looking for a place for some hanka panky. If they had been, this wouldn't have been the place. It had an atmosphere of formality, not romance. Our luggage will be delivered later, Vivian assured the woman, not explaining that later would be tomorrow. They stood inside the foyer of a large, beautiful Victorian. The wood floor and wood antiques gleamed as if recently polished. There was a lovely living room to one side, filled with period pieces, and a formal dining room on the other side. There was nothing modern in sight. Normally, Vivian loved historic homes. There was just one thing that gave her a bad vibe about the place, the woman in front of her. Leona Lambridge ran the Lambridge bed and breakfast. She wore a prim blue dress that had seen better days, pearls around her neck, and her steel-gray hair was swept away from her face and held in a tight bun. It was the bun that was the problem, Vivian decided. That bun seemed tight enough to pluck the last bit of warmth from Leona's body. She had an air about her that was as chilling as the fog that swept through the San Francisco Bay. I don't care. I'm a grandmother. The shock of the news was wearing off. Samuel had a son. Vivian smiled. We'll take them. To be clear, the bedrooms share a hall bathroom, Leona said in that unwelcoming tone of voice. I've been told by my granddaughter that shared facilities are very European. But I've found that most people prefer a private suite. Do you have private suites? Walter asked with a polite smile on his dear face. No such a short, cold word. But my granddaughter told me to create expectations before accepting payment to avoid bad reviews. Her expression communicated that she didn't care a whit about customer satisfaction or positive reviews. This wasn't the type of establishment Vivian was used to. I don't care. I'm a grandmother. A little bit of Samuel survived in this world. Increasingly, Vivian was walking on cloud nine, spirits lifted, hope in the future resurrected. We'll take the rooms, Vivian said once more. Only then did she notice that Walter had been sending her a look, a look she took to mean that he didn't want to stay here. After all, Walter and I appreciate European style. Think of it, Walter. We're being trendy. Walter's wrinkles deepened, indicating he didn't agree. But he said nothing. The same way he said nothing for months about my grandson. Some of the excitement drained from Vivian. She and Walter needed to talk. All right. Leona sighed, as if disappointed that Vivian and Walter weren't going anywhere. I'll need a method of payment and your contact information. There are to be no wet towels in your room. There's a laundry chute upstairs in the hallway. That's where your used bath towels go. Breakfast is from 8 a.m. to 8.30. Is it a hot breakfast? Continental? Walter seemed to regain his good-natured footing. Food tended to do that to him. Continental makes sense since it fits with the European atmosphere of your lodging. Vivian chuckled. Leona didn't. Breakfast is traveler's fare. Obviously, Leona had no idea about true European style. The proprietress opened a drawer in a nearby table and handed them a tablet to collect their personal and payment information. Only when the details were recorded did she show them upstairs to their rooms. This is a stunning home, Vivian said, scaling the beautiful staircase and feeling as if she was being taken back in time. It's been in my family for generations. Leona led them down the hall. She opened a door without a key. I'll let you choose your rooms. This one has lovely morning light. Without waiting for one of them to claim it or look inside, she moved to the next door. And this room has a lovely view of the garden. I'll take the garden view. Vivian peeked inside. The room had elegant burgundy wallpaper and was filled with antiques, including a large bed. And the shared bathroom would be, here. Walter opened the next door down. Hey! Footsteps pounded across the floorboards. This is my room. Apologies. Walter took a step back. 
I was looking for the restroom. It's at the end of the hall, a man said before slamming the door in Walter's face. I was just about to point it out. Leonid sked disapprovingly, although her tone and demeanor seemed to communicate a sly satisfaction over Walter's misstep. I'm sorry, Walter said again, this time to Leona. His door wasn't locked. None of the doors have locks, Leona said, nose in the air. I lock the front door precisely at 9 p.m. Please make sure to be back in your room by then. She left them, descending the grand staircase as stiffly as she'd ascended. No locks? Walter shook his head. We should find a place to stay in Cloverdale. The nearest town that was located miles back by the main highway. We're old enough not to need a curfew and young enough to appreciate locks. But do you know, Walter? Vivian chuckled, not letting anything rain on her grandmother parade. I think I'm going to like it here. I worry about you, Viv. You shouldn't. I'm a grandma. That makes me happy. Gloriously happy. Impulsively, she hugged him. She hugged him close, enjoying the feeling of a strong man in her arms and wanting. She took a step back, feeling her cheeks heat. I saw a little shop in town across from the bakery. I wonder if they'd have gifts for little boys. She couldn't show up to meet Liam officially without a gift of some kind. About that, Walter didn't sound as ecstatic as she did. We need to talk about the situation. Okay. Vivian entered the room with the view of the garden, studying the well-kept yard two stories below before removing her shoes and sitting on the bed, sagging a little because she was suddenly exhausted. About that hug, Walter began. Walter, I'm just so happy. I'm sorry if I invaded your personal space. She avoided looking at him. On second thought, I want to get back over to my grandson as soon as possible. She are lifted her head. We'll talk first. It's important. Walter closed the bedroom door and took a seat in the one chair, a wing back covered in pink and white chintz. Are you going to start? Or am I? Vivian gestured for him to go first. I didn't tell you about Liam because I wasn't sure. Imagine me saying something and being wrong. In fact, I was wrong. I thought he was Hud's. Walter leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. He stared at a spot in the oriental carpet, although Vivian couldn't see any stain. There were dangerous pitfalls either way. There still are. Dangerous? Walter was tilting at windmills. The existence of my grandson isn't. Take off your rose-colored glasses for a moment, Viv, and look at it through your political lens. He raised his gaze to hers, one tinged with regret. Look at Hud and Mina. There were fireworks when they met in San Francisco on Friday. What are you saying? The shock of the day must have muddled her brain. I'm not following. There's chemistry between them. Walter shook his head slowly, sinking back into the feminine chair. But there was nothing delicate or feminine about him. He was all man in her eyes. Mina doesn't cross personal boundaries with clients. I hired her back when she was pregnant. She's never gotten cozy with anyone, not a client or fellow employee. Heck, I don't think she's dated the entire time she's worked for me. And so this, he shook his head again. Is wonderful. How do I say this? Walter sighed. When I first told Mina about the meeting with Hud last week, she turned down the assignment. Almost before I had the words out of my mouth. He ran a hand over his head. Vivian was struck with the sudden urge to cross the room and do the same, to run her hand over that smart, sexy head of his, and then lower her lips to. Focus, Vivian. Focus. You're a grandmother. Did it matter whose son Liam was? She drew a calming breath. Why did Mina agree to the meeting? Because I told her you'd requested her, which was a lie. He stood, hesitating before walking toward her. I suggested her to you. And you agreed. Walter stopped a foot away from the bed. A foot away from Vivian, who sat dejected, like a kid who'd lost her lunch money. That was a lifetime ago. And I thought, Walter glanced away, as if he didn't want to admit what he'd been thinking. I thought about how a family man always garners more votes than a single man. But, Liam isn't Hud's. He's Samuel's. 
Anne Vivian was so very happy about that. Walter cleared his throat and swung his gaze back to Vivian. If HUD still wants to run for office and the world gets wind of Liam and Mina, and I somehow get Mina to work on HUD's campaign because she's the best. That's a problem. Vivian was beginning to see it now. Walter nodded. We need to decide how to proceed. Obviously, it would look better if HUD and Mina were married, and Liam was HUD's. He could adopt the boy. Walter, doesn't this seem a little much? Vivian's voice didn't sound as confident as she'd like. After a moment's hesitation, Walter continued, if HUD no longer wants to run, it's not a problem. I don't want you in a position where you're hounded about Mina and Samuel instead of being able to enjoy your grandchild. You told me how carefully you had to guard the family reputation when your boys were little. Yes, because Hamilton insisted. But Walter wasn't like Hamilton. Walter was giving Vivian a choice. She found her gaze locked on his face, appreciating the fact that to him she wasn't part of the support team. With Walter, she was as important as a candidate. Or a wife. That's a lot to process, Vivian said, feeling her cheeks heat. On a day when there was a lot to process, including the energy Walter exuded when he was within liplock distance. Those were inappropriate thoughts. Walter is my friend. And in a world where Vivian had few friends, much less ones with political savvy, she couldn't afford to throw herself at a man on a sudden, unexpected urge. She slid off the bed and walked to the window, turning to face Walter with those lips of his a safe distance away. How do you propose we move forward? Let me try to sort this out. Walter was standing where she'd left him, next to her bed. He picked up one of her shoes, inspecting it as if he was interested in buying a pair. You said you wanted to stay a few days and get to know Liam. He's a good kid, as kids go. You know they aren't my cup. But that will allow me to package this story. In Vivian's experience, no good ever came from putting a spin on something to turn it into something it had never been. It became so very hard to breathe. Don't ruin this for me, Walter. I don't want to ruin anything. He set her shoe on the pink coverlet and stared at her with an unfathomable look. I just want you to protect you. And Liam. Vivian wasn't as concerned with the truth as she was with the safety and happiness of her grandson. I'm a grandma. And the other thing? Walter crossed his arms over his chest. Though, honestly, if becoming a grandmother meant losing a few brain cells, Vivian thought it was worth it. What other thing? Never mind. Walter walked out, leaving Vivian with the oddest impression that she disappointed him. Chapter 26 Cherise, I heard you were in a car accident. Agnes entered Cherise's bedroom Monday afternoon, followed by her two sidekicks, Rose and Mildred. We came to give out hugs. What a nice surprise. Cherise got out from under the afghan on her bed and, with a minimum of groaning, stood. True to their word, the trio of councilwomen each hugged Cherise and asked her to tell them all about her car totaling fender bender. She did, sitting gingerly on the bed while admitting it was her fault, but saying nothing about the reason for her trip. What an exciting weekend you've had, Agnes noted. She sat on Cherise's bed while Rose sat on the bench at the end and Mildred sat on her walker seat. First Liam's performance. Then a handsome man comes to stay. And rescues you, Mildred inserted. And then a hospital visit, Agnes finished. Too bad about the car, Rose commiserated. You must have had it longer than Agnes has owned her Buick. Cherise nodded. Subarus. They last forever. Unlike hips. And speaking of cars. What happened to Hud's Ferrari? Mildred said innocently. I was going to ask him for a ride. Too late. Cherise chuckled. His driver brought Mina's car to the hospital yesterday and drove the Ferrari back to San Francisco. I'm always a day late and a dollar short. Mildred pouted. I'm sure there will be other chances for you, Mildred. It turns out that Liam is a McLeod. And finally, Cherise could tell someone. Mildred gasped. You didn't tell us that Hud intended to adopt him. What a big-hearted soul he is. That's not what I mean. Then whose is he? Agnes grinned. Don't tell me he's Hud's child. 
she lowered her voice to a whisper. Hud and Mina were in Mina's room when we came in, sitting close and having a serious talk. Are they patching things up? He's not Hud's. He's Samuel's. Cherise quickly recapped how Mina and Samuel met. And then she dropped the bombshell. And earlier today, Vivian McLeod stopped by. She fainted on my lawn. That announcement was met with silence. Bad luck that, Rose said, in that distant way of hers. Is she all right? Did someone catch her? Mildred asked. Nope. She went down like a tossed sack of fertilizer. Luckily, she landed on the soggy lawn. Bad luck. Rose sked. Fainting always is, Agnes said. No Rose got to her feet. She'd never been one to sit still. She did some ballet turns across the room, arms raised. I mean that it's unfortunate that Cherise has to co-grandparent with Vivian McLeod. She's one of my idols but she has no experience grandparenting. She's going to shower Liam with presents and spoil him if you aren't careful. What? Cherise hadn't thought of that. I can't mentor Vivian McLeod. Don't sound like it's not possible because it's necessary. Rose came back the other way with raquette kicks. She's wealthy. Why, before you know it, she could buy Liam a Ferrari like Hud has. Mildred and Agnes agreed. And the more Cherise thought about it. Darned if Rose wasn't right. Chapter 27 It's your move, Hud. Liam lay on Mina's bed. The chessboard was laid out in front of him. Hud had been staring at Liam and thinking about Samuel. If you're looking down from heaven, brother, I could use some help right now. On how to protect both Samuel's son and the McLeod legacy, which, admittedly, was tangled with Hud's own legacy. Why so glum, bro? Samuel had asked Hud on the day of his boot camp graduation. Why can't you be happy for me? I've never felt more certain about something than this. Hud ran a hand around the back of his neck. Was I supportive of his choices that day? He couldn't remember. He could remember being happy with Samuel's texts and phone calls. He could remember being relieved that Samuel was out of the spotlight. But Hud wasn't entirely certain that he'd been gracious enough to be truly happy for his brother and not for himself that the public relations McLeod was out of the public eye. Charisse's visitors had come and gone. The Mercedes was fully charged and headed back to the city with Graham at the wheel. Hud's mother and Walter were headed downtown before they returned for dinner. Hud sat on the corner of Mina's bed near her desk. He was alternating between playing the chess game and helping Mina edit the speech that was late. What does this client stand for again? Hud was finding it hard to concentrate. Crime? Education. He's developing a tech program to help people who don't go to college learn a trade, like mechanics or carpentry or a dental assistant. Why did I think it was crime? Your turn, Hud, Liam said again. Hud looked at the chessboard without seeing it. Of course, I bought you a German cuckoo clock. Samuel had practically crowed with laughter. And I want you to hang it next to that portrait of great-grandpa in your office. Hud hadn't done that. Why hadn't he done that? He couldn't even remember where the cuckoo clock was now. Hello? Liam waved a hand in front of Hud's face. Your turn. Mina was talking non-stop, as if Hud was listening. Part of my client's pitch is giving people the option to enter the program even if they've committed a misdemeanor. A lot of programs won't allow applicants to have a criminal background. Mommy, why are you helping criminals? Mina sked. Remember when Maddie took home your puzzle book without asking? Remember how mad you were? Liam nodded solemnly. I wanted the sheriff to arrest her. Mina gave Hud a warm smile for the first time at what felt like forever. What Maddie did was wrong. But it wasn't as bad as robbing a bank. We gave Maddie a second chance, didn't we? That's what this program will do. It'll give people who made mistakes a second chance. Hud, you can't expect the army to fill its ranks with college-educated recruits. Samuel laughed when Hud questioned the kind of men Samuel was hanging out with. There are guys here who didn't know what to do with their lives until they joined the army. And others who needed this second chance. Oh. Your move, Hud, Liam prompted. 
We should probably talk about what happens next when my mom gets back. Hud slid his rook forward several spaces while Mina pounded out words on the computer. The sleepy lady is your mom? Liam sked and moved his bishop diagonally to take Hud's castle-shaped piece from the board. Did she teach you? Were you ever any good at chess? You're never going to be any good at chess. A very young Samuel took Hud's queen while they waited backstage for their father to finish his campaign debate. But that's okay. You're good at other things that I'm not. I was good at other things, Hud said, smiling a little at the memory of his brother. But one thing was clear, Hud had to figure out how to tell Liam about his father in a way that would do Samuel proud. And he had to set the stage for introducing Liam to his new grandmother. Like arguing without getting mad. Arguing? Is that a thing? Liam looked at Hud crosswise. And then he shrugged. I guess it can be because mommy says I'm good at laughing. The kid tapped a space in front of Hud's rook, as if giving him game pointers. My friend Maddie is good at counting. And Michael reads lots of books. Mina was still pounding away on the keyboard, inspired, and not listening. She seemed unconcerned that Hud's mother was due back soon. Hud felt the pressure to set things up for her. Hey. Um. Liam. You're going to meet a new family member today. Mina stopped typing but didn't turn around. A new family member? Liam bounced on the bed a little, smiling. Is it a little brother? I've always wanted a little brother. Or a puppy or chicken, Mina murmured. I'm going to call him Jack and he's going to call me Liam. The little guy fairly glowed. We're going to learn how to skateboard and ride bikes. I'm going to teach him how to play chess and how to splash in rain puddles. Hud nodded encouragingly. That all sounds great but... We're going to watch Spider-Man together. And go to school together. And share a bedroom. Liam frowned. We share a bedroom, Hud. He slid off the bed and to the floor, eyes wide. Are you my brother? No. Mina turned, brows raised as she leaned on the arm of her desk chair, causing it to roll a bit backward. Liam started doing that dance he'd done as Snoopy, which was a stumbling rendition of the running man. I got a bro, other. I got a bro, other. Hud caught Mina's eye and gestured toward his nephew. Don't you want to clarify this situation? I got a bro, other. The kid kept on dancing and singing. I got a bro, other. Liam, Mina said in an even-keeled, mommy voice. I hate to disappoint you, honey, but your new family member isn't a brother. Liam stopped, blinked. And grinned. Is it a puppy? Mina shook her head. Hud pressed his palm to his forehead, afraid this wasn't going to end well. A chicken? Liam guessed, enthusiasm waning, despite the fact that chickens were on his wish list. Mina shook her head again. Liam stuck out his lower lip. I don't want more family if it's not a brother, a puppy, or a chicken. He sank to the floor, drooping. How about an uncle? Hud said half under his breath. What do uncles do? Liam asked, pouting. And then before Hud could answer, he pronounced, nothing a dot. Hud and Mina laughed. Together. Something hitched in Hud's chest. He didn't like them not being on the same page. He wanted them to be with her without having to filter every conversation, choosing his words carefully. But to do that, they had to unravel things, starting with paving the way for his mother to have a relationship with Liam. What's your feeling about grandmothers, Liam? Mina asked in a gentle voice, as if reading Hud's mind. In answer, Liam threw himself face down on the bed and wailed. And try as they might, the kid couldn't be consoled. Chapter 28 The rain had let up allowing Walter and Vivian to walk the few short blocks downtown under cloudy skies. Harmony Valley was a quaint little town, much like Vivian's hometown of Albany, Oregon. Or at least, the way it had been forty or more years ago. Vivian McLeod? A trio of elderly women approached on the sidewalk. The shortest called her name once more. Vivian McLeod? We heard you were in town. A thin woman with her white hair in a bun glided closer with the grace of a dancer. From Cherise. 
I've loved you since your first campaign, said a woman pushing a walker. Hamilton's first campaign, Vivian said softly. It was yours, too, Walter whispered in her ear, causing all sorts of fluttering in Vivian's chest. Your man is right. The woman with the walker stopped in front of Vivian. Her glasses were incredibly thick and smudged. It was doubtful she could see anything out of them. I wouldn't have voted for him if not for you. Where are you staying? The small woman with the gray, pixie haircut tugged her raincoat tighter around her shoulders. You are staying, aren't you? Armina is being wooed by your Hudson. The woman with the white bun gave a little kickball change before stopping in front of Walter. She frowned. You didn't come here to break them up, did you? No. We're, Walter squeezed Vivian's hand, a warning not to overshare. We're staying at the Lambridge Band B. Oh, my, said the shortest woman. She didn't vote for you, said the lady with the walker. You'll be wanting to have breakfast at Martin's Bakery. The elderly dancer gracefully passed her arm in that direction. Vivian tried very hard not to smile. The trio were full of good intentioned sass. Why wouldn't we eat at breakfast the band be? Walter asked, looking flummoxed. The dancer jolted back, eyes wide. Because you'll get dry toast from Leona. Or prunes, the woman with the walker said. The short, sprightly woman added knowingly, we hear stories. Ask Cherise. She knows. Ladies, I know that Viv is grateful of all your advice, but we came downtown to buy a gift or two. Walter ran a hand from his collarbone to mid-chest, as if smoothing a tie. For Liam, the petite woman asked. He's a pip, the woman with the walker said. But I'd limit the gift giving. The dancer nodded. Wouldn't want to spoil him. Okay, gals. Off you go. Walter gave up being gracious and shooed them along. And then he led Vivian to a quaint little shop called May's Pretty Things. Can I help? The purple haired, elderly woman behind the sales counter gasped. She wore a purple polyester tracksuit and a pair of black readers that rode low on her nose. It's you. 24 7. Vivian gave the woman her kindest smile. I'm looking for a gift for a five year old boy. I'm the honorary grandmother of the sweetest little boy. The sales clerk fairly glowed. My name is Eunice. Let me gather some things. Vivian glanced around. The front window had a big display of wine goods. Wooden racks, tea towels, wine glasses and wine charms. One corner featured handmade pottery filled with plants. One wall was filled with baby quilts. Another had racks of hand-knit sweaters. There were more baby items. Beyond that was a rack with what looked like nightgowns. Her gaze returned to the baby quilts. Something inside of Vivian panged. She'd missed out on Liam's baby years. She turned to Walter. Was Liam a cute baby? He was a baby. Walter looked uncomfortable at being asked. Quieter than my grandkids when they were in diapers. I always liked that about him. He didn't pitch a fit or anything. Vivian nodded happily. That's usually an indication of a confident, peaceful mother. Do you know how she raised him? Did she breastfeed? Was he hard to potty train? What was his first word? Walter shrugged, a trapped look in his eyes. Mina always kept her personal life separate from her professional one. I rarely heard about Liam except when he was sick and she had to miss work. And yet, he calls you Uncle Wally. He might have come in a time or two during school holidays. Walter sighed, running a hand over his hairless head. And yes. I might have helped entertain him a time or two. He likes to watch nature documentaries and play chess. Thank heavens, he's never asked me to sing silly songs or get down on the floor and play. What's behind all this? Vivian made an all-encompassing gesture toward Walter. This distance you keep from babies. The fun thing about kids is their imagination and silliness. It sounds like you want them to be miniature adults. You know, we lost Carlton when he was nine months old, he said gruffly, looking lost and vulnerable. Impulsively, Vivian hugged him. I'm sorry. I should have remembered. He'd lost his first child to a rare form of cancer. 
I was silly with him and I think when he left this earth that he took all that silliness with him. I don't begrudge him that, Walter admitted, still in that gruff, vulnerable voice. Me either. Vivian would have stepped away, but Walter continued to hold her close. Viv, he said in a gruff voice. And if the sales clerk hadn't returned, Vivian imagined she might have given in to impulse and kissed him. She turned to Eunice with a grateful smile. Grateful because the woman had saved her from making a fool of herself. Not only with Walter, but with the small group of elderly people who peered at them through the large front window. Hey! Eunice must have followed the direction of Vivian's gaze, because she charged across the store to the door, opened it and waved the peepers away. Give the woman some respect. Walter chuckled in Vivian's ear, giving her the good kind of goosebumps. I should hire her for your in-town security detail. And although Vivian found his comment amusing, she looked up at Walter and said in all seriousness, I'm quite satisfied with the protection you provide. His eyes flashed with what a younger Vivian might have called wanting. I found some things you might like, Eunice interrupted, laying a few items on the sales counter. This is a reversible pillow. One side is an alien. And then you pull it inside out, like this, and the inside becomes the outside, which is a dinosaur. Vivian looked at Walter, who wrinkled his nose. Cute, but I'm going to pass. We have this unusual nesting doll set. Eunice pushed forward a large bear painted on a wooden shell. She lifted off the bear lid to reveal a deer. She continued to lift off lids revealing a raccoon, bald eagle, and a frog. Walter had said Liam enjoyed nature documentaries. I'll take that. And we have a Spider-Man beanie. The clerk held up a beanie knit in the traditional red and black Spider-Man colors. When you pull down the brim, it becomes the Spider-Man mask with eye holes. That's a must-have, Vivian said, thinking of the Spider-Man umbrella Mina had used. Anything else? Nothing really. The clerk looked around. We've been catering to the winery visitors with very little for children. What are those? Vivian pointed toward the rack with nightgowns. Oh, those are kind of a joke. The clerk's cheeks pinkened. They're sets of pajamas. We only stock them because the owner of the local band B said her guests were running around, improperly dressed. They're granny and grampy pajamas. Very prim. Covering the body from head to toe. Nightshirts, you mean. The old-fashioned kind. Vivian approached the rack. No, Walter said firmly. Vivian laughed. Oh, come on. We're sharing a bathroom with others, and we didn't bring pajamas. This is the perfect solution to keep us from getting kicked out of the band B. Viv, I don't wear anything to bed. Oh. Vivian didn't know what to say. Chapter 29 Uncle Wally's back with the sleepy lady, Liam called from the living room. The sleepy lady. Mina tensed, dropping a fork in her efforts to set the table. She was very much aware that she needed to transition Liam to calling Vivian grandma. He'd had a mini meltdown when he learned he wasn't getting a brother earlier. Having heard him, Grandma Beam had decided to make cookies. And only the promise of her not eating any had stopped Mina from putting an end to the baking. She exchanged a glance with Grandma Beam, who removed her apron and tidied the kitchen counter. They'd laid out a sparse buffet with salad, French bread, and grilled chicken. Hud had grilled the chicken breasts, which smelled divine. The aroma of warm chicken was soothing. And Mina needed soothing. So many things could go wrong, including Vivian demanding public acknowledgement of Liam, court-ordered visitation, a legal name change. The list was endless and terrifying. Liam, come get a cookie before dinner, Grandma Beam called. She shrugged off Mina's look of surprise. I'll give you a cookie, too. It'll stave off the nerves. Mina decided that was a good idea. When Liam bounded in, she gave him a chocolate chip cookie and then took one for herself. Look who's here. Hud led Vivian and Walter into the kitchen a few minutes later. Hi, Uncle Wally. Liam wiped cookie crumbs from his lips with the back of his hand, smearing chocolate on his chin. He turned his attention to Vivian. Hi. Um. Who are you again? Mina darted in to clean her son's face while Vivian's smile wavered. Hud knelt next to Liam. 
Hey, remember earlier when I told you that you'd be meeting another member of the family today? Well, this is your grandmother Vivian. Gigi, Vivian said in a tight voice, looking as if she might cry. I've always wanted my grandchildren to call me Gigi. Liam scoped Gigi out, finishing his cookie. There was an awkward silence where Hud stood, moving close enough to Mina to touch arms, which was oddly calming. He placed his hands on Liam's shoulders. We look like a family. Mina's heart clenched. There were too many obstacles between them for that to ever be real. Liam smacked his lips, having finished his cookie, and said, Hi, sleepy Gigi. And then he gave her one of his goofy smiles, inviting her to share a light moment. Hi, Liam, Vivian said, wiping away a tear. Walter put his arm around her waist. Sleepy Gigi. I think that fits her, Liam. She just bought us some granny pajamas. For sleeping, he added, as if his statement needed context. Liam nodded, unaware that every pair of eyes was focused on him. I sleep in pajamas, too. I have Spider-Man pajamas. Grandma Beam has bunny jammies. Mommies are just boring. Are your jammies boring, sleepy Gigi? Vivian blinked without saying a word. Mina could only imagine what was going through her head. How alike Liam could be to Samuel sometimes in both goofy attitude and sunshiny approach to life's unusual circumstances. Hud leaned away from Mina, as if about to move to his mother's side. Mina took his hand, anchoring him next to her because she had the distinct feeling that Vivian and Liam needed to ride this awkwardness out by themselves. Yes, Walter answered for Vivian, apparently not on the same page as Mina. Or maybe he was vying for the role of sleepy grandpa to Vivian's sleepy Gigi. He drew Vivian closer to his side. Sleepy Gigi's jammies are boring, and she bought me a pair to match. Really? Hud asked, tensing and giving Walter a hard stare. Mina squeezed his hand. Boring jammies give you boring dreams. Liam glanced up at Mina and then back toward Walter and Vivian. I like to dream about baby brothers. And puppies and chickens, Mina murmured into the pregnant pause. Welcome to our home. Grandma Beam limped across the kitchen to hug Vivian, which was unexpected. She drew Vivian forward, toward Liam. Did you bring something, Vivian, er, Gigi? Sleepy Gigi, Liam corrected, taking a step toward his grandma's, eye on the bag. Vivian startled and composed herself. Yes. Thank you, Cherise. I, I brought something for Liam. Presents? Liam perked up, shaking himself like an excited puppy. And then he stopped. You didn't get me boring pajamas, did you? No. I'd never do that. Vivian showed Liam a nesting doll, which he accepted with polite interest. And then she brought out a winner, a Spider-Man beanie that doubled as a mask when you pulled down the brim. I, I, I'm so excited. Liam jammed the mask over his head, covering his entire face. And then he started to dance. He danced so enthusiastically that he bumped into Walter and then the refrigerator. Vivian started to cry and hugged Grandma Beam and then turned to hug Walter. Mina might have felt left out if Vivian hadn't stopped doling out hugs there. Stop. Stop, buddy. Hud came to Liam's rescue. You have to line up the eye holes so you can see. Oh. Liam's big caramel-colored eyes peeped out at them. That's much better. And then he continued his dance without stumbling or hitting anything else. Thank you, sleepy Gigi. I'm sorry you missed out on this. Mina apologized to Vivian, who was still teary-eyed. She'd probably be apologizing to the McLeod matriarch for the rest of her life. But I'm here now. Vivian couldn't take her eyes off Mina's son. Sleepy Gigi is here now. Hud, do you still want to run for office? Walter sat on Cherise's couch after dinner, his arm over mom's shoulders. It was just the three of them in the small living room, Hud, Walter, and mom. Cherise had complained of an aching hip and retired to her bedroom after dinner. Mina was giving Liam a bath. Hud sat in Cherise's recliner near a very robust fern. The plant's leaves brushed his left arm. Of course, I want to run, Walter. San Francisco deserves better than Roger. 
He turned his gaze to the older man just as his mother inched away from Walter on the couch. As if she wanted to remain neutral. Hud's throat felt tight. He wanted his mother on his side. But he also wanted her to be happy. And much as it was hard to get used to since Mina had pointed it out, he'd noticed his mother staring at Walter the way Hud thought he stared at Mina sometimes. Their growing feelings seemed just as complicating as Hud's and Mina's feelings for each other. Or at least, Hud's love for Mina. He still held out hope that she'd realize the emotional connection they'd found was love. Do you want my opinion, Hud? Walter asked, but his gaze was on Mom. Do I have a choice? In Hud's experience, Walter was like Mina. If he had an opinion, he'd give it to you, as long as it fit his agenda. What is Walter's agenda? Hud didn't know. Walter swung his gaze around to Hud's. If holding office is important to you, you need everyone in this house on board with how to explain Liam and everyone in this house to give you their full support. That's going to be difficult. At least in the short term. And Hud needed to announce his candidacy as soon as his black eye receded. It'll be difficult in the long term, too. Walter nodded, taking Mom's hand. I know you've been trying to convince Mina to run your campaign, but that's not wise. And I think you know it. You're a smart man, Hud. I think you realize you have to choose between protecting the people in this house and a front and center political career. Frustration balled in Hud's chest the way it did any time something, or someone, threatened the McLeod political legacy. What are you saying? Hud brushed the fern from his arm and sat up in the chair, not looking at his mother. Don't mince words, Walter. I won't, the older man promised. You know how innocent and carefree Liam is. Do you want to hurt him the way Samuel was hurt? Do you want him to become guarded and resentful of you the way Samuel was of your father? Walter glanced down at his hand, the one that held mom's. Of you. The image of Samuel hiding in a dark broom closet returned. Him crouched in a ball. Him fighting Hud's efforts to drag him out. Hud glanced at his mother, noting the tears in her eyes. But the dream, the one where he and Mina were married and a political power couple, had been stubbornly planted in his mind. He had to defend it. You don't know that will happen. History repeats itself, Walter murmured. I was a junior political strategist when I told your father the same thing. Mom sucked in a breath. Or it might have been a sob. The ball of frustration inside Hud expanded, growing as more emotions added to it, resentment, guilt, and the stubborn driving need to put himself first, for once. You don't understand, Walter. I'm the McLeod legacy. Walter shook his head. That's Liam. Hud looked to his mother, but her head hung low. She agrees. Hurt and anger twined with the tumult of emotions inside of him. You've done the McLeod family proud, Hud, Walter said in a gentler tone of voice. Let what happened in the Senate go. Think about what you could have. With Mina and Liam. But my dream. Samuel's voice filled his head. Everyone's staring at me. That's not your dream. I won't date a senator's daughter. Samuel hadn't liked anything about public life or politics. And then Hud's head was flooding with images of Liam, dancing on stage as Snoopy, teasing Hud about his chess skills, smiling like he'd never been hurt before, unguarded. Unlike Samuel. Samuel. His brother. Who'd only wanted to be his own man. Not a McLeod politician. I know you only want the best for me, Hud said slowly, unable to let his duty or his dream or his love for Mina go. He wanted it all, despite everyone telling him that he couldn't have it. Despite a small voice in his head, one that sounded a lot like Samuel, telling him something had to give. But I have to try. Even if it makes it difficult for Mina and Liam? Mom asked, speaking for the first time. Even if I disapprove? Yes, Hud said, albeit with mixed feelings. With a strangled sound, Mina ran out of the hall, grabbed her shoes and jacket, and bolted out the door. Chapter 30 Hud spotted Mina sitting at the bar in El Rosal as soon as he reached Main Street. She had a beer sitting in front of her and was staring into its depths the way a fortune teller stared into a crystal ball, searching for answers. 
When Hud had seen her leave, the bundle of emotions he'd been wrestling with had tapped out and disappeared, leaving him with only a feeling of hollowness. I can't have it all. Hud had to compromise. Decision made, he crossed the road, walking with a purpose. Hud. Agnes blocked his path on the other corner. She was bundled up in a raincoat and boots, carrying an umbrella. I'm so glad I found you. I wanted to talk about Larry. He's. Happy, Agnes. He's happy serving as mayor. Hud tore his gaze from Mina and took the elderly woman gently by the arms, easing her to the side. You should only do things that make you happy for as long as they make you happy. Life's too short to do anything else. He knew that now. He spared Agnes a soft smile. Are you happy on the town council? Agnes seemed taken aback at his question. But then she nodded. Yes. Yes, I am. Then keep on serving. Listen to your younger constituents and what they need to improve their lives here but keep serving as long as it makes you happy. And then he left Agnes on the sidewalk and hurried inside the Mexican restaurant where his love and his future was waiting. Mina was slumped at the bar, her shoulders bent, her head bowed, even her curls seemed limp. Hud sat on the bar stool next to Mina and signaled Arturo for a beer. He half expected Mina to turn to him and tell him to leave town. She didn't. And that was nearly as worrisome. Hud wasn't sure where to start this conversation. Hud took a sip of his beer, cleared his throat, and said, when you first told me you'd dated Samuel. When you guessed, she corrected, ever the stickler for the details and the truth. I wondered what you saw in Samuel that you didn't see in me. But then, I realized it was what he saw in you that brought you together. My sweetness, she said in a sour voice. That's because Samuel didn't like looking deeper into people. He didn't want to see the darkness or the negatives, Hud's voice had dropped to a pained whisper. He saw enough of that in our family. Mostly, in my father but. To be honest, he saw it in me, too. Liam takes after Samuel. Mina snuck a quick glance at him. He won't thrive in the world of politics. I know that. Now. Hud needed to clear his throat again. It took seeing you leaving and and remembering things about Samuel these past few days, to know that. Mina merely scoffed. Hud carefully touched the swelling around his eye. It had gone down tremendously over the course of the last few days. I can be hard-headed when it comes to being aware of things I don't want to hear. Mina sipped her beer. But I do listen. She wasn't looking at him. Or making this easy. But maybe that was because she didn't know what this was. An apology. A promise. A future. Hud took her hand and gently drew her to face him. When I was a teenager, I was convinced I could play quarterback. The coaches gave me a chance in the summer but at every scrimmage, I failed. He'd thrown interceptions, been sacked, had the ball stripped away. So, I quit. And instead of my father encouraging me to find another position to play, he was happy. He told me I could devote more time to things that would help me later in life, like the debate team, like student council, like volunteering wherever his staff thought I'd be useful. Oh, Hud. Mina squeezed his hand. I took the easy path. I told myself I needed to be in politics and earn a portrait on my father's office wall. He sighed. And I've been operating the same way ever since. Quitting when things got difficult and then trying again, but always trying for that gold ring, to uphold the legacy of the McLeods, which somehow turned into my political legacy. My dream, not what my father or grandfather had wanted for me. It was probably exacerbated by Samuel refusing to go into politics, Mina said softly. Hud nodded. But he still created a legacy for himself by serving his country in a different way. He made me proud. He'd have made my father proud. Mina sat up taller. I'm glad you can see that. But that doesn't change the fact that. You're right, Hud cut her off. You're often right, much as it pains my manly pride to admit. Her smile was very small, almost not a smile at all. I need to follow Samuel's example, for once. Hud reached for her other hand, needing a double dose of Mina's understanding, hoping she could find it in her heart to forgive him days of stupidity. 
I don't have to hold office to live up to the McLeod legacy. I can serve my country and my community, his voice lowered, and my family by taking another path. Your mother will be happy about that. She wasn't getting the point. I'm including you and Liam as part of my family, honey. I love you. And it took seeing you walk out that door a little while ago for me to realize just how much. I'd compromise for you and Liam. I'd give up one dream for another, just the way you did by moving here to Harmony Valley. Mina's eyes had filled with tears. She swallowed thickly, nose turning a soft red. After you left the house, I asked Walter a question. What? Mina shook her head, looking confused. I asked Walter if he'd sell his consulting company to me. And you. Hud took her hands and placed them on his shoulders. You see the trees and I see the forest. We could help good candidates run for office. We could make a difference. Oh, Hud. He moved his hands to her waist. You're going to have to add more words to your sentences. I think what you're saying is that's an interesting suggestion, but we'll have to talk about it in more detail. She nodded. But Liam. He needs to be here where he's just another kid. Samuel would want that. Hud leaned closer, wanting to take her into his arms, but still having so much more to say. We'll need a press release about his existence. But we'll protect him from the McLeod spotlight as much as we can. It will help tremendously that I'm not going to ask you to marry me right away. Oh, Hud, she closed her eyes. A tear trickled down her cheek. He kissed it away. I know that you don't believe in love. It's not fair to ask you to do anything before you're ready. It's enough for me that I can feel our bond when we're together. Whatever comes next, we'll do it at your pace. She moved a hand to gently touch his wounded eye, staring at him with love in her eyes. You're still moving fast. Changing your dream. Shifting your priorities. I may be a slow learner, honey, but I move fast when I know what's right. I can do that, too. Mina cradled his face in her hands, gliding her thumb over his lips. I love you, Hudson McLeod. It scares me how much because. You're afraid of being hurt. She nodded. Honey, you said your parents didn't talk. If there's one thing that's different about you and me, we find it hard not to speak our mind. Hud gave in to impulse and kissed her quickly, gently. Mina slipped her arms around his neck and pulled him close. I love you, Hud. We have a long way to go for that love to feel safe. But you deserve to know how I feel. It's an honor to love you. And Liam. And with that as Hud's legacy, how could he fail? Chapter 31 The bed was lumpy. The box springs creaked. The pillow was too stiff. And the old Victorian groaned. Vivian couldn't sleep. She would have liked to have blamed her insomnia on the sleeping conditions. But the truth was that her discomfort was caused by something else entirely. Being a grandmother was wonderful. But she wanted more in her life. I want Walter by my side. She'd been proud of Hud when he'd taken a moment after Mina ran off, then turned and told Walter he had no interest in running anymore. Yes, he might have been impulsive offering to buy Walter's firm out. But that was Hud. He stewed about things and then charged ahead to do what was right. She'd left before Hud returned, given that Leona had a 9 p.m. curfew at the Band B. But she was hopeful that he and Mina would work things out. She tossed again, trying to get comfortable. Sleepy Gigi wasn't falling asleep anytime soon. Footsteps sounded in the hall, heading toward the bathroom. The man in the room next door got up to pee more in the middle of the night than Vivian did. She turned on her other side and punched her pillow, trying to create a pocket for her head so her spine would be in alignment. The box springs creaked. A spring dug into her ribcage. Vivian sighed and closed her eyes, trying to sleep anyway. Tomorrow was another day in as a grandma. The door to her room opened. Vivian sat up, clutching the sheet to her chest until she recognized the bald silhouette. Walter? Yes. Walter closed the door behind him, his tall silhouette visible in the moonlight streaming through the windows. Walter walked over to the bed, surprising Vivian by laying down next to her on top of the quilt. 
What are you doing? She whispered, sinking back until they faced each other. We need to talk, Walter whispered back. Seeing the way Hud charged after a new future has inspired me. I love you, Viv. Vivian went still. People told her they loved her all the time but only Hamilton had meant the words the way Walter did. I should have said it before tonight. I should have told you years ago, Walter continued in a whisper. But you were grieving, and I only offered my shoulder to lean on, not my heart to help you heal. Vivian's heart was pounding, her mouth dry. Viv? She didn't know what to say. I'm sorry, Walter murmured. I'll leave. Wait. She reached for his arm in his grampy jammies. Found his hand. You should be dating a younger woman. Viv, he chastised. I mean. That's what I thought you'd do. That's what men like you usually do. They found second and third wives much younger than themselves. I'm not most men, Viv. He rolled back on his side to face her. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I haven't always played fair or told the truth when it didn't serve my candidate. But I love you. Why? I'm old. I've been a shell of myself for the past decade. And, I'm wearing boring jammies. Walter's gentle chuckle soothed. You're interesting. We share a history together. You've weathered more emotional storms than I have. It was you who picked me up after Sue died. You who told me to find a way to appreciate those grandbabies that Sue would have doted on. I've been sleepless in the other room, thinking that you always are the beacon of what's right. You don't need someone to be your conscience, she gently chided. Don't I? He laced their fingers together. You still haven't responded to what I said. Do you love me, Viv? Can you see yourself loving me? Vivian sighed. I'm not Vivian anymore. I'm Viv. I'm sleepy Gigi. Her hand sought out his face and her fingers traced the lines of his jaw. I told myself for so long that I wasn't going to love again. It'll take me time to get used to the idea. How long were you thinking it would take you, he asked softly, moving his head to kiss her fingers. She caught her breath. Not long. Epilogue. Liam's laughter filled the town square. Mina's little boy ran across the grass with a brown Labrador retriever puppy stumbling after him. Mina couldn't stop smiling. Hud stood behind Mina. He wrapped his arms around her and drew her close. When I see Mickey running behind Liam, I can forgive him for chewing up my power cord. He pressed his lips to Mina's cheek. Mina decided not to tell Hud that their puppy had chewed his favorite pair of running shoes. It was February and the promise of spring was in the air in Harmony Valley. Trees and daffodils were budding. The grass was a bright green and the sky a deep blue. Grandma Beam walked past with Agnes. Since her hip replacement surgery in late November, she'd been slowly recuperating and planned on hiking in Yosemite this summer. Liam and Mickey circled back around, running toward Hud and Mina. He'd lost some of his coltishness, but he was still all legs. Sleepy Gigi and Grandpa Wally are coming to town for dinner tonight. Hud swayed a little from side to side. Mina swayed with him, trusting him to keep her safe, the same way she'd trusted him with her heart last October. It was a decision she didn't regret. Loving Hud and being loved by him in return was one of the best things to ever happen to her. Mina moved her hands, laying them over Hud's strong forearms. A sparkle on her finger caught her eye. Her wedding ring. Don't forget you promised to give Mildred a ride in your Ferrari today. Hud was trading it in for a family vehicle. She hadn't wanted him to. They could afford for him to keep it. But Hud felt it sent the wrong message about who he was now. He wasn't the star of the show, a candidate in a high-profile political race or the CEO of McLeod Inc. He was her husband. He was Liam's father, if not legally, emotionally. Because she'd changed Liam's birth certificate to list Samuel as such. Hud was a changed man from the one who'd driven that yellow sports car into Harmony Valley less than a year ago. And in another seven months, he'd be a father. Mina turned in his arms to face him, ready to let him know.